All right, it's time. It's actually way past time. I've been working on this video for so long that I've had to rewrite several bits as Union Cross and Dark Road ended and added extra layers to my feelings about this topic. My understanding of Kingdom Hearts has deepened as I've gone from writing about my hunches as a dedicated player to full-blown Charlie Day tack board as I graduate to Kingdom Hearts scholar. I want this to be an open discussion about the characters and the subtext and all those filios that this game series has given me. Kingdom Hearts is so earnest in its storytelling, so genuine and heartwarming, all while it weaves a great tale of growing up, facing your darkness, and overcoming your fears. And I want more than anything to bring that same kind of energy into this video. Initially, I wanted to make this video because I couldn't find many other people on YouTube talking about this specifically, but that has also since luckily changed. And don't worry, I will be linking to them before the end of the video. But now I am making this from a whole new angle of just, I really need to talk to people about this. So sit back, relax, and get ready for me to go a bit feral over here as I dissect this beloved game series of mine and tell you why Riku is super gay, the secondary protagonist, and why I think all of that is so important for the franchise moving forward. Yes, I am serious, and yes, I think it's an important part of his characterization, and I think that people ignoring this part of him are missing out on a lot of what makes Riku such a great character and why he is so important for this franchise. Not to mention, I believe that misunderstanding this overall weakens your understanding of Kingdom Hearts as a whole. So, all right, look, I do wanna start this analysis off on the right foot. Obviously, this is my reading of the text, okay? This is going to be a very queer reading of Kingdom Hearts and looking at all the ways that I think that the narrative and the interviews with the directors, writers, and additional staff support that reading. You can have a different reading of Kingdom Hearts and all of its subtext than what I have. This is just me trying to relay how I see things to you. And you can take that and do what you please with it. You know, so long as you don't harass me or leave homophobic comments. Then I'll have to delete your existence. Goodbye. But hey, we're here to have a good time and just have a little chat about this topic. I've seen this conversation get shut down or dismissed out of hand by people who like to use crazy shippers as a golden bullet to win arguments without actually listening to what those people have to say. You don't have to agree with my take. In fact, you can leave right now. But if you're ready to listen, I'm ready to tell you about how Kingdom Hearts has been one huge, slow burn gay romance since practically day one. And on that note, I want to emphasize that Kingdom Hearts likes to leave a lot up for interpretation, which is what makes analyzing character motivation so fun. There's a habit in a lot of stories nowadays to over explain things, and <laughs> yeah, Kingdom Hearts is no stranger to lengthy exposition, but in general, characters' emotions and motivations tend to be left up to each player to interpret, or even purposefully kept hidden for a long time and with just enough subtle hints dropped to give characters an air of mystery. Series creator and director Tetsuya Nomura definitely seems to take a lot of pride and put a lot of thought into this aspect of the series. In interviews, Nomura is often cautious to only answer questions through the lens of what information has already been presented to players, and even tends to keep character motivations open for debate to encourage players to speculate, with only a few notable exceptions. But for example, a game sure needs elements where people can discuss and make speculation. When we were kids, we always thought, there's not enough things to imagine from this, when reading manga, watching anime, or playing games. And I thought that this is strange. Whether it's a game, anime, or manga, there should be a place where you can speculate things. I have that feeling, so I wanted to make a game that gives space for your imagination. That's why I don't like revealing everything and say this is the answer. 
Just like when I was a kid, I want to make something that can allow people to let loose their imagination with. Were there any adjustments for the story for international players? I believe that if something's interesting enough, people will accept it. So we didn't pay conscious attention to specific regions. But Disney did tell us it had a Japanese feeling. Also, in terms of storyline, I was thinking of making it simpler and cleaner. But Sakaguchi-san gave me a single piece of advice for the KH series. That was, if you don't make it a little more complex, like Final Fantasy, you won't be able to compete. I prefer to leave the player's scope for imagination and guessing, so I decided to develop the game in that way. Okay then, so the person who Cloud is searching for is Eris, Aerith, right? Well, what do you think? If indeed it was Eris, Aerith, then the bit in the ending was the answer. You might say it was made so that you can take it that way. Cloud is a popular character. I don't really want to decide myself, yes, he is like this because players make strong conclusions by themselves. I want to leave room for everyone's line of thought. So as you can see, Nomura likes for certain elements to have wiggle room for player interpretation. But as we'll see later, there are a few cases where he is actually very particular about how characters are perceived. And a lot of these particulars tend to be about Riku. Hmm. So put a pin in this. Overall though, the series is ripe for personal headcanons and interpretations on character motivation. This series has been going on for 20 years now. Congratulations, <laughs> Kingdom Hearts. But there is still much more to come and more to be revealed. So while I could be disproven by things that come out later, this is my current reading of where I feel that Riku's character has been going since the beginning. And <laughs> on that note, there is something that we need to address right away. Uh, there is an all too common belief that Nomura is just making up the Kingdom Hearts plotline as he goes and the series is riddled with plot holes and retcons. <sighs> Not only do I think that this just isn't true and is a bit of a bad faith take, but I think that Nomura has had a pretty clear vision for the story since basically the beginning, especially post Kingdom Hearts 2, where themes, ideas, and character motivations have been remarkably consistent. And even things from the very first game are still being built up to be paid off in the future. You can actually see in early interviews about Kingdom Hearts how Nomura pretty quickly goes from I have a vague idea of where this might be going, we'll just have to wait and see, to I'm not exactly sure when Kingdom Hearts will end, but I do know how it will end. And this was back before the release of Chain of Memories and Kingdom Hearts 2. With the first Kingdom Hearts, you took a wait and see approach before starting work on a sequel. Now that the series is a success, do you plan to turn Kingdom Hearts into an ongoing Final Fantasy sized franchise? What is the future of Kingdom Hearts? I believe that the Final Fantasy series is one that will continue forever. On the other hand, Kingdom Hearts will come to an end at some point. Whether that end comes in the next story or several more installments, I do not know. What I do know is that I already see that last scene that will put an end to Kingdom Hearts. And post Kingdom Hearts 2, the series direction has gotten even more clear. Yes. Now, if you're asking what Kingdom Hearts-esque means, one of the things it involves for me is a sense of depth. What do you mean by depth? I hope people feel a sense of depth when they enter the world of Kingdom Hearts. I don't want it to look like we've just made something flimsy or superficial, and are just trading off the Kingdom Hearts name. So it's not just a matter of sticking the world and characters into the game. No, it's not. I really don't give much thought to that, to be honest. What really matters is the setting of the game, and that is not necessarily something that can be seen on the surface. Another thing that I want to establish is that Kingdom Hearts is first and foremost an action JRPG and not like <laughs> a dating sim. That's super like, yeah, no shit to Neil, but 
<laughs> I just want to set the expectations to something reasonable when I talk about the romance of this series. The action and the drama and the interpersonal relationships will always come first for Kingdom Hearts, and it's not like I expect it to suddenly take a hard right turn into the pure romance department. Just because I'm talking about Riku and romance doesn't mean we're going to be losing the plot here. But I do think romance will be covered, just like all other forms of love are covered. There's a great scene in 358 over two days where Roxas questions Axel about what love is. This scene is unfortunately only in the original 358 over two days and isn't in the 358 movie. But the movie does cover another similar topic when they also ask Axel what it means to be a best friend. So best friends are different from plain friends, right? They're about the same. Best friends, huh? But I'd say Best friends are a notch above just plain friends. Kingdom Hearts is about the power of love and connection, most often through friendships, but it also touches on the power of love through romantic relationships and relationships that we can't even put words to our feelings on. And I love it for that reason, and I will defend that it should probably remain that way to my dying breath. I am not going to be sitting here and telling you that I think or even want Kingdom Hearts to suddenly put a heavy focus on romance, because I don't. But I am going to argue that Riku's motivations don't end at friendship, and that is a key part of what makes him so important and explains a lot of what he does. And there really shouldn't be any problem with that, right? Characters being motivated by love is pretty common in Kingdom Hearts. All kinds of love, but... The idea of Riku being motivated by romantic love for his best friend is often treated as going too far. Even when the games spend a lot, and I mean a lot of time, emphasizing Riku's devotion to Sora. I'm going to do my best to cover this topic thoroughly with my shipping goggles only partially on, thank you very much. Although I will admit that that is a little difficult because there is just... <laughs> there is just so much here. And Riku is quite frankly in over his pretty little head. Huh? Oh my god, this boy. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting away with myself though, but I do promise that this won't just be a clip show of Suriku moments and me pointing and saying, see, I mean, just look at him. <laughs> it's gonna be all that and more, baby. Wow. <laughs> Furthermore, male friendships are also a huge part of Kingdom Hearts and the fact that Nomura has blessed us with so many wholesome male friendships that are just genuine and caring and loving without the toxic, oh, men can't show feelings to each other trope is honestly wonderful. It just fills my heart with overwhelming emotion to see these boys cry over the thought of losing each other. And it is so refreshing to see. And yes, 
These guys can be friends, and their feelings don't have to be romantic. Although, you know, they also can. I just want to make that clear as well, like ship whatever you want. But overall, Kingdom Hearts treats both platonic and romantic relationships as super important and impactful, with neither necessarily being more important than the other. Just a notch above, like Axel said. But also, Axel described love to Roxas as something special between two people, <laughs> and boy howdy, I just can't think of a pair that describes that better in this series than Sora and Riku. Now, some people are threatened by the idea of Sora and Riku being a couple because they claim that they see Sora and Riku as just really good friends. Brotherly, even. But I beg of you to just hear me out for this video. Also, as a casual note, Please stop using the I see them as siblings headcanon to dismiss ships you don't like. Unless they are actually related, nobody cares if you see them as a sibling dynamic and you are not adding anything to the conversation. Sorry, not sorry. But another thing that people claim is that there aren't enough male platonic best friends in media, and making them a couple would ruin their great friendship. Okay, uh, first off, I literally have no idea what you're talking about with the first one. Platonic male friendships are literally everywhere in media. And secondly, no. I don't think that revealing Riku is gay would suddenly ruin or take away from Sora and Riku's friendship. It can only add to it. Not everything needs to be about straight people, right? Gays need male male best friend to lovers stories too, you know? And Riku definitely fits that bill. And for, I would say, at least a good chunk of people, this is obvious? I don't know. It is always really hard to know what fandom as a whole thinks, and it can get super muddy where everyone is in terms of interpretation of the source text when a fandom is big enough that everyone just kind of has their own little bubbles of fandom creators that they follow and interact with. When those bubbles collide and you find out that some people don't see eye to eye on something that your bubble finds super obvious, it can feel a little like... And don't get me wrong, there have been Riku is gay jokes in the fandom for years. In fact, this isn't just something associated with Riku, it's pretty commonly agreed upon in Kingdom Hearts fandom that if it breathes, it's gay. Just, you know, it's usually said as a joke, because despite the huge queer following that these games have, and the inherent camp baked into the series as a whole, and the overwhelming popularity of headcanons that envision most of the cast as queer, there's been a bit of a backlash in fandom spaces towards fans who've stopped treating the possibility of queer representation as jokes and take it more seriously. And this is in part because Kingdom Hearts is owned by Disney, who, well, let's just say, doesn't have the best track record for including proper out and loud LGBT representation. Yeah, yeah, let's just say that. And Kingdom Hearts is also made by a Japanese game company. I do want to point out, though, that Final Fantasy and Square as a whole embrace a lot of queer culture. You know, with, like, the fashion and the camp <laughs> and this. True beauty is an expression of the heart, a thing without shame, to which notions of gender don't apply. Don't ever be afraid of And, uh, this? But, you know, as far as I know, I don't think there has ever explicitly been confirmed LGBT plus characters. Just a lot of subtext. I mean, a mountain of it. <laughs> and don't forget about all the characters who are otherwise coded as pretty queer, but then just kind of have a romantic love interest of the opposite gender pushed on them, despite a real clear lack of interest. And Disney, of course, whether they like it or not, is the king of camp. <laughs> I don't know if there's much that Disney has touched that queer people haven't also absorbed into queer culture. 
like I said, whether Disney likes it or not. And lastly, it's not like Kingdom Hearts hasn't dipped its toes in before. For those unaware, in Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, the character Streletzia has an unspoken crush for your avatar, the player character, who can canonically be either male or female. None of the dialogue or scenes are changed based on your character's gender, making Streletzia our first confirmed bisexual queen. And not to mention the myriad of characters and dynamics that are easily read as queer but don't have explicit confirmation. Like Isa and Lee reading as ex-gay boyfriends reunited, trans Shion, and the rocky love-hate relationship between Xehanort and Arrakis. And while I do all personally subscribe to these headcanons myself, I also don't think that any of these fairly well-accepted headcanons are necessarily explicitly canon. At least, I think that Nomura is more than happy to let people headcanon what they want when it comes to these dynamics with these characters. It's not a core part of the narrative like Riku's queerness is. And that's the point I'm going to be arguing for here in this video. While I think a bunch of characters in Kingdom Hearts can be read as queer, which is only natural coming from a series exploring themes of growing up, facing your inner darkness, and identity, I believe that in most cases you can apply your own reading to that text. When it comes to Riku, however, his journey is so important to Kingdom Hearts' story as a whole and understanding his queerness is a core part of the narrative that can't be ignored. So, the idea of Riku ever being confirmed as a canonical, honest-to-goodness gay man with a lot of gay feelings for his best friend makes some people laugh and go, Oh, ha ha ha, Disney would never allow that. You're reaching for something that isn't there and was never there to begin with. Hmm, and that just leaves me wondering if y'all are playing the same game series I've been playing, where it feels all but confirmed that Riku's character arc, our secondary main character of the whole franchise, is driven to do the things he does out of love. It's been there since the very beginning. You don't even have to look that deep to see it. Something can be true about a character without them having to say it out loud. You know, Demix doesn't need to look into the camera and say, I like my sitar. I like my sitar. I play my sitar wherever I go. For me to know that the boy likes his sitar and probably plays it wherever he goes. And I don't need Riku to look into the camera and tell me he's gay. I already know it. All of the subtext is right there. And on the matter of Disney wouldn't allow it, times are changing, you know? And I'm not sure how much Disney would actually do to stop Nomura if he really pushed for it. Here's what he said about some of the first meetings with Disney about the project. Yes, at the time I only had a vague idea of what I wanted to make. It was taking shape one way or another inside my head, and then Disney also asked me if I could do certain things for them, and they presented a lot of things to me. And those things were different from your own image, naturally. Oh, yes. Make a game about this character, they'd say. And it seemed on their side they were thinking that I'd make what they ordered. So they were explaining things to me very excitedly and happily, but honestly, I had no interest at all. <laughs> yes, and so I said, no, I'm good, thanks, and stopped the other person's presentation halfway through. The schedule only allowed the other side to make presentations before the time was up. So first of all, I concluded by telling them what kind of game I wasn't about to make. And then later, multiple interviewers asked Nomura about how much control Disney gives him over the project. How much freedom did you have when it came to Disney characters and worlds? Overall, the process was quite smooth. There weren't any big restrictions or a set of guidelines we were given. Disney has its worlds already created, and there's no reason for us to change that, so it wasn't to a point where they had to lead us and take our hands. It was more of us trying to bring out the best of what was already made, as far as Disney characters go. The only thing we were careful of doing was staying within the characters' established roles, and what kind of dialogue these characters should have. That's something we all tried to stay within certain boundaries on. Did you yourself decide which Disney properties to include as worlds in the game? 
When I was working on the game by myself at the start, I did most of the choosing of worlds. At that time, there were a lot of worlds, including original worlds. I think there were more than 20. Ultimately, talking with design staff, we cut worlds here and there and ended up with the current number. You're writing the scenario yourself? When it comes to the scenario, including the script, in the end I write everything myself. That's not just for Toybox. I haven't made this public before, but after Kingdom Hearts 2, generally everything was written by me, especially 358 over 2 days. I see. I thought that you assemble the plot, and then the script and other small details were assigned to someone else. That's how it was in the beginning. However, ever since Kingdom Hearts 2, roughly speaking, I will create the outline of the scenario myself. And then Oka will take that and create a springboard scenario, including dialogue, that takes into consideration requests from the level design team. Then after that, I write the final manuscript myself. That's the general flow. Other staff have worked on the scenario in the past, but the KH series lore is complicated, and when lots of people are involved, it gets hard to keep everyone updated on it all. In the end, I'm the one with the best grasp on it, so that's why we ended up with the style we have today. But you haven't been credited with scenario in the end credits of any titles so far. I get credited with story, so I guess it doesn't need to be said. Plus, I've been in the industry for a long time. I worried that if people were to go into things with the preconceived notion that Tetsuya Nomura wrote this, it would get in the way of their play. So I didn't make it clear. But the series is 17 years old now, and the fact that an old dude is writing it is simply the truth. <laughs> I wrote this game myself too. I wrote all the text, not just the scenario. I even decide the item names myself. Even the social media style loading screen? Oh yes, I did write that. There are a couple of patterns, including ones you see after clearing a world. There are some pretty casual hashtags and things, so I hope you look carefully while waiting for things to load. Nomura seems to have a pretty tight control over this series. Just recently, Sora's inclusion in Smash wasn't a problem with Disney. It was actually Nomura who needed to be persuaded. Disney may have had a bigger hand in Kingdom Hearts 3's world designs, but the choice of worlds and what happened in them was still up to Nomura. I think that Disney might have had something to say about this or that being included in the games, and of course, they get to ultimately approve or veto any worlds for copyright reasons, but when it comes down to it, Nomura kinda has final say on the characters and story, and I don't think that Disney meddles nearly as often as people assume. And Nomura is very particular about Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> and like I said, progress is being made. Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch had to fight with Disney to get a queer couple confirmed in the series finale back in 2015 something that Hirsch had been fighting with Disney over basically the whole runtime of the show. And more recently, Dana Terrace, creator of The Owl House, not only has had a queer main flagship romance in her story between Luz and Amity, which covers their relationship from crush to dating to kisses to coming out, but also season two introduced Ida's non-binary love interest, Rain. And not to mention, Disney's latest release, Strange World, has a canonical, out and loud gay kid as one of their lead protagonists. And I have all the respect for Alex Hirsch and Dana Terrace for all the work that they've done to make these things happen. And I mean absolutely no disrespect to either of them when I say this. I think Nomura has a lot more weight to throw around when it comes to Disney. At this point in his career, Nomura not only has decades worth of experience with Disney, but also just a fair amount more prestige and authority. This is the man who basically told Disney, there won't be a Kingdom Hearts 3 if I can't use Toy Story as one of the worlds. So the man knows how to get what he wants. On the importance of adding Toy Story to Kingdom Hearts 3. After we were done with Kingdom Hearts 2 and were starting to consider 3, we started talks with Disney. I remember saying, if we can't use Pixar, then we can't have a third game. It is that important to the game series. The whole world loves Toy Story. Everybody feels the appeal of that story and those characters. So yeah, at the very beginning, I directly said to them, if we can't get this, I don't want to do it. Oh my god. <laughs> Nomura. Damn. 
With all of that said, I honestly don't know if we'll ever get a true confirmation from the series itself. I can't say with 100% certainty that that is where the series is headed. I think it is, but none of us will really know until it's said and done. I would positively explode with joy if it did happen. Not just because I think it would be an amazing payoff for all this buildup over so many games, and wonderful, and amazing, but it would also be a huge step forward in representation across the world and the games industry and Disney and Japan. It would be huge. But will it ever actually be confirmed? I don't know. And I don't want to get people's hopes up. I think that there's a better chance of it happening nowadays than it was back during the release of Kingdom Hearts 2 or Dream Drop Distance. And <laughs> that didn't stop those games from being pretty heckin' gay. So, you know, I hold on to my hope and I treat it kindly. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. What spurred me to make this video in the first place was the fact that I've started seeing this idea float around that somehow there are people who think that Riku should be shelved as a character and that his story is somehow complete. <sighs> or people who want to minimize Riku's role in the story going forward overall. <sighs> This complete misunderstanding of where Riku is going as a character and what the games have built up and the absolute mental gymnastics I see some people go through so that they can ignore Riku's significance is baffling to me. And well, <laughs> as a Riku stan, I just cannot let this injustice slide. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's probably unsurprising for all of you, for me to say that Riku is absolutely my favorite character in this series. So yes, I am extremely biased in that regard, but I also don't feel like that is an accident. Riku's story comes second only to Sora's in terms of narrative significance of the overall plot. He definitely seems to be one of Nomura's favorite characters as well, considering all the time that he's put into Riku's writing and character development. And also the time that he was upset when Riku didn't rank higher in a Kingdom Hearts fandom popularity poll. <laughs> and over 20 years, there has been a lot revealed about Riku, and there's still plenty more to come. It's gonna take a while to cover it all, as you can uh, see from the timestamp. Just don't worry about it. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> so, let's talk about Riku. Starting from the very beginning. I've often seen it said that Kingdom Hearts 1 is a love triangle, with Kairi in the middle. Sora and Riku both have feelings for Kairi, Riku is Sora's jealous rival who is better than him at everything, and throughout the game, Riku is trying to prove that he is better for Kairi than Sora is. And I can see how, at first glance, this might make some sense. It's a trope as old as time, and if you were just giving the plot beats to someone, they would probably assume that that's what's going on. But that immediately begins to fall apart when you actually look at what the game is presenting you. If Riku is supposed to be a potential romantic interest for Kairi, he sure doesn't try very hard <laughs> to, like, impress her spend any time with her, have any interaction with her outside of also being around Sora. If this was any other love triangle with the girl in the middle, we'd see Riku make attempts to win over Kairi whether or not Sora was around. Instead, Riku uses Sora's affection for Kairi as a way to tease Sora. It's an easy way to get Sora to pay attention to him often only done when Riku and Sora are alone. Riku jokes with Sora about stealing Kairi's affections because Riku knows it bothers Sora. And it bothers Sora because for years, Sora and Riku have been competing to one-up each other. Kairi just kind of happens to be the unfortunate middleman in this current crosshairs of that competition. If you lose the race in Destiny Islands, Riku isn't like, Yes, now I'm gonna get the girl. Fair's fair, Sora. 
He's like, <laughs> I was just kidding, bro. Oh, you should have seen your face, bro. It was just a joke. Don't get so bent out of shape, bro. Uh, Riku, honey, <laughs> please see a therapist. And while Riku does spend the majority of the first game trying to find a way to get Kairi her heart back, it doesn't seem to be because he loves her. In fact, it's still all proving how much better he is than Sora. Not how much better he is for Kairi, just proving himself better than Sora. Finding Kairi's heart is just a means to that end. Riku's official character files even point this out. Sora and Kairi's best friend from childhood. After Destiny Islands is engulfed in darkness, Riku's complex feelings towards Sora and his impatience to save Kairi are taken advantage of, and Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, possesses his body. It's because of him that the path to Kingdom Hearts of World's Hearts is opened, but in the end, he and Sora close it together. Right. Riku's complex feelings are all about Sora, not Kairi. Now, I don't think that Riku doesn't care at all about Kairi. They are still childhood friends. But in canon, it seems like Riku and Kairi have a pretty strained relationship. The night Destiny Islands gets destroyed, Kairi... Jokes. About Sora and Kairi leaving Riku behind. And Sora, bless his heart, (laughs) doesn't really get it. He just kind of laughs it off. But... Yeah, I think what Kairi says here actually says more about these three's friendship than people remember. You know, Riku has changed. What do you mean? Well... Hmm. You okay? Sora! Let's take the raft and go! Just the two of us! Huh? (laughs) Just kidding! What's gotten into you? You're the one that's changed, Kairi. Maybe. The Destiny Trio has always been a bit... messy. Strained. Less of a trio with a tight bond like the Sea Salt and Wayfinder Trio are. And it suddenly makes more sense why that might be the case if it's actually Sora who's in the middle of the love triangle, so to speak. But at this point in the games, I really don't think that any of the characters are truly aware of their feelings. No, instead, I think that the original Kingdom Hearts isn't about a love triangle at all. It's about how both Riku and Kairi are scared of Sora leaving them behind for the other person. And it's that fear that separates all of them. Kairi is just as afraid of Riku and Sora leaving her behind as Riku is of Kairi and Sora leaving him behind. Kairi's character represents a fear of change and growing up. She's the only one out of the three of them who expresses doubts about leaving and states that she would be happy just staying on Destiny Islands, even if she had the opportunity to rediscover her old home. While on the other hand, Riku represents the opposite, a boy who wants to get out of his small home world and see what's out there, and grow up as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Sora keeps hearing things from the other kids on the island. Things like, Oh man, Riku's the strongest. You'll never beat Riku. I guess it's a good thing Kairi will always be able to count on Riku. You better share the Paupu with Kairi soon or Riku will beat you to it, Sora. And what's notable about all of these bits of dialogue is that they center around Sora's feeling of inadequacy around Riku and his need to beat Riku at something. From up on the hill, he could see Riku gathering things. He was carrying something that looked like a big piece of cloth. Must be nice being Riku. The thought stung in his chest. It felt like nothing more than an accident that he managed to win the sword fight. Sora was the one who always lost. School grades, sprinting, it didn't matter what. He couldn't beat Riku. If he could just win at something. On the cave wall beside the door, there was a little doodle. There it is. Years ago, Kairi and Sora had drawn each other's faces on the wall, and they were still here. Sora crouched down and softly touched the scribbles. If he could just be better than Riku... 
The game does a great job with making sure you feel that firsthand, with Sora keeping track of the score between the two of them. On your first playthrough, you're more than likely going to lose both sword fighting and the race with Riku, probably multiple times. And it burns. You just want nothing more than to beat Riku and wipe that smug little, <laughs> smug little smile off of his face. But it's important to remember that things have only recently become this way. Sora and Riku have been BFFs since they were basically toddlers, and we see what Sora and Riku's relationship was like in Birth by Sleep, before Kairi arrived on the islands. They were super close, with Riku being the slightly older and wiser of the two. When Kairi did show up, Sora of course likely made friends with her quickly, and Riku is a good kind kid, so he probably became friends with Kairi through Sora. And for a long time they probably all coexisted as really close friends. But as they got older, Kairi and Riku's ideas for the future started to separate. And this nagging fear started eating away at the both of them. For Riku, this will manifest through his push to escape Destiny Islands and his feelings of betrayal when he sees Sora again. Kairi states her worries more directly. What was your hometown like? You know, where you grew up? I told you before, I don't remember. Nothing at all? Nothing. You ever want to go back? Hmm, well, I'm happy here. You know, Riku has changed. You know, I was a little afraid at first. No matter where I go or what I see, I know I can always come back here. Sora, don't ever change. We don't get a whole lot of dialogue from Kairi, so there's very little we have to understand exactly how she's feeling about all of this. But based on just these bits that we have, we can safely assume that she took some convincing to go along with this whole raft plan. But more than anything, she didn't want to be left behind, so she follows the boy's lead in building the raft. But it's also fairly safe to assume that the raft was Riku's idea, and he's really pushing to make it happen. Riku is terrified of Sora leaving him behind for Kairi and covers a lot of his insecurities with this whole raft plan, getting out and seeing the world together. But even as he hopes to keep his friends close through this, his insecurities can't help but push them away by his posturing and doing things that I can only describe as desperate attempts to get some kind of answer from Sora. Sora! You wanted one, didn't you? A palpu fruit? If two people share one, their destinies become intertwined. They'll remain a part of each other's lives, no matter what. Come on, I know you want to try it. What are you talking? <laughs> Riku is teasing Sora, but can't you just also imagine what's going through Riku's mind in these moments? Riku got a Paupu fruit out of the tree just to give it to Sora? Will Sora actually give the Paupu to Kairi? I know you want to try it, he teases. But that's a very leading statement. He's all but asking Sora, do you want to try it? With Kairi? What happens to me then? Regardless of whether Sora would actually choose between his friends, both Riku and Kairi are at odds for Sora's attention. And Riku compensates for this by acting like the coolest guy on the beach. Well, Sora and Kairi need him because he's better at everything. What would they do without him? They can't abandon me. I'm Riku. And how dare Sora think he doesn't need me? He's always needed me. I'm not the one who needs him. This is made even more clear when we see Maleficent and Riku together. In Traverse Town, Maleficent has already picked up on Riku's true motivations, and she is preying on his insecurities to get him to do what she wants. And again in Monstro, Maleficent shows up basically just so that she can tease her newly adopted gay son. Why do you still care about that boy? He has all but deserted you for the Keyblade and his new companions, after all. I don't care about him. I was just messing with him a little. Oh, really? 
Of course you were. Beware the darkness in your heart. The heartless prey upon it. Mind your own business. And yeah, I think that the way Riku lashes out during Kingdom Hearts 1 makes the most sense from this perspective. Riku's whole inferiority complex, the fear of being left behind, the desire to grow up and leave his childhood home behind, his snarky attitude is turned to darkness. He's not jealous of Sora's relationship with Kairi. He's scared of it and what it could mean and probably of what that fear says about him. Riku wants reassurance from Sora that he's important to him. He's also jealous of Sora because Sora doesn't have a care in the world about a lot of this stuff. They were going to explore the world together. They were best friends first, and Riku's been planning this for years. Riku even kind of straight up lies to both Sora and Kairi in this scene. He says, if it hadn't been for you, Kairi, I probably wouldn't have thought of any of this. And he does this probably to goad Sora on, because even if we assume the whole Terra and Riku meeting on Destiny Islands hadn't been conceptualized yet, Riku was actually already talking about leaving Destiny Islands since before Kairi got there. And Sora does kind of give Riku a look during this scene too. <laughs> it's a small thing, but I, I just appreciate this touch. But in the end, from Riku's perspective, Sora and Riku were always supposed to be there for each other. And now, Sora and Kairi have talked about abandoning him behind his back. I've always wondered if Riku somehow overheard what Kairi said on the pier that night, as a final nudge to his insecurities being spoken aloud by Kairi, tipping the scales and pushing Riku to open the door that led to Destiny Islands being destroyed. Either way, we do know that Riku goes to the secret place to open the door, so more likely than not, he saw Sora's drawing on the cave wall of Sora giving Kairi a Paupu fruit. It's the answer that he was pestering Sora for, but not the one that he wanted to see. Just having all of his worst fears confirmed, his heart is a prime target for darkness, so he opens the door and destroys everything. He plans to take Sora with him, but it doesn't go the way he thought it would. And the games definitely give the impression that Riku's first priority was to make sure Sora came with him. And when that doesn't work, find Sora and then go look for Kairi together. And then, the first time Riku sees Sora after all of this happens, Riku is posturing so hard as a cool guy who knows his way around. Oh, Sora's gotta need him now. But, oh my god, it's happening all over again. Sora's made new friends and doesn't need him? This time with a duck? This bitch. Riku's actions are already leaning more into the territory of jealous crush and angsty self-loathing that make a lot of sense if Riku is struggling with his complicated feelings for Sora while also witnessing what he thinks are Sora and Kairi becoming closer and leaving him behind. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think Riku is self-aware enough at this point to realize that about himself though. He obviously holds both a lot of disdain and admiration for Sora at the same time. And like I said before, Maleficent plays into Riku's fears here pretty specifically. You see, it's just as I told you. While you toiled away trying to find your dear friend, he quite simply replaced you with some new companions. Evidently. Now he values them far more than he does you. Again, if this was a love triangle, Maleficent might try to tell Riku that he had better chances to sweep the girl off her feet if he rescued her alone or something. But no, oh, Maleficent is smart. She's the mistress of all evil. You don't think she recognizes gay pining when she sees it? Come on. So she specifically 
pulls at Riku through his feelings of betrayal over Sora. Riku can't handle his own jealousy and emotions, so he falls for what Maleficent is selling him pretty quickly. In an interview with Namora, here's what he had to say about Riku's actions in Kingdom Hearts 1. He carries the responsibility of playing a more worried protagonist than would suit Sora. In a way, maybe he's more of a classic Square-style character. The things Riku does to restore Kairi's heart are perhaps less about his feelings for her and more about his regret over sins he has committed? Or so I think. He's a surprisingly immoral guy. <laughs> so again, we have Namora saying that Riku's actions have less to do with any feelings for Kairi, and that it's more so about his guilt. Even at this stage, Riku knows what he's done is bad. He's motivated by guilt and regret to restore Kairi, but Riku is also so caught up in all of his feelings of jealousy, regret, anger, that he keeps chasing the idea that he can make it all right and fix things by himself, his way, without Sora. Because he doesn't need Sora, Sora needs him. Riku is supposed to be the one to protect Sora. And so here's where we have to talk about another character arc of Riku's, strength to protect what matters. As a child, Terra bequeathed the right to wield a keyblade onto Riku. Why? This light. It's so warm. Hey, slow down. Would you just wait for me? Give it up already? Come on, Sora. I can't run anymore. I know it's out there somewhere. The strength that I need. Strength for what? To protect the things that matter. You know, like my friends. Riku thinks he'll gain the strength to protect the things that matter by leaving the island. But here, Riku is also just calling the strength to protect things, like his friends. As we see in Kingdom Hearts 1, Riku's darkness, his jealousy, makes him forget why he wanted to be strong and leave the islands in the first place. And yet a part of him is still trying to hold on to this. He wants to be the strong one to protect Sora and Kairi. When Sora has betrayed Riku's protection, Riku moves to show Sora how stupid it was to do that to him because he's going to protect Kairi without Sora's help. And then won't Sora just feel so foolish? In Riku's darkest moments, he even gets what he wants, or at least what he thinks he wants. Riku takes the Keyblade, Donald, and Goofy from Sora, and at his absolute pettiest, sneers his triumph over Sora and leaves him behind, finally proving how much better he is, how he deserved this, how Sora was wrong for abandoning him. He didn't, but, you know, we're getting into the mind of Riku here. And now he is so close to waking Kairi. He's about to show Sora just how wrong he was. This is peak, mean, jealous, bitch Riku times. And then five minutes later, Sora claps back at Riku with the power of friendship and anime on his side. And yet again, Riku is left with the harsh reality of his failure. Sora's heart has beaten him. Feeling his most desperate and alone, Riku lets himself get body snatched by Ansem, Seeker of Darkness. But that also doesn't last long. Riku watches as Ansem fights Sora all over again. Sora wins, but stabs himself in order to release Kairi's heart. And I think witnessing this act is what reminds Riku of why he wanted strength in the first place to protect the things that matter. And now, because of his pride and arrogance, he realizes that he's done the opposite. He holds Ansem back from hurting Kairi and the others, and then after that is when Riku shows up in the Dark World. From this point forward, Riku is finally going to be doing some self-reflecting and start tackling those emotions that have been hurting him so badly. He knows that he's really messed things up, and he's been a terrible friend. 
and for the next several games, Riku is going to be on the long road to redeeming himself. But one thing that is absolutely not being addressed is Riku's self-loathing. It was already there and coming out as cocky overcompensation showiness, but now the self-loathing truly begins. Now that he's been humbled enough to face everything that he's done, he does not go easy on himself. And as the games continue, that self-hatred becomes a key component to his character arc. He really grows and becomes a better person, but a better person who has to keep his darkness, his feelings, in check and feels so much guilt over the things he's done. The darkness is right there, waiting for him to slip up and stumble right back into his negative feelings. So, how does he decide to atone? How does he keep his darkness in check? By devoting himself wholly and selflessly to Sora's safety. In Chain of Memories, Riku is now having to live with the consequences of his actions. While he helped at the end of Kingdom Hearts and sealed the door to save the worlds, Riku knows that he is still struggling with darkness in his heart. Not just the literal darkness that Ansem provided, but processing everything he felt and justified to himself during that first game. This is something I love about Kingdom Hearts. Riku, by the standards of most narratives, has already redeemed himself. He knows he effed up and he paid the price for it. And when the moment to make things right again came along, he stepped up and he did the right thing at his own personal loss. By most story standards, that would be where Riku's journey ends. He's just a good guy now. A good guy with baggage, but good nonetheless. But that's not what happens with Riku. Riku's journey in Chain of Memories is unpacking all of the terrible things he did in the first game and making Riku come to terms with that. And a lot of this is manifested by Ansem and the magic of Castle Oblivion, but Riku welcomes the challenge of facing himself. What's this? It is a door to the truth. Take it and your sleep ends as you take the first step toward the truth. But know this, the truth will bring you pain. Will you still go? There is no return to the security of sleep. This seemed like a boring place to take a nap anyway. Riku ends up in Castle Oblivion's basement, the place Sora is, and our explanation for how he manages to do this is best explained as a similar method that the Beast was able to use in Kingdom Hearts 1. So tell me, how'd you get here? Hmm. Uh, I simply believed. Nothing more to it. When our world fell into darkness, Belle was taken from me. I vowed I would find her again, no matter what the cost. I believed I would find her. So here I am. She must be here. You mean Sora? Sora is here? What I want to know is why he appeared here in Castle Oblivion. That's really quite simple. His existence resonates with that of another hero. The Beast's heart resonated with Belle, and it allowed him to travel worlds to reach her again. And Riku is able to escape and enter Castle Oblivion through his heart guiding him to Sora. We get more context for Riku's mindset during Kingdom Hearts 1 as well. He doesn't meet anyone in his memories in Castle Oblivion because his heart was empty of light and he cast away his friends in favor of darkness. And if you, like me, read that as one way of saying that Riku had forgotten his purpose and was living in shame, guilt, and denial, then yeah, this all tracks so far. There's a telling scene early on in Riku's story during Chain of Memories when Riku is re-experiencing his memories of Hollow Bastion.
And it's true. Riku is so scared of placing his faith in things, of being hurt, that he has hurt himself in the process. He's closed himself off. He doesn't think he deserves redemption. But he wants to try to be better anyway. He wants to find Sora again and apologize, and be the friend that he should have been all along. But he's also terrified of seeing Sora again, because he's afraid of his own darkness, and he's terrified of the idea of Sora not being his friend anymore. Now taking a step back from Riku here for a minute, there's some interesting things going on in the narrative that allude to Riku's backstory and true feelings, and I wouldn't be giving you the full picture if I didn't bring them up. Sora's story in Chain of Memories is all about losing his memories of the first game in order to unlock true memories. This is all a farce by the organization and nominee, of course, but there's a memory implanted in both Sora and Riku replica, a clone of Riku that the organization makes to mess with Sora, otherwise known as Repliku, that's what I'll be calling him from now on. There is a memory implanted in both of their minds concerning a meteor shower that happened on Destiny Islands when they were children. Sora, I made a promise to Naminé. I promised to keep her safe. You did? There was a meteor shower this one night when she and I were little. <laughs> Naminé got scared and said, what if a shooting star hits the islands? So I told her, if a shooting star comes this way, I will protect you. You made a promise with a toy sword. What? How do you know about that? Because that was the promise I made to her that night. I would protect her. I said it. Don't lie. You weren't the one there that night. You're the one who wasn't there. That was when she gave her good luck charm to me. As Sora falsely remembers it, he and Naminé were out on the beach when a meteor shower appeared in the sky. Naminé was frightened by this, so Sora lifted his toy sword in the air and promised that he would protect Naminé. Should a falling star come towards them, Sora would knock it back into the sky. Naminé then gives Sora a good luck charm to seal the deal on their promise to each other. Repliku is given this same memory, only with himself in Sora's shoes. Now, this is done to pit the two against each other, and oh boy, let me tell you, it works like a charm. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it brings up some interesting theories. Naminé's powers are specifically for shifting and rearranging Sora's memories and those close to him. But as she states herself, she can't make up new memories from scratch. I don't actually erase any memories. Just take apart the links and rearrange them. You still have all your memories. That's a pretty awesome power you've got there, Naminé, Axel muttered to the girl standing next to him as he watched the replica sleep in a pod that looked like a flower bud. But all I can do is rearrange fragments of memories. I can't rearrange things that aren't already there. Hmm. Which means that this memory most likely happened. And happened during the meteor shower that brought Kairi to Destiny Islands. So the person in this real memory where Naminé has inserted herself wasn't Kairi. In reality, this is likely a memory shared by Sora and Riku. The theory goes is that it was Sora who was frightened by the meteor shower, and Riku was the one to promise to protect him if a shooting star came their way. Because Riku's whole thing is about protecting things that matter. So then what's the lucky charm given? Many theorize that Riku gave Sora his necklace. This theory is further backed up by the keychains that Sora has representing his bonds to his friends. Oathkeeper, representing Kairi, has the shell charm that Kairi made, whereas Oblivion, representing Riku, has the crown necklace. How does Oblivion represent Riku, you might ask? 
Its development name was the Riku Keyblade. In early stages, we plan to have Riku give you a keychain, just like the Lucky Charm, which is why the keychain is a different colored version of Sora's necklace. On top of that, Oblivion's Japanese name is Passing Memories, which, if this keyblade is associated with Riku, could be a hint toward the seemingly forgotten, or unspoken of, memory shared by the both of them. Of course, this theory has yet to be proven, but it is just mm, so good. And honestly, it makes perfect sense to me. There's so many little clues left throughout the entire series kind of pointing to it that just talking about this one theory alone could be its own video. But for the sake of time, I recommend that you check out the link to the theory I have posted below. In general though, this theory lines up with Sora in Riku's characterization so well and continues the theme of Riku's protectiveness of Sora. Of course, this theory assumes that Namine is inserting herself in Sora's place in Repliku's memories. Which might sound like a stretch, but the novels actually provide some pretty damning evidence towards it. As Repliku is being given all of his false memories, he remembers drawing a picture for Namine. Namine sat on the sandy beach, drawing pictures. Sora and himself and Kairi grinned up from her sketchbook. How come you're not in the picture, Namine? said the boy, peering at the page. Because I can't see my own face. Oh, the boy thought that was kind of sad. Of course, Namine can't see herself when she's together with us laughing. That's just the way it is, but... How about I draw you then? Huh? The boy picked up Namine's crayons and started drawing, himself and Namine smiling, a great big shining sun over their heads. We were always laughing together, the two of us. We were happy. How's this? The boy showed her the sketchbook page where he'd drawn their laughing faces. Later, the real Riku stumbles across Namine's drawings in Castle Oblivion. Inside the mansion, everything was dim and shadowy. There was no sign of anyone here, not even a scent. Is this the right place? Riku wondered. He crossed the spacious entrance hall and climbed the stairs to the second floor and went into a room at the end of the corridor. Inside was a white room, almost like all those marble halls in the castle, but no one was there. He peered closely at the picture pinned to the wall. It was a drawing on white paper, torn out of a sketchbook, showing himself and Sora laughing together. Who drew this? Riku muttered, reaching up to touch it, and the moment his fingers brushed the paper, it began to shine. It's this drawing that lights a path forward for Riku and leads him to Namine and the pod where Sora is sleeping. In Repliku's false memories, he draws a picture of him and Namine smiling together, but Riku finds a picture of him and Sora smiling together. It's more than safe to assume that these are the same pictures, and it's pointed out specifically so that the reader can put two and two together. So while it's easy to say that Namine has certainly inserted herself in Kairi's place for multiple memories and unchained Kairi from Sora's memories, in order to truly make Sora and Repliku as desperate as they were to find and protect her, it took more than just memories of Kairi. It took putting herself in the place of Sora as well, especially in Repliku's case. Not to mention the poems that end each side of Chain of Memories story. On Sora's side, you would initially interpret this poem as talking about Namine or Kairi. There is always sleep between part and meat, with our usual words on the usual street. So let us part like we always do. And in a world without you, I'll dream of you. When I come to, let us meet with our usual words on the usual street. But then Riku's side actually specifically mentions a forgotten promise between Sora and Riku that Riku wants to remake. Beyond the path without you is a forgotten promise to keep. We may have walked side by side, but now we go on back to back. 
And though our paths may not cross, all paths are connected somewhere. When I arrive where you are, we may not appear as we were. But we'll make another promise to keep. A lot of folks like to yada yada the Disney World stuff in this game and just skip to the cutscenes between floors, but Chain of Memories actually has some very telling bits of foreshadowing concerning Sora's feelings if you're paying attention. Take Agrabah, for example. While there, Sora and the gang help Aladdin through a very rushed version of the events of the film. Aladdin wants to be with Jasmine, but also promises to free Genie with his last wish. He uses his first two wishes on trying to save Jasmine, but Jafar gets a hold of the lamp. Because Aladdin didn't free Genie when he had the chance, Jafar uses Genie for his evil schemes before Sora and Aladdin come in to save the day. Basic stuff. What's interesting though, is how Sora comments on Aladdin's story and how he projects his own feelings into it. When Aladdin first talks about Jasmine, Sora says, you wish you could see Jasmine every day? It's easy to see how Sora is projecting his own feelings about his friends, Riku and Kairi here. Then when Aladdin is overcome with doubt and feels like he's lost, Sora pulls him back up with, losing someone you care about is bad, but not as bad as never getting them back. Obviously, this is something personal to Sora. He had lost Riku and Kairi, and now Riku still feels like he's lost to Sora. And then, when Jafar uses the genie, genie's betrayal plays out as a parallel to Riku's turn to darkness with Maleficent. And when Aladdin chooses to still free the genie versus using his last wish to impress Jasmine, it parallels Sora's choice to search for Riku instead of going back to the islands with Kairi at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1. Now, all of that is fairly self-explanatory. What is so interesting is that at the end of this story, Aladdin tells Sora that he'll find a way to be with Jasmine. And it was Sora's conviction to find his missing friend that inspired Aladdin to keep hoping. You must be looking for someone you care about. So even after all of this setup narratively here could allude to both Riku and Kairi, at the end, the game purposefully is telling you this is about Sora's feelings towards Riku. And those feelings were strong enough to inspire Aladdin to not give up his dream of being with Jasmine. <laughs> and Agrabah is just one of many examples. If the Disney worlds in this game aren't directly foreshadowing what is going to happen to Sora in Castle Oblivion, they will more often than not be telling you how much Sora cares about Riku and how much Sora wants to find Riku. Which is an interesting choice because Chain of Memories cutscenes will constantly tell you, or more aptly, the organization will assume that Sora's most precious memories are of Kairi, but when we go into Sora's subconscious, we get shown over and over again that Sora's precious memories keep pointing him towards Riku instead. It's a classic telling you this while showing you that and seeing if you pick up on it. And to reiterate, these are things happening subconsciously, which would normally be the perfect time narratively to show how important Sora's memories of Kairi really are, even as Naminé is slowly inserting herself into the picture. So when you take that into account and look at Sora's poem again, it's easy to see how that could just as easily be talking about Riku, the one that Sora has been searching for all this time. Narratively, the game is pointing us in that direction. And narrative this, themes that, that's all well and good. But um, surface level, <laughs> we also get some, mm, let's just say choice uh, lines of dialogue from Repliku. Okay, so <laughs> these things are not being said by Riku himself. So we have to take them with a grain of salt, but Repliku is a copy of Riku's heart put into a replica. A lot of Riku's thoughts and feelings are all still there, but they've been tampered with by Nominate to the point where Repliku's emotions are heightened to the extreme. Narratively, this still functions as a way to tell us things about the real Riku, even if it's not actually him. And it's here where we get things like 
this. Together. Right. So like you. Sora. You're always trying to worm your way into my heart. Hold on. When did I ever do that? Huh. You forgot that too? You never cared. It never mattered to you. Like, oh my god, Replicu, buddy. <laughs> it's not cool to out Riku's feelings like that. The boy is still processing things. Yikes. But also, Replicu's heightened protectiveness over all things concerning Naminé would make sense if we assume that Naminé took that memory of the meteor shower promise between Sora and Riku, basically deleted everything else, and then cranked up all the negative emotions and feelings Riku was having during Kingdom Hearts. Naminé has inserted herself in Sora's place in Replicu's memories. And by doing this, we actually get to see now what a real love triangle would look like between Sora and Riku and a girl, be it Naminé or Kairi. And that's not how it played out for the real Riku. The dynamic between the real Sora and Riku was never this bitter, hostile, and unrelenting. Even at Riku's worst, there was still a clear sense that the real Riku wanted nothing more than Sora's approval. And there's a loneliness present in the real Riku that Repliku doesn't have. If Naminé replaced herself in Repliku's memories with Sora, then it's no wonder. She's put herself in the position that the true Riku of Kingdom Hearts 1 wanted all along, with Sora needing his protection and his single-minded drive to achieve that. Repliku is extremely fascinating to me. We briefly see what he was like before he was injected with Riku's memories and feelings. And on a meta level, he's a walking, talking, flanderization of Riku. All of the bad boy energy and none of the baggage or deep loneliness that Riku carries around with him. But after Repliku gets his heart and memories all scrambled, he's an absolute mess. He can barely help but spill all of Riku's pent-up feelings onto the floor. Speaking of which, the real Riku. Let's get back to him. There's this constant theme in Riku's story where other characters and Riku himself have to question. Once you've been tainted by darkness, can you really ever escape it? Now, darkness, TM, is a literal physical thing in Kingdom Hearts. It's even something you can apparently smell, but we don't talk about that much. But obviously it serves as a metaphor as well. And a big part of Riku's character development in this game is that he can't escape from his own darkness. He can't run from it or pretend it doesn't exist. He has to face it. Face it and accept it. And he can't run from the light either. He needs both to be strong. So don't run from the light. And don't fear the darkness. Because both will make you stronger. Make me stronger? Darkness too? Yeah. Strength that's yours. The darkness inside your heart, it's vast and it's deep. But if you can, Truly stare into it and never try to look away. You won't be afraid of anything again. All this time I've tried to push the darkness away. You've got to just remember to be brave. Know that the darkness is there and don't give in. If you do that, you will gain strength. The kind that's unlike any other. You'll be able to escape the deepest darkness. And I'll be able to see through the brightest light. Follow the darkness. It'll show you the way to your friends. Can I face them? You don't want to? You know I do. Of course. And I will. With my strength. My dark strength. Darkness! I know who I am. When did that happen? You were always terrified of the dark before. Learning to face your darkness and accept who you are? Hmm. 
Coming to an understanding that you don't have to hate yourself for things naturally a part of you? It's given me a lot of feels, not gonna lie. And most of them aren't cis and straight, let me tell you. And I just want to clarify here, I'm not saying that the darkness is a direct metaphor for being gay. Not only does that not hold a lot of water upon two seconds of examination, but it would leave a pretty bad taste in my mouth, you know? Riku's darkness is about a lot of things. His regret, his guilt, his pride, his jealousy. <laughs> he is a surprisingly immoral guy after all. <laughs> but. I don't think it's a stretch to say that darkness is also about his denial of feelings towards Sora and his own lack of self-acceptance. And that's the kind of darkness that a lot of us in the queer community can relate to. In the end, Naminé gives Riku a choice. You have a choice to make too. Why me too? No one's messed with my memories. It's not your memories. It's your darkness. In your heart there is darkness. And in that darkness is Ansem. He may be at bay for now. But eventually he'll wake. And he will take over you just like he did before. But I have powers you can use. With my powers, I can put a tight lock on your heart. That way, Ansem could never come out from inside you. What happens to me if I let you do that? Will I forget? Everything? Like Sora? I'll have to. The darkness in you will be sealed tight just like your memory. You'll stop remembering the darkness. You'll go back to how you were. Riku, please choose. He doesn't even look worried. Will I sleep like that too? Yes. Figures. Sora always did as he pleased. Whatever we'd be doing together, he'd find a way to slack off. Even trying to leave the islands. I did all the work on the raft by myself. That's it. When this slacker wakes up, I'll tell him off. I told him to take care of Kairi, and here he is just taking a nap. But I can't chew him out like he deserves, if I've been asleep. <laughs> and just like that, Rinku chooses to keep his darkness. He chooses to stay awake and face it himself, rather than take Naminé's easy solution. A solution that would wipe his slate clean without him having to work at it. But Riku wisely chooses the more difficult path in order to protect Sora and Atone. And from this point forward, Riku devotes himself tirelessly to protecting Sora while he sleeps. Riku still has a long journey to make, but at this new step in his journey, Riku's been humbled and has learned to accept himself, darkness and all. He embraces who he is and what's really important to him, but... Even though he's learned to accept himself, he still doesn't believe that anyone else will. In particular, Sora. And that's the next part of his journey. As a queer person myself, I can't tell you how relatable Riku's story has been for me. Has all the check marks of internalized homophobia, the teasing and denial of your real feelings, the big gestures to overcompensate pushing away other people who care about you because of your own paranoia and self-hatred. And even after you've learned to accept who you are, the idea of others accepting you the same way feels like a fantasy or like you don't deserve it. And again, I want to say that I don't think the darkness in Kingdom Hearts is always a metaphor for queerness because it's definitely not. Or that being LGBT plus means that you have darkness. I'm saying that in Riku's case specifically, this has been his darkness. And his darkness is more so connected to not accepting himself rather than being gay. Moving straight along into 358 over two days, Riku doesn't play a huge part in this game, at least compared to the previous games. But that doesn't mean that there isn't anything to talk about. Riku hides away in the shadows of this whole game, 
Not just from our main characters, who are part of the bad guy group, but Riku is also hiding away from his friends. Riku ties a blindfold around his eyes to keep his darkness at bay and not show the world the monster he's become. He's doing everything he can to help Sora wake up, but he's convinced himself that once this job is done, he'll leave Sora for good and fade into darkness. He even has Mickey promise him that he'll never tell Sora what happened to him. <sighs> oh, Riku. It's also in this game where we are introduced to Xion. Now, Xion is an extremely special case. A replica built by Vexen, her origins are similar to Repliku. But Xion is a replica built specifically to siphon the memories and abilities of Roxas and therefore Sora. As a backup plan for the organization to use. Her existence means that Namine can't return Sora's memories to their rightful place and Sora can't wake up. Why go into Xion's origins? Because the memories Xion is siphoning are specifically stated to be Sora's memories of Kairi, which is why Xion bears a striking resemblance to her. However, remember when I brought up that Namine most likely had to take not just memories of Kairi, but also Riku? In a scene that feels like a fever dream, we see Roxas and Xion relive a certain memory. Xion! Surely, you must have known that this was going to happen. Why would I know? Because in your memory, you've been to a number of worlds before you came to this one. And, and of, course, of course, in those worlds, the only thing you can see with the dark heart. That's, that's all that's all left, left in your heart. Uh, the dark darkest uh, memories. Uh, your your memories are long, long gone. gone. Every uh, one. That's, that's a lie. I remember I everyone from the islands. islands. They're, They're my, 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 my closest friends. friends. And who threw away those, those friends. Friends. Maybe maybe friends? Maybe it's your own actions, actions you've forgotten. It was you who destroyed your home. At first, this scene seems to make no sense. It works well to show to the player how distressing getting these memories is for Roxas and Xion, but if Xion is supposed to be siphoning memories of Kairi, why are they seeing this memory? And why is it so much more taxing on their psyche than some of the other memories they've received? On a symbolic level, Roxas turning into Shion and turning into Sora makes sense once you know what's what. But why is Riku there in this mix-up? Why wouldn't Shion turn into Kairi if she's supposed to be a replica of Sora's memories of Kairi? Do you see where I'm going with this? Maybe not. This scene is all kinds of screwy. So... What Roxas and Xion are seeing here is actually a memory of Riku's. Specifically, this happens in Castle Oblivion, where Riku fights Zexion. All of the islands you grew up on were sundered, scattered. Many hearts were forever lost to the darkness. Because of what you did! <laughs> you hated being an islander, so you opened the door to darkness and destroyed the islands. It was you! The only person who could remember this memory is Riku. And maybe Namine? Zexion is super heckin' dead for the time being. So Sora shouldn't have this memory for Xion to take. And Kairi certainly isn't involved in it. I personally think that this is a hint, or better yet, even more proof that Namine had to use Riku's memories and Sora's memories of Riku back in Castle Oblivion, which is why Shion is able to pull this memory and transform into Riku. At least, that's the best sense I can make of it. Regardless, the fact of the matter is, Shion should only be pulling memories of Kairi, but here we see directly her pulling a memory from Riku, and that sure is something. Riku is also one of the few people left to remember Sora. 
While Namine is putting Sora's memory back together, everyone connected to Sora loses their memories of him. But despite this, Riku is still more determined than ever to get his friend back. When Riku bumps into Shion and sees her face, Riku even sees Sora. Feeling uneasy, Riku lifted his blindfold just a bit to look at her. And for just an instant, she looked like someone else. Not Kairi or Namine, but him. It's just for a brief moment, but considering that nobody should be able to remember Sora during this time, I find Riku's ability to see Sora in Shion at all quite telling. And that's not even getting into the fact that Riku is super depressed with no Sora around. So, do you hate me for taking your friend away from you? Nah. I guess... I'm just sad. Huh. Riku is melancholy and depressed, wanting Sora back but barely able to remember him at all. It's so sad. Meanwhile, I'll remind you, Kairi is back home just living life. We don't get scenes of her remembering Sora until Kingdom Hearts 2, and everyone starts getting their memories back. She's just not part of this narrative, which I find to be a pretty big missed opportunity if she's supposed to be Sora's love interest. Speaking of love, remember when Roxas was asking Axel about love? Well, the reason it got brought up was because Roxas witnessed this. The Beast is protecting Belle, and everyone else in the castle, from Heartless. He is showing his love by being willing to throw himself into danger for her sake, to protect her. This fits remarkably well to describe what Riku is currently doing for Sora, and in the end of 358, Riku even has to go through his own beastly transformation in order to save Sora. All right. You've left me with no other choice. What? I have to release the power in my heart. The dark power that I've been holding back. Even if it changes me forever. Accepted it. He accepts that this is the price to be paid in order to get Sora back, and he doesn't hesitate. This is exactly the kind of love that Roxas was shown earlier. In short, Riku is doing this in order to protect the person he loves. And now, we get into Kingdom Hearts 2. Oh, where to even begin with this game? This whole game is... Riku? Well, 
This game is... I looked for you. Come on, Sora. You've got to pull it together. I looked everywhere for you. It's very, uh... We'll be the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> it's very gay, okay? And uh, I don't really know of any Kingdom Hearts fan who's going to disagree with me here. Even in 2006, in my hyper-conservative home, I played this game and was like, hmm, that's gay. <laughs> I mean, who hasn't memed on the fact that Sora barely expresses a feeling stronger than, oh, hey Kyrie, nice to see you again. Um, you look different. Compared to... I looked everywhere for you. And a bonus little fact that maybe not a lot of people know, the intro song Sanctuary, named Passion in Japanese, was a song specifically written to be about Sora and Riku. Which makes a lot of sense when you consider lyrics like, I watch you, fast asleep. All I fear is nothing. In you and I, there is a new land. My sanctuary. My heart's a battleground. And then that's followed by some backward lyrics. I need true emotion. I need more affection than you know. I need true emotion. Which, <laughs> if you don't know the extremely controversial history of backwards lyrics and music being used as subliminal messaging, I suggest you look into it, because it is quite a fascinating deep dive. But the purposeful choice to make backwards lyrics about hidden feelings and a need for true emotions is probably one of the most romantically coded things I've ever seen. And just to be clear here, these aren't incidental backwards lyrics either, where your ear is tricking you into hearing something that sounds normal when played the correct way. These lines were recorded separately and reversed to fit into the song this way. A bit of songwriting genius, if you ask me. Even if it is a bit haunting to listen to the song backwards to get the full message. Back to it, though, we also have more great lyrics, like... You show me how to see that nothing is whole and nothing is broken. My fears, my lies, melt away. I'm just gonna say it, this is all pretty clearly from Riku's point of view, and the fact that we aren't talking about this more, and again, the backwards messaging in the song is basically a hidden cry for love and affection. Ugh. Oh, this song is written to be about Sora and Riku. I just, I cannot get over that. Yes, you would have to read the Kingdom Hearts 2 Ultimania and interviews with Nomura to find that out specifically, but even if you're just paying attention to the lyrics, it all makes sense. Now, of course, the intro movie itself doesn't draw attention to that fact for multiple reasons. The primary being that we are purposefully left in the dark about where Riku is for most of the game, and we're meant to feel his absence the way that Sora does. But also, you know, it's... 2006, you gotta keep up the plausible deniability, am I right? <laughs> so, okay, look, Riku's feelings are pretty crystal clear from this point forward. It just really does not get more blatant than that. So, we again need to take the focus off of Riku for a little bit and talk about Sora. Sora's main goal in Kingdom Hearts 2 is to find Riku and King Mickey so that he and Riku can return to Destiny Islands together. Kairi is waiting for them there, after all. Safe and sound. So no need to worry about Kairi. Except, Kairi gets kidnapped first by Axel, then Syax, in order to motivate Sora to continue furthering the organization's goal. So now Kairi is in danger again, and Sora has to go rescue her. Along Sora's journey, however, not to say that he doesn't care about Kairi's well-being, he absolutely does, his main priority remains to find Riku. Where has Riku gone? Has anyone seen him? 
Sora even uses his one request from the Emperor of China to ask about Riku. And in the novels, we get a very intriguing little tidbit about how Sora feels during this scene. As Sora looked at Mulan and Shang together, he noticed his vision growing blurry. Sora? Goofy set a hand on his shoulder. Donald peered into his face. Crying for joy? I'm not crying. Sora turned away and scrubbed at his eyes. He was not. There was no reason to cry when he was glad. Riku was alive. I want to see him. I have so much to tell him. Riku! Ah, uh, yes. That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you're looking at an extremely queer-coded battle duo Disney couple and you just can't help but cry a little bit as they remind you of your best friend. A totally straight thing to do. Oh, yeah, the novels. I should probably talk about their inclusion in this video, huh? There's no way I'm leaving that juicy content out, are you kidding me? I've already used them a few times up to this point, but we're diving headfirst into them now. But, Daniil, the novels aren't canon, I hear you say. Well, while they aren't strictly canon, they are considered canon until proven otherwise, or basically secondary canon. Written by Tomoko Kanemaki, she has been the writer for all the light novels in the series so far, and all of the light novels do get approved by Nomura. And also, I would be a fool not to point this out, but Nomura himself liked Kanemaki's realization of the characters in the novels so much that she now writes scenarios on the main story team for the games. In fact, she did a lot of story work for 358 over two days, and more recently, Dark Road, though she's worked on all of the games since 358 as far as I'm aware. She's responsible for a lot of the characterization of Shion, precious baby bean, and thanks to the novels, we have a whole extra flood of Sariku thoughts and feelings. Let's go over just a few more, shall we? At that moment, I didn't even notice what was happening around me. I didn't even look. Sora, just at the end of my outstretched hand, was so much more important than anything else. Just a little more, and my hand would reach. He really did want to see Sora and talk. But that was impossible with this appearance. The things that mattered the most were what he couldn't tell Sora. It had always been that way. And the light cuts through the darkness. Light destroys it. Well, no. Darkness is never destroyed. It remains just at the other side of light, quietly. And it's there to make the light brighter. Light shines even more powerfully because there is darkness in the world while the things that lurk in the dark fear the light, and they hide from it. Darkness didn't come first. Light came first. I think the darkness came into being because of the light. That's the feeling I get when I look at Sora. You're in a pretty good mood, Axel remarked. Riku glanced up. Seeing Sora just made you that happy, huh? I don't feel like telling you. A little smile crossed Riku's lips as he took another bite. You know, it's creepy when you smile with that guy's face, Axel said dryly, following suit and nibbling his own ice cream. Silence fell over the room. He paused in his munching to stare hard at Riku, then finally asked, What is Sora to you? The question caught Riku off guard. He groped for words. On the sofa opposite him, Namine spoke up instead. Sora and Riku are best friends. It's true I turned my eyes away from the light. No, to be correct, it wasn't away from the light. I turned my eyes away from Sora, because Sora was dazzling. Okay, okay, I'll stop there for now. But are you kidding me with these? There is not a straight explanation for this. The games, like, make it already pretty suspect, you know? But this, in particular, gay drama queen himself, Axel, asking Riku, what is Sora to you? And then Riku not being able to answer? Oh, oh, that just makes me go feral. <laughs> anyway, even in the midst of Kairi's kidnapping, Sora finally learns from King Mickey that Riku is 
most likely okay. I don't want to break my promise. You made a promise to Riku? So he's okay! I can see him again! So it's after all of this. Sora knowing that Kairi is in danger and Riku is probably safe and doing his own thing, that we get the reunions between these characters. And yeah, the scenes speak for themselves. Oh? <laughs> you are different, Kairi, but I'm just glad you're here. You and Riku never came home, so I came looking for you. I'm sorry. This is real. When Sora reunites with Kairi, it's not like this scene isn't sweet. I'm not gonna rag on it too hard. It's very... reserved, I guess. But I do want to point out that for Sora, he's been picturing a Kairi from a year ago in his head whenever he thinks about her. Whenever Kairi is brought up and he imagines her, like in Halloween Town, he's thinking of the girl from Kingdom Hearts 1. And for Kairi, her mini arc, if you want to call it that, is that she had completely forgotten about Sora for basically a year while he was getting his memories back. She didn't have a choice in the matter, the poor girl, but she's been living her life without Sora and Riku for a whole year. Both of these characters have grown and changed since then, and it's kind of like seeing a dear friend that you haven't talked to in a long time. It's tender, it's sweet, but it's also kind of awkward. Sora sums that up by talking about how much she's changed, which you might remember, Kairi was always the one scared of change in Kingdom Hearts 1. And this is definitely a little bit of headcanoning here, but I feel that Kairi is kind of trying to push her fear of change down and overcompensate for the fact that it feels like she's missed so much. Her other fear was being left behind, and Kairi is definitely vocal about how she didn't like being left behind. Oh, uh, wait, except <laughs> this isn't really a headcanon, because here's what Nomura has to say about it in the KH2 Ultimania. I like the scene in Kingdom Hearts 1, when she watches the sunset with Sora and tells him not to change. I thought it showed very well her anxiety and loneliness over how as we get older, we find a distance growing between us and our close friends. And then, just as Kairi and Sora's awkward reunion hug ends, we get Sora reuniting with Riku. Wait, Ansem! I mean, Xehanort's heartless. I never thought for a second that I'd ever see you again. Just thinking about all the things you did makes me really mad. But... But you saved Kairi, right? I have to be grateful for that. Thanks. Riku! Don't go! Huh? Huh? Kairi, what did you just say? Riku... I'm no one, just a castaway from the darkness. Sora, come here! Say something to him. Here. You'll understand. Close your eyes. Riku, Riku's here. I looked for you. Come on, Sora. You've got to pull it together. I look 
looked everywhere for you. I didn't want you to find me. Why didn't you let me know you were okay? I told you. I didn't want to be found. Not like this. I couldn't. I fought with Ansem, with Xanort's Heartless. When it invaded my heart and I won. But to use the power of darkness, I had to become Ansem myself. Does that mean you can't change back? This battle isn't over. And until it is, I still need the power of darkness. Then, let's finish it. You're still Riku, no matter what. It honestly speaks for itself, but Sora sure doesn't seem to have minded how Riku's changed. You're still Riku, no matter what. Sora is just happy to be with him again. The novels add just a little more context to Sora's feelings as well. An image floated up behind his closed eyes. Riku. It was him. Riku. Sora looked up, holding tight to his friend's hand. It's Riku. Riku is here. He knew it was Riku's hand he clasped. It was bigger than the one he'd held a thousand times before, but in his heart, Sora felt it. A knot of something he could barely define swelled in his chest. Clinging to that hand, to Riku's hand, Sora fell to his knees. I was looking for you. Tears spilled over and flowed down his cheeks as he pressed Riku's hand against his face. How long had he been searching? How badly had he wanted to see Riku, to talk to him again? And Riku was here, here at last. I found you, finally. I missed you, I've missed you for so long. They'd been separated on Destiny Islands, then they ended up fighting. And then they'd gone through the door together from opposite sides. And he'd been searching, searching for Riku all the while. Come on, Sora, Riku chided him lightly. Keep it together. He looked up, his sight blurred with tears, into the face that wasn't Riku's. It was Ansem, no, Xehanort's face. But there was no doubt. He felt Riku's presence through their clasped hands. I looked everywhere for you. And this only gets better. When you see how Sora reacted to finding Namine in Chain of Memories. Remember how that game was constantly hinting that Sora dearly missed Riku and wanted nothing more than to find him? But then suddenly it became a quest to find Namine? Namine. She turned to look at him. Sora, you really came for me. The wind tearing through the island began to settle. It's you. It's really you, Sora walked toward her slowly, as if she might vanish again. I missed you. I missed you for so long. He wanted to run up and throw his arms around her. I've gone through so much just to see you. Now, <laughs> Sora finding Namine sure does strike a familiar chord with how Sora reacts to finding Riku again, doesn't it? Hmm... Speaking of romantically coded parallels, pause everything. Here's where I want to take a pause in the main events and talk about a narrative parallel that's been happening in each of the games up to this point with a certain Disney movie. A movie that I've already talked about in this manner, and that's played a part in all four games up to this point. Beauty and the Beast. Now, it might shock you to hear this, but Beauty and the Beast is, in fact, a love story. I know, I know. It's a really good one, too, I might add. It's not surprising that Kingdom Hearts would use Beauty and the Beast, given what a juggernaut of a film that it is and everything, but the specific application is what I am interested in. And the use of Beauty and the Beast in Kingdom Hearts has gone out of its way to make parallels to Sora and Riku when it really didn't need to. So, in Kingdom Hearts 1, Belle and the Beast's journey parallels Sora's journey. After Beast's world is destroyed, the Beast somehow manages to travel the worlds in search of Belle, much like Sora travels the worlds looking for Riku and Kairi. 
at Sora's lowest point is when Beast and Sora team up together, and they manage to accomplish their goals of finding the people they are searching for. This parallel is pretty surface deep, but it's cool nonetheless, and it's meant to be pretty obvious even for someone playing through the game the first time. Chain of Memories is where this starts to get more interesting, though. In this version of events, Belle and the Beast serve as a direct narrative parallel to what is going on between Sora and Repliku. And again, it's pretty on the nose, though maybe not quite as obvious to someone playing for the first time. Are you crazy? Come on! I came all this way looking for you! Take the hint. I told you to go home. Not until I rescue you and Naminé. I don't remember ever asking you to rescue me. Give it up. I'm not going back to the islands. For anything. Naminé's not the only one who's sick of looking at you. So am I! <laughs> it should also be noted that Belle is saying these things to the Beast because Maleficent is manipulating her to do this in order to protect the Beast. Much like how the organization is manipulating Repliku to draw Sora into their trap, but also making Belle serve as a parallel to the real Riku, who was also manipulated by Maleficent. Now, at this point in Chain of Memories, Sora has forgotten most of the things that have happened in Kingdom Hearts 1. He doesn't even remember that he's met Belle or the Beast before. So when it comes to these worlds that Sora doesn't really actively remember, I imagine that Sora's subconscious, along with Naminé's meddling, is making up the new version of events taking place. And I don't know, it certainly seems like an interesting choice to me to specifically make this couple, one of Disney's most well-fleshed out romantic pairings, parallel the story arc happening between Sora and Riku Replica, who Sora just thinks is his friend Riku, versus taking the more straightforward approach and have it parallel Sora and Naminé and or Kairi. Especially when this kind of story isn't the first thing that you would think about when using Beauty and the Beast as your starting point. The Disney worlds and characters have always been a way to explore themes and narrative parallels. Like I was saying back when I was covering Chain of Memories, the Disney stuff is always either foreshadowing or telling you pretty directly how Sora misses Riku. And we've already talked about how 358 uses Beauty and the Beast as a narrative parallel to Riku protecting Sora while he slept, and how that is a sign of love. And then, in Kingdom Hearts 2, the Beast is going through an arc very similar to Riku's story so far. It's time you dealt with Belle. She's scheming to take everything you have. This castle, your precious rose. See? It's just as I told you. While you toiled away trying to find your dear friend, he quite simply replaced you with some new companion. Trust no one. Feed your anger. Only anger will keep you strong. What? You're saying my heart's weaker than his? For that instant it was. However, you can become stronger. Plunge deeper into the darkness and your heart will grow even stronger. I've had enough of strength. There's only one thing I want. What? To love and be loved in return. Who could ever love a beast? Who was that guy you were talking to? The one in black? <gasps> Zaldan! <sighs> That's his name. He came from the darkness. He used my anger to control me. He took all my sorrow, 
my sadness, my pain, and turned it all into rage. There was nothing I could do. I could no longer see the truth. He's right, Master. We've all seen how kind you can be. After all, Bell can see the goodness in your heart, but I'm afraid you've yet to... Bell. Oh, I've mistreated her. I've mistreated her and been so selfish. She didn't say anything about that. She'd never tell anyone of my cruelty. She's too good. You see, I'm afraid he judges himself far too harshly. Why don't you just go talk to her? But... No excuses! Come on, we'll go with you. And, of course, Riku has gone through his own beast-like transformation. He looks like Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, because Riku had to submit to the darkness in his heart in order to wake Sora up. In other words, Riku chose to submit to a monster, damn himself in a way, all for Sora's sake. And it's only after Riku realizes that Sora will accept him no matter what, that's when Riku is able to transform back into his original body. Also, thanks to Ansem's machine blowing up and some kind of sci-fi heart mumbo-jumbo happening. But it is also in this game that the beast transforms back into a human, just like Riku. I'm just saying, Beauty and the Beast isn't the greatest story about besties ever told. It is certainly a choice to parallel Sora and Riku to Belle and the Beast in obvious ways, not once, not twice, not even thrice, but four times. What is that saying? Once is a coincidence, twice is an accident, three times is a pattern? We're past to the point of pattern here. This is a choice. And while this might be one of the more obvious ones, this won't be the last time that Sora and Riku play out the details of familiar love stories in the Disney canon. So, Put a pin in that. All right, back to the main events now. Sora and Riku have been reunited, and I am not exaggerating when I say that the rest of the game is primarily focused on these two's reunion. The game celebrates their rejoining at every chance it gets, emphasizing how well-balanced their dynamic is, how perfectly these two complement each other, Riku joins the party and their limit team attack, Eternal Session, is just spectacle after spectacle showcasing these two moving and attacking perfectly in sync. Meanwhile, Kairi and Mickey, two characters we have also been parted with and missed for the whole game, get sidelined pretty often and then shelved early on in the final battle. This is about Sora and Riku being together again, and everything else comes second. Which makes perfect sense unless, you know, your supposed love interest is standing two feet away and was just in danger. But maybe, just maybe, Kingdom Hearts 2 is trying to tell us that the dynamic between Sora, Riku, and Kairi is shifting that maybe there's something a little bit more special going on between Sora and Riku. I thought it showed very well her anxiety and loneliness over how, as we get older, we find a distance growing between us and our close friends. Remember how Sanctuary was written with Sora and Riku's reunion in mind? That's because the main conflict of this game, what it's all been building up to, was will Sora be able to see Riku again? And the answer to that is when we get our emotional catharsis. The plot with the nobodies and the organization, and even Kairi, is secondary cleanup work. Following the previous game, Utada Hikaru also sang the theme song for this game, Passion. Many fans seem to have the image Kingdom Hearts equals Utada Hikaru, so I didn't think of changing that at all. This time I wrote a story explanation for her that's longer than the previous games. 
we decided to have it played at the last scene, so for me, the theme was Sora and Riku's reunion. I wrote stuff like an image of a reunion, a happy moment in a way, and like Hikari 2 in there. It's interesting to me that Nomura directly compares what he wanted Sanctuary to be with Hikari, otherwise known as Simple and Clean. And while that might just be talking from a musical standpoint, I think in a way it's also talking about a sequel literally in the lyrical sense. No interviews or extra behind-the-scenes info has ever implied as much, but Simple and Clean also makes the most sense coming from Riku's point of view, at least when it comes to Kingdom Hearts. I believe Utada originally wrote the song completely without the influence of Kingdom Hearts, but I could be wrong about that. It could just be a coincidence. But the meaning is there all the same. Simple and Clean is about feeling insecure in your relationship and seeing all these things that could be red flags, but you just want your significant other to hold you and for everything to be okay. Riku is nothing but a basket of insecurities in his relationships in Kingdom Hearts 1, and if Sanctuary is a spiritual sequel to Simple and Clean, we also see how Riku has changed from Kingdom Hearts 1 to Kingdom Hearts 2. But while Sanctuary is absolutely 100% about Riku, I will concede that the Simple and Clean parallel stands on shakier grounds. I still adore it, though, and you can rip this headcanon away from my cold, dead hands. <sighs> Tangents about Suriku AMVs aside, let's get back to Sora and Riku reunion hours. It's not just the visual harmony showcasing that Sora and Riku are now an unstoppable force of two hearts beating as one, but their scenes together show this as well. Riku finally gets some much-needed validation from Sora about where they stand. Riku, come on, man. Why did you try to do so much on your own? You've got friends, like us. Have you forgotten? I'll tell you why. Because I'm not a total sap like you. Say that again. Sora feels confident around Riku and hangs off of his every word. And just who are you trying to fool? Huh? Huh? Myself. Riku. There's gonna be no end to this. Together we can stop him. Hm. And even when Riku's doubts creep back up on him about everything that he's done, Sora reassures Riku by doing what he does best. You're coming back with us, right? I had given in to the darkness. Riku! How am I gonna face everyone? Like this? <laughs> I love them so much. During the final battle with Xemnas, Riku and Sora get separated from everyone else, and it's up to these two friends, to rivals, to enemies, to BFFs five ever, to save the worlds. Sora gets to ride side saddle on Riku's cool sci-fi motorbike, and they go off into the void of nothingness together. Then in the next part of the battle, Xemnas is a hater and calls out to all the doubts and insecurities the two might have had about each other. But even without Sora and Riku saying anything to you, as the player, you know that this is all a pathetic attempt by Xemnas to make these boys fight, and it isn't going to work. Sora and Riku are past all of that now. Jealousy won't come between them again. And then when the true final battle happens, we not only get gameplay segments where Riku has to run to protect Sora from Xemnas, literally throwing himself in harm's way to do so. Riku and Sora move in perfect time together to protect each other from Xemnas' bullet attacks. But also, also, Sora and Riku entrust their weapons to each other to land the final blow, Riku even jumping in the way to protect Sora AGAIN in order to make it happen! And then, and then, when the battle has been won, we get some truly vulnerable moments between Sora and Riku. Now that they are alone, some real conversations can happen. 
Riku is finally able to relinquish the idea that he has to do everything by himself. And he can let Sora protect him as well. Sora. I can't. Don't say another word. It's not over. It's just not. How can you say that? Even if we could go on. Look where we are. Aw, oh, come on, Riku. You've been hanging out in darkness too long. You gotta try and think positive. Sora? Hmm? You lead. Got it. You know? I always figured I was better at stuff than you. Really? Hmm. Are you mad? No. I kind of always thought you were better at everything, too. You know... Maybe the darkness has gotten to me, too. Riku! This world is perfect for me. If this is what the world really is, just this, then maybe I should fade back into darkness. Riku. If the world is made of light and darkness, we'll be the darkness. Yeah. The other side. The realm of light is safe now. What I said back there... about... thinking I was better at stuff than you? Mm hmm? To tell you the truth, Sora... I was jealous of you. What for? I wished I could live life the way you do. Just following my heart. Yeah, well, I've got my share of problems, too. Like what? Like wanting to be like you. Hmm. <laughs> well, there is one advantage to being me. Something you can never imitate. Really? What's that? Having you for a friend. Then I guess... I'm okay the way I am. I've got something you could never imitate, too. Light. The door to light. We'll go together. Yeah. Sora and Riku are content to just stay in the realm of darkness together, trapped there even though all of their friends are in the realm of light. There's never a moment of doubt, or even Sora just taking a moment to pose the quite reasonable question, well, what about Kairi? Sora is just happy to stay by Riku's side and become one with the darkness together. Of course, they do make it out, but Sora makes sure that Riku will not be leaving his side. They go together, or not at all. So, now that we've finished Kingdom Hearts 2, I want to say that while I think it's easy to headcanon a queer narrative from Sora and especially Riku's story, I will concede that it is only one of many ways you could interpret it. Though, I will argue that there is no denying that most of the narrative's emotional weight over these last three games, and especially this game's climax, has been about these two's relationship. And interviews with the creators, plus supplemental materials like the novels, back this up as the intended reading nearly every step of the way. The bitterness of their falling out, 
the confusing but aggressively hopeful promise of their reunion, and the sheer elation at their rejoining, the emphasis on how perfectly these two people come together to create something stronger than their individual selves, the sense that this was always how it was meant to be. From this point forward, you know that Sora and Riku are only working with half of their strength when they aren't with each other. And when they are together, working in tandem, nothing can stand in their way. And for the cherry on top, they are willing to literally stay in hell together after they have saved the world. And that's fine with them, as long as they're with each other. <laughs> These are romantic tropes. This is the core of the series, and all of the biggest emotional catharsis is given to these two. And so I have to ask, just to check in on everybody here, you can see how this is extremely romantically coded, right? Like, sure, you can argue they're just BFFs, but you get why that is monstrously underselling what is going on here, right? Romantic or not, Sora and Riku are life partners, soulmates, yin and yang, two halves of a whole, and no amount of, well, I just think they're friends, or, oh, they read as brotherly to me, is going to change the romantic coding or implications here. Whether or not their relationship stays platonic, all of the things I've talked about don't just go away. This is also why when I see people talk about Riku's character being finished at this point and thinking that he needs to die or be shelved, I do a double take. To me, <laughs> the only way Riku's story ends is when Sora's story ends. Because the two are opposites of the same coin, or a more appropriate metaphor for Kingdom Hearts, Two links in a chain. Breaking off one means destroying the other. And Riku's story is by no means finished. He's gone through his redemption arc, his darkness arc, and now he knows that Sora will accept him. They are still best friends, but there is still so much about Riku left to explore, and so much of his feelings left unsaid. And Sora too. Sora has a lot of unprocessed trauma due to what's happened with Riku, and he really hasn't had a chance to sit and think on it. Not to mention the unresolved character threads that will be brought up in Birth by Sleep. But we also have another extremely hives-inducing interview from Nomura where he says, In the ending of Riku's story, Riku chooses neither the path of light nor darkness, but the road in between. How will that choice affect him as one who wields the Keyblade? What Riku is thinking at that point will become clear later. He decides to follow the road in between to achieve a certain goal. Riku's story is about, what is my relation to the darkness? But some things, such as what he is, have yet to be explained. What does that even mean, Namora? It's been years! I'm going to lose it over here! Breaking down this idea that Riku is going to die even further because I just really couldn't disagree with this idea more, I do think I understand where people are getting this idea. There's an extremely common trope in fiction of killing off either mentors and or love interests or rivals, etc, etc, in order to further our hero's narrative or give them more emotional angst. To tell the hero that they've got to be strong enough to do this on their own and... Uh, you already see the problem with this, right? Hell, even when Kingdom Hearts does this exact same thing for Terra, it's not used as a way to make Terra stronger. It's, it's specifically isolating Terra. Sora's whole deal is that his friends are his power. That kind of rugged individualism theme that goes along with permanently killing Sora's best friend just isn't in line with what Kingdom Hearts is trying to say. 
death is rarely used seriously in Kingdom Hearts to begin with, with most death scenes serving as more of an emphasis on how much two characters' separation from each other hurts. And even when Riku has died to save Sora, Sora does everything in his power to undo it. Um, we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves here though, but I just wanted to provide a counter argument to this whole line of thought. Kingdom Hearts is about connections. If Riku's darkness has been a metaphor for things like his guilt, lack of self-acceptance, isolation, and pride, it's the connections that we make with other people that brings us back into the light. And I don't think it serves Kingdom Hearts' narrative to have Sora get stronger through breaking his connections permanently. That's just not the kind of story that this series is going for. Okay, and so, with all of that said, we've hit, roughly, the halfway point of the video. It's a long one, I know. So, hey, take care of yourself. Maybe pause for a second and get up and stretch. Drink some water. Have you eaten recently? I promise I'll be here when you get back. Just, you know, take a little intermission to reflect on things so far. Okay, are we all good? Let's get back to it then. So now it's time to talk about the great character study that is recoded. What's this? Even more emphasis on Sora and Riku and their relationship with each other? Why, well, don't mind if I do. In this game, we don't play as Sora or Riku. Instead, we are playing as Data Sora. This game takes place inside of Jiminy's journal of Kingdom Hearts 1. We don't really need to get into the nitty gritty of it, but for this discussion, I need to emphasize that for this game, we'll be talking about separate people from Sora and Riku. We are in a Data world that has created its own versions of these characters. So why do we need to talk about Data Sora and, as you probably guessed, Data Riku, if they are not the real Sora and Riku? Because, yet again, like with Riku Replica, while these characters might be their own people, their personalities, their essence, and even their motivations come from the original characters they share a name with. And in turn, that still narratively functions as an inside look into the real Riku and Sora's relationship, and even foreshadows some interesting things to come, even if these things did not happen to the real Sora and Riku. Makes sense, right? So Data Sora and Data Riku relive some of the world-hopping adventures of Kingdom Hearts 1. However, Data Riku's role here is quite different from how it played out in that original game. Data Riku is the journal. Riku! Riku? Sorry. Not quite. Much like Sora there. I'm just zeros and ones that look like somebody you know. Ooh. Memories used to fill Jiminy's journal. But when they were pulled apart and then stitched back together, bugs appeared. It was these bugs that kept the book from being completely restored. Of all the possible vessels to protect the data, I was chosen from the journal's pages. The full set of memories was transferred inside of me to shield them from corruption. So, in a way, what I really am is Jiminy's journal. Apparently, the journal decided it needed to take a living, breathing form, and the form that it chose was Data Riku. He is Data Sora's protector, guide, friend, and Data Riku's role as the living embodiment of the journal meant to chronicle Sora's journey can be directly paralleled to the mantle that the real Riku selflessly took up at the end of Chain of Memories, which is extremely fitting since this game is also about the events in Castle Oblivion and about Naminé, kind of. It's also fitting that Data Riku is Sora's journal because when you zoom out a bit, it's the original Riku who started their journey to begin with. Sora's story started when Riku opened the door on Destiny Islands, and now Data Riku has been chosen as the protector of this data. 
So while the game is following the broad events of Kingdom Hearts 1, our heroes are actually on track to follow their character development from post Chain of Memories. This game broadly functions as a character study what if scenario, where Riku isn't the one responsible for destroying Destiny Islands and sending them all on their adventure. So Data Sora and Data Riku are buddies throughout this whole game, and they honestly have a lot of really sweet banter. Mostly of Data Riku trying to do things on his own, but also wanting to be around Data Sora, and Data Sora playfully teasing Data Riku about it, and then Data Riku teasing back. In other words, it's a lot of mild flirting, while also re-establishing a lot of the real Sora and Riku's dynamic with each other. Hey, Riku. Question. How many worlds have we been to now? Hmm? Huh? Cause not too long ago, the answer to that question would have been only one. But now we've been to all kinds of places, on tons of adventures. And instead of just sitting around and dreaming about what's out there, we only have to remember it. It's that easy. We've got the whole universe inside. There are worlds inside us. Try and let that sink in. I don't know much, but that's amazing. Incredible. But you know, no matter the world, no matter how far, you're always the same. You're right. There may still be outside forces trying to pull you in, but I know you're not gonna lose. Everything you touch makes you stronger. It always has. Sora. <laughs> Sounded good, right? You're not the only one who's grown through all this. <laughs> huh. Yeah, well, you're still kind of a half pint. Hey, don't think I'm not going to remember that when I'm taller than you. <laughs> I look forward to the day that happens. <laughs> no. No. Hey, Sora. Yeah? Never mind. I'll tell you when it's all over. Okay. I'll see you on the other side. But Riku, why didn't you let me know what was going on when we met? I'm sorry. You still needed to toughen up a little bit more on your own. You had a rough job, and if you couldn't do it, then... Well, I guess my only option would have been to handle it on my own. Riku... You know what? You gotta stop doing everything by yourself. I like getting dragged into your messes. Donald and Goofy said that. Friends want to help you out whenever they can. Sora. A major plot point of this game is that Data Riku gets kidnapped by Pete and Maleficent, and they kind of scramble his data and fill him up with glitches, or bugs. It's a scene that gets memed a lot, but the lead into it is actually pretty heartbreaking. <laughs> well, I still got an ace up my sleeve. Come on out and say hello! Riku! Sora, stay back! Riku! What happened? Glad you asked. I went and took the liberty of taking away his liberty. Data stuff like this sure is useful. <laughs> All I had to do was load some of those bug thingies into your pally's animatronics. Now let's see what this minion can do. I order you to attack! I will never answer to you. No? Okay then. What if I add a little more to- Stop! Well, that ought to keep you for a while. <laughs> so long. I'll just leave you two to get reacquainted. Riku, talk to me. I heard a scream. Sora, tell me what's going on. Mickey, it's Riku. They put bugs in him. What? Riku, can you hear my voice? Riku! Oh. 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 Riku! 
please. Can't you hear what we're saying to you? Destroy me. What? The music, the dialogue. Just how many times have you seen this exact setup used between a pair of lovers? One gets stolen away by the bad guys and brainwashed to fight for the villains, with our hero lamenting that their love can't hear them, begging for them to wake up and fight back against the brainwashing, and the brainwashed one using all of their willpower to fight against what the brainwashing has done to them. And then it's only through the power of love that the hero can save them. So Data Sora has to dive headfirst into Data Riku's heart to save him, with Data Riku fretting over Data Sora's safety the whole time he's in his datascape. Oh. Riku, are you okay? You shouldn't be here, Sora. I can fight the bugs off a little longer, but they're spreading and in just a bit of time, they'll take over all my data. And they won't stop there. They're going to dominate the entirety of the datascape. And that includes you too. But wait! What will happen to you? I'll dive into the darkness. And take the bugs with me so they're destroyed. They'll never see the light again. This will all be over. <sighs> Go. While well, I can still control this. I won't be able to hold them off much longer. Hurry, Sora. If you leave now, you can make it out. I don't want to hurt you. You have to go. Riku... I get it. There's still just enough time. Right. Great! Since there's escape time, that means there's enough time to stop the bugs and help you, right? What? I didn't mean that. <laughs> Come on, this is me here. You didn't really think I'd just give up and leave you like this. Sora. <sighs> I remember now. Once you get an idea in your head. That's right. Now tell me how to save you. What I find so charming about Data Sora and Data Riku is the same kind of charm I find from the real Sora and Riku. But what makes this game's versions of them so good is that it really gets to the heart of their aspirations. Them getting to explore new worlds together, being there for each other through thick and thin, and the gentle teasing that comes so naturally between the two of them. What's not to love? Data Sora saves Data Riku from the bugs, and all's well that ends well. So, of course, this is very sweet and all, but it also subtly hints at the real Riku's role going forward. Data Riku is the journal. Not Jiminy, not Kairi, not Mickey Mouse, or some other older figure. It's Data Riku, because the real Riku is the catalyst for Sora's story. His defender, the one who knows Sora better than anyone else. Riku himself is going to be making his shift from protecting the things that matter to protecting his most precious person. This game also foreshadows the real Sora's upcoming arc. Sora is holding a lot of hurt inside of himself, both from the broken hearts of people like Roxas and Shion, who had to give up their selves to make Sora whole again, but in general, Sora has a lot of repressed feelings that have been building and building for a long time now. Facing himself and facing his repressed emotions is going to be the only way Sora can truly grow and heal. And Data Sora proves how hard this is going to be, but how Sora will eventually be able to come out the other side. Lots of people can easily miss that Sora is a character who is constantly pushing aside his hurt for the sake of others, or even sometimes just pretending to be happy when he's not. And once we get into Kingdom Hearts 3, that dam of feelings is going to burst wide open, and in post-Kingdom Hearts 3, we still have to address that pain. Back to Recoded, though, I also want to note that Kyrie is 
hilariously absent for this game. <laughs> I mean, hilariously absent is how you can describe Kyrie most of the time, but in this game, it's especially outrageous. This is a game roughly set in the same timeline as Kingdom Hearts 1, the game that Kyrie is most important in, and the girl isn't even mentioned until basically the end of the game. And she's only mentioned by Data Riku, who compares himself to her and says that they were both going through the same kind of hurt and had lost their way until Sora saved them. Wasn't that Riku and Kairi? That's right. I was on a journey to find you guys. Darkness had taken a hold of my heart, and Kairi had lost hers completely. But at the end of your journey, you would have saved us, Sora. Think about it. What did Kairi and I have in common? When you watched, what did you feel? Something you have in common. It was hurt. We had both lost ourselves. And we were hurting in a way we'd never hurt before. There's no greater pain in the world. I ask you, Sora. What would you have done? This is the only mention of her in the entire game. And it's only done so Riku can say, Yeah. My feelings are similar to Kairi's. We were going through the same kind of hurt feelings. Which not only reconfirms my belief that Riku and Kairi were both afraid of losing Sora in the original game, but the fact that the game chooses to go out of its way to, again, reaffirm Riku's feelings and make them the center of Sora's attention by using Kairi as a point of reference while also not including her in any other meaningful way, is extremely telling. Telling as in, the game is telling you that Riku and Sora's relationship is really important, and uh, I know that some people might bristle at this, but trust me, I do not say this with any ill will. It's also saying that Sora and Riku's relationship is more important to the overall story than Kairi herself as a character. That's not to say that she isn't important at all, or that I think she's useless or anything. It's just extremely clear by this point that Kairi does not have the same kind of main character status as Sora and Riku have. And I'm not just getting that reading from this one line of dialogue, to be clear. In every game so far, they have shown us, again and again, how Sora and Riku's relationship is the backbone of the series, while Kairi has always come second or even third fiddle. This is just another very clear example of it. Another drop in the bucket of, if Kairi was important, why isn't she here doing something? Or why aren't we acknowledging that she isn't here? I do want to take a look at the scene again, though. In it, we have Riku reaching for the light of the moon. And then he seems confused. Turning away, he looks at Kairi's heartless body. Symbolically, it's very clear to me what this scene is trying to tell us about Riku's actions in Kingdom Hearts 1. Riku is reaching for the light in the midst of the darkness. That light is Sora. But when he tries to grasp it and can't, he feels confused and angry. He wants to hold that light close to him. Convincing himself that he's doing the right thing, he turns his back on the light and continues down his dark path, thinking that restoring Kairi's heart is going to get him what he wants. Kairi is the means to that end. And that's literally it. Recoded literally has every other major character from Kingdom Hearts 1 except Kairi, and she's only brought up in order to examine more of Riku's feelings about Sora. If that doesn't say something about how Sora's feelings are changing and how Kingdom Hearts as a whole is leaning more away from the straight romance the further it goes on, then 
I don't know, man. It just seems very telling. At the very least, you have to acknowledge that the story is putting no time and energy into building that relationship up, while at the same time going through excessive effort to build up another. And what's crazy is that Kyrie even used to be part of the game. At least some part of it. But at some point during production, they just decided that the Kyrie stuff really didn't matter and cut it out. I know that Recoded gets a bad rep, and most people nowadays mostly experience it through the theater mode cutscene and the collections, but it's honestly a really fun and charming game, and I recommend everyone give it another chance if you haven't played it yourself. It does have a lot of repeat Disney worlds, and it's not heavy on big story moments. But if you play it for the one-shot character study and unique gameplay, I think you'll find a lot to like. Okay. That's my thoughts about Coded out of the way. Anyway, it's time to get into the meat and potatoes. If you thought that the queer coding was getting ridiculous, you ain't seen nothing yet. Ah, uh, dream drop distance. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, where do I even begin? Taking place soon after the events of Kingdom Hearts 2 and Recoded, Dream Drop Distance is about Sora and Riku taking their Mark of Mastery exam by diving into the Sleeping Realm and fixing the problems there. They are intercepted right at the beginning of their dive by the baddies though, and are unknowingly set off course from their mission. Xehanort wants to use Sora as a vessel for darkness and basically kidnaps him without anyone knowing. But Riku, somehow through some secret power, it's love, unconsciously and instinctively realized that Sora was in danger and dove into Sora's dreams in order to protect him. This act of love turns Riku into Sora's dream eater, a benevolent spirit that protects against nightmares. This is just the setup, by the way. The premise of this game is Riku instinctively, not even choosing, but doing it without even knowing he's done it, throwing himself in danger to save Sora. A story where Sora is put into a deep sleep and Riku has to don the mantle of hero, fight off beasts, climb the tower, and wake his sleeping special someone. I know you, I walked with you once upon a dream. This is a straight up retelling of Sleeping Beauty with a healthy sprinkle of Kingdom Hearts pizzazz. We get so many good scenes with Riku in this game. Good scenes that just wrap an arm around your shoulder and whisper in your ear. Hey, hey, did you know Riku's gay? You probably should know that by now, but just in case, we're gonna make it extremely obvious. In Traverse Town, Riku meets up with Shiki. Hey, that's it? You chat up a girl and then just say, sure, and walk off? I'm bad at this. Sorry. Look, it's not safe here. You should go home. If it's dangerous, how can you just leave me here? Aren't you my knight in shining armor? Well? N knight You've got the wrong idea. And when he meets up with Beat... I just want to protect the one person who matters. <laughs> I know the feeling. And then when Riku does see a vision of Sora, what does my poor gay son do? What are we seeing? This oh. is so messed up, man! He's hopeless, folks. Completely and utterly hopeless. Now, all of these are great. Very gay, the pining, the longing, the comedic lack of interest in girls. We love to see it. But this next one? Oh, oh man, we've got a lot to unpack with this one. Master Frollo, he made me live inside the bell tower, but the real walls were the ones I built around my heart. You helped me see that, Riku. I was speaking from personal experience. I'd say you still keep a lot locked inside. We all do that sometimes. There are just some things we need to keep separate from the world at large. At least until we have time to figure them out. <laughs> he 
Yo, look at our girl Esmeralda doing some real ally shit. Hell yeah. Like, how much more blatant can you get? Oh my god. Sorry, this scene just punches me right in the gut. I love it, okay? All right, let's take a deep breath and talk about this. So... First things first, I want to admire just how much Riku has grown over the series. As someone who started off overcompensating his insecurities with overconfidence and cool guy energy and shoved all his emotions and jealousy so deep down that it made him a perfect target for Ansem and Maleficent, Riku is now able to open up, if even just a little bit, and be vulnerable around characters that he hasn't known for that long. And it's still hard for him to do this but he's making the effort, pushing himself, and not just opening up in general, but talking about some of his thoughts that he keeps so safely guarded at all times. And look, it's not lost on me that Riku is able to do this safely around characters who represent outcasts from their society, and they not only appreciate Riku's openness here, but understand it. Even Phoebus can tell Riku is still keeping a lot locked up inside. And our queen Esmeralda is like, yo, everybody shut up. I'm about to drop a bomb of understanding and comfort onto this gay boy. This is just outstandingly queer coded. The way that Riku and others discuss these walls that Riku has put up around his heart, how he needs time to reflect on them before he can share with the world at large. The look of gratitude, knowing, and acceptance between Riku and Esmeralda. And again, this is all coming from the cast of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, a film that celebrates outcasts of society and gives a glimpse at the horrors of what religious and governmental systems can do to groups who don't fit into their molds. And then what does Riku do immediately after this conversation? I know the road my heart walks. Yeah, boy, you go get him. Like, there is no reason for Nomura to use the Hunchback of Notre Dame as one of the worlds in this game, except for its very pointed messaging. I like this movie, but I can't really say that it's a no-brainer pick for Kingdom Hearts. So its inclusion and subsequent scenes feel extremely deliberate to me. And every world Riku goes to seems to be built around the idea of how can we use this to showcase Riku's love for Sora? Gee, Riku, don't you have a Jiminy like I do? He's my conscience. He's taught me all kinds of important stuff. Maybe you just need somebody to show you what's right and wrong. Sure. You can't shoulder all your problems alone, you know. You must have somebody, a friend you can talk to. Yeah, actually I do. That stupid grin he's always wearing. He's the best teacher I could ever have. Yeah, totally straight vibes only. Just casually daydreaming about my best friend's smile, you know, platonically. Uh. Chasing after perfection, chasing after what was right in front of me. Right in front of me. Look too hard for one thing, and you miss everything else. And then, the people around you get hurt in the process. What? Impossible! Looks like I was right in the nick of time, Sora. And then, huh. And then we get to Symphony of Sorcery, a Disney world based on Fantasia where Sora and Riku have to each find their sound ideas. When they bring them together, it lifts the curse on Mickey. We hear what Sora and Riku's sound ideas make when played together. Dearly beloved. Thank you, Riku. Say, can we try out that sound idea? Hmm. Oh. 
was amazing! What happened? Sora. Sora? <laughs> Funny. Just hearing that name kind of makes me want to smile. Yeah. That's how he is. What do you know? Riku and Sora. The sound ideas you two set free joined together. And when they did, they made a great and powerful harmony. <laughs> Sora can find the brightest part of anything and pull off miracles like there's nothing to it. It's pretty hard not to smile around him. Wow! No wonder the music sounded like so much fun. But I bet he's got you to thank for that. Having such a good friend means he could really enjoy it. Huh? It's like each of you is holding on to a little part of the other. Your hearts are always in tune, so they're free to sing. When Sora and Riku's hearts are in tune, they create the song, Dearly Beloved, the theme song to the entire franchise, a wistful, romantic, yet slightly melancholic tune that has been with the series since the very first game. That, Dearly Beloved. And this particular Dearly Beloved, in this scene, is a special composition of the song. Every Kingdom Hearts has a different composition of Dearly Beloved, but this one, just for this scene, is yet another composition. It's very similar to the Chain of Memories version, which certainly piques my interest and makes me think about the necklace theory again, but the fact that it is a specifically new arrangement of this song means that the song choice here was extremely intentional. And while we're on it, do you want to know the other times Dearly Beloved was used in the series involving Sora and Riku, and how it has evolved over time? Riku! It's Riku. Riku's here. I looked for you! <sighs> Mickey. I really appreciate it. But... I'll go wake Sora up. Riku! Look at his face. Sleeping like nothing's wrong. Like there's nothing to even worry about. He's always been like that. The three of us would agree to work on the raft. And then this guy would go take a nap on the beach. You see, it's my job to keep him on his toes. Besides, what kind of Keyblade Master sleeps through his test? I'm doing it for me too. Sora saved me once. And... I heard him call my name. He needs me. <sighs> Sora. Uh. Beloved has really only been used one other notable time in the series proper, specifically during the cutscene in Blank Points. So while it has not solely been used for Sora and Riku, it is most often associated with them or Sora. And 
there is no way in hell I couldn't bring this up, but the Dearly Beloved composed for this game specifically is in 3-4 time. A waltz. A close, intimate dance reserved for couples out on the dance floor. It's dreamlike, which is very fitting for this game, but it also serves as a metaphor for the game itself. This is about Sora and Riku's dance. Dream Drop Distance has a controversial game mechanic called the Drop Gauge. This gauge is really just a timer that goes down as you play as either Sora or Riku. When the timer runs out, you begin playing as the other character. But it's more than just a game mechanic. It's the waltz. It shows how far Sora and Riku's relationship has come, passing the lead to the other person to take control of the dance. Sora and Riku aren't jealous rivals anymore. They aren't trying to prove themselves better than the other. They are in step with each other. And that leads us into the end of the game. Sora and Riku finally realize that not everything is as it seems, and they've been tricked into this false test the whole time. Sora has been falling deeper and deeper into sleep, and it's up to Riku to fight off Sora's nightmares and save him. Like in Kingdom Hearts 2, Sora and Riku get a team attack here in the world that never was. This time, the team attack summons the Gayblade! A rainbow keyblade split in half, with Sora's side representing warm, bright colors, and Riku's half with cools. This keyblade clicks together to create a heart at the top, and the keychain for this combined keyblade is, of course, a Paupu fruit. I couldn't make it gayer if I tried. <laughs> we also still don't know what this keyblade's official name is. It's shown up in multiple games now, and usually it's just called something like Combined Keyblade, but that's not its proper noun name. So until that time comes, it's just the Gay Blade. And I have my own theories about why we haven't seen the name for this Keyblade yet, but uh, I'll keep those to myself for now. And we can't forget Riku's iconic line from this game. Are you what's trapping him in that nightmare? <laughs> Because if you are, I'm what nightmares fear. Which is, again, only made even better by the novelization. I won't hold back, and I won't underestimate you. I'll give everything I have to set you free. I was always jealous of you, Sora. I used to feel it all the time, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't still. I believed that feeling was darkness, but now I know it's not. The truth is, it gave me strength. And so did having someone to challenge me. Light and darkness are perfect complements to each other. The shadows are always greatest next to the light, and the light shines out brightest in the dark. I know what that means now, truly. When those dark feelings come over you, only your heart can decide whether to let them sink deeper into the darkness or to bring them out into the light of the sun. Accepting both is what it means to have a heart. It's what gives us strength. Even wanting to protect those you care about is a form of pride in a way. I don't think I can honestly say it's not. Same with wanting to be stronger. Joy and sorrow, anger and hatred, whether those feelings become your light or your darkness is for you to decide. The strength of your heart is what allows you to choose. And that's why I choose to let the light shine into my own darkness. And Sora, that light is you. Sweet Jesus, Riku. <laughs> this part of the novels makes a point of how anything can be your light or your darkness. It's what you make of it. Riku's desire to protect Sora and his complex feelings for Sora was initially the light that Terra saw in Riku, but then later, it became the source of Riku's darkness. And this game makes it clear that those feelings are now Riku's light again. His heart is walking the path that leads him to Sora, his light. With some final hour help from Mickey, Goofy, Donald, and Lee, Riku is finally able to save Sora from Xehanort, but Sora still sleeps. Riku decides he needs to dive into Sora's heart to try to wake him, 
And as he does so, Dearly Beloved, yet again, plays in the background. Riku defeats One Last Nightmare and then has to answer three questions. It's a callback to the questions that Sora had to answer in Kingdom Hearts 1 before his journey began. You can technically answer these questions any way you want to, but in another decidedly pointed move, Riku's answers here actually have a canonical answer. What is it that you're so afraid of? Huh? Hmm. Losing something that's important. What is the one thing you care about more than anything else? Huh? Hmm. My close friends. Riku, what do you wish? More questions. All right. I wish... to recover something important that I lost. If you fail to answer the questions correctly, you are locked out of seeing the secret ending. Now, the English translators decided to keep Riku's answers a little vague, but if we translate them more directly from Japanese, Riku's answers are more closely translated to this. What are you afraid of? Losing what's precious to me. What is most precious to you? My precious close friend. What do you wish to do? I wish to recover what is precious to me. That's right, Riku's canonical answers, which the game is semi-testing you on, is all about making sure that you understand exactly what Riku's true feelings are. This is, again, Nomura being highly specific about showcasing Riku's feelings and making sure that the fans don't miss what Riku's character arc has been about all along. To lock the secret ending behind getting these questions correct is not just cheeky. <laughs> it's a direct moment where the creator is making sure you're following the story before handing you a treat. And so what do these answers imply? When Sora got these questions at the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1, your answers would most likely just be based on your own thoughts, not Sora's. But this time, you're asked to answer these questions from Riku's point of view. The English doesn't really do these answers justice. I know that when I played Dream Drop Distance for the first time, I was confused by the vagueness of Riku's answers. But when I later learned the more direct translations, it changed the whole meaning behind the scene. What are you afraid of? Losing what's precious to me. What is most precious to you? My cherished friend. What do you wish? to recover what's precious to me. This isn't about Riku's close friends. This isn't about losing something important. This is about potentially losing someone. That someone being Riku's most cherished person. That person being precious and what Riku wishes to get back and protect. This is about Sora and only Sora. If you somehow had any doubts left, Dream Drop Distance has literally taken your hand and led you as gently as possible to the door. All that's left is for you to open it and see that Riku's queerness has been there all along. The text of the game supports that reading through and through. And Riku is just now learning to accept it as well and speak it out loud. If Esmeralda told Riku that sometimes we need to figure ourselves out first before we share it with the world at large, this is Riku's first step into answering honestly about himself. And he not only does this to save Sora, but while in the midst of Sora's heart. And that does it. Riku, in the depths of Sora's heart, is able to answer these questions honestly 
And now Sora is awake. A regular fairy tale ending, am I right? <clears throat> Riku! <gasps> Sora! Huh? Hey, Donald! Come on, you're hogging it all! Oh, calm down, Sora, I'm good to you. <laughs> Gorsh, it sure is yummy. Hey! Riku! You're safe! Riku! <laughs> uh, wait, haven't we got this backwards? And why are you having a tea party? You're safe, Riku! Oh, never mind. You okay? Feeling alright? Yeah. I've never been better. I was watching what was going on in my dream. And I could hear your voice the whole time. Thanks, Riku. Dream Drop Distance is just stuffed head to toe with Riku's sappy romantic feelings. So much for... Because I'm not a total sap like you. But even setting aside Riku for a moment here, this is also a game about Sora's growth. Sora getting a chance to fail and beginning to explore his darkness means that Sora will be able to grow. This begins a whole new chapter for Sora, and he's finally going to be beginning to discover himself and what his true strengths and weaknesses are. There's a lot for Sora to process, and Dream Drop, not so subtly, hints at a lot of the baggage that Sora has yet to unpack. At the same time, this game also just loves to show us how smitten this boy is with Riku. I still don't think that Sora has quite realized what those feelings mean yet, but he's hanging off of Riku every chance he gets, and is just so happy to have Riku back in his life. It's adorable. Me and the king and Riku? We can take on anything. Right, Riku? That's strange. Is one sound idea not enough? Don't worry. I've got a friend out there who'll help. He's always picking up the slack for me. Wow! The sounds are all joining together to make even more powerful music! Yeah. Two forces are better than one. Right, Riku? Riku! You're safe! Riku! <laughs> uh, wait, haven't we got this backwards? And why are you having a tea party? You're safe, Riku! Sora and Riku, you both deserve the honor. However, one of you braved the realm of sleep again to unlock the final keyhole and save a friend. Riku, I name you our new true Keyblade Master. <laughs> Way to go, Riku! <laughs> yeah? I knew you were gonna pass with flying colors! This is just so awesome! Gee, Sora, you're kind of acting like it's you that passed. I told you Sora still needed some practice. Hey! Really? I'm a Keyblade Master? Like, honestly, I feel like even trying to analyze this game from a queer perspective is difficult because it is just so upfront and in your face about it. Other than a few of my points that I'm really proud of, I feel like the best I can do is show scenes of the game and let them speak for themselves. I legitimately don't understand how someone can come away from this game thinking anything other than, wow, oh, Sora and Riku are really gay, huh? <laughs> Unless you're just the kind of person who dismisses the idea out of hand. And I don't know, maybe you are one of those people and you've made it this far into the video and maybe I've brought some of this into a different perspective for you. I don't know. I just know that when I finished this game for the first time, it had turned me from someone who had in the past definitely seen Riku's queer angst, but I never put much stock into it being canon. 
And then after this game, I couldn't see Riku's coding and queer subtext as anything but canon. And Sora is really beginning to reciprocate those feelings, even if he doesn't quite get the full picture yet. I also know that it was at this point in the fandom where the constant jokes about Riku being gay kind of took a turn. This game came out in 2012, and I think a lot of people suddenly became at least somewhat aware of how serious Riku's feelings were, and how Sora acted around Riku, and that's when people started realizing, hey, wait, this might not be a joke, actually. And you were either really excited by that, or, you know, the kind of person who would be like, oh, why does everything have to be gay nowadays? And Riku's queerness aside, that's not even getting into Sora. While Sora and Kairi's potential romance was sort of built up in Kingdom Hearts 1, since then there has been subtle shifts and changes to Sora's feelings on the matter, and by the time we get past Kingdom Hearts 2, most romantic context for Kairi is gone. And while she is obviously still a friend and loved one, Riku has been stealing the spotlight in terms of romantic coding and tropes. It's also just undeniable that Sora and Riku share the most screen time and chemistry. And, you know, it's just... This is not the way you talk about your best friend. The way Riku talks fondly about Sora. The way he recalls Sora's goofy smile. And the lengths Riku goes to to protect Sora. You know, it means something. This whole game is like... Riku's italicized, oh, moment. It's been a long road leading to exactly what his feelings are and what that means and embracing that about himself, his literal road to dawn. Riku starts this game still having doubts, but when he gets to the end, it's his self-acceptance and assuredness that makes him a true Keyblade Master. And I think that it's beautiful that Riku was able to do this when he was literally trapped in Sora's dreams and had to become Sora's dream eater. And I think that's in line with everything that's come before, and it's just the natural progression of Sora and Riku's relationship. I do want to talk about one of the scenes here at the end of the game really quick. Riku, you unlocked those keyholes within Sora's dreams. Therefore, it stands to reason that you now have the power to awaken Sora's heart. You want him to dive back into Sora's sleep? But, Master, Sora's heart is down in the darkest abyss. If Riku's not careful, he might just get trapped down there with him. No, I'll go instead. And perhaps you may even succeed, Mickey. But there is no denying Riku stands the better chance, having dived into Sora's heart as long as he has. Hmm. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Mickey. I really appreciate it. But... I'll go wake Sora up. Riku! Look at his face. Sleeping like nothing's wrong. Like there's nothing to even worry about. He's always been like that. The three of us would agree to work on the raft. And then this guy would go take a nap on the beach. You see, it's my job to keep him on his toes. Besides, what kind of Keyblade Master sleeps through his test? I'm doing it for me, too. Sora saved me once. And... I heard him call my name. He needs me. Hmm. There's something real strong that binds us to each other. Even in the darkness, you can reach him. All you gotta do is follow that connection. Gee, we're all connected to Sora. And if the darkness gets you, I promise I'll bail you out. Dark Rescue's my middle name. Guys, 
Thank you. Sora and I will be back soon. Riku is going to dive into Sora's heart and wake him up. Everyone's worried for Riku, but obviously they believe in him. Riku has a speech about how much Sora means to him, and the other characters piggyback off of this speech and say that they all have connections to Sora. They're all friends, and friendship takes on many forms, and no one form is greater or lesser. So whether Riku succeeds or not, they've got each other's backs. But what I want to point out here is the way that Riku talks about Sora with dearly goddamn beloved yet again playing in the background is different from how Mickey, Donald, and Goofy talk about Sora. They're all connected. It's a big, beautiful, found family. It has many different kinds of friendships, relationships, connections, but all of those are important. Riku stands the best chance at doing this because of his bond with Sora. But the others make it clear that Riku doesn't have to do this all by himself anymore. Everyone loves and accepts that Riku is the man for the job. Any one of them could maybe do it, but it has to be Riku. And <laughs> I see some people try to diminish or outright reject this reading of Dream Drop Distance by saying, oh, that's just because Nomura doesn't know how to write friendships. Okay, uh, <laughs> well, first off, seriously? You're that desperate to hand wave away the idea of Riku being gay that you'll just kind of condescendingly dismiss the abilities of the whole writing team here? Sequence directors, the animators, the musicians, everyone who worked on the game. People with years of professional industry experience who have been writing a game series where the whole main theme is about connections and friendship and love and all that jazz, really? I mean, I won't dismiss the possibility, but just, you know, what seems more likely? Secondly, if this was somehow, somehow, a writing mistake on the story team's part, it sure as hell has been an extremely consistent mistake that has been written into Riku's character development and growth for every single game in this franchise. Man, how do they do it? How do they keep accidentally making Riku read as really devoted to Sora in a very loving, queer-coded way? And not just through his devotion to Sora, but through extremely queer-coded speeches about self-acceptance and needing time to figure yourself out before you can share with the world at large. And, notably, all written in a subtle enough way to get past censors all while it's still building up to it. It's remarkable that they've somehow managed to write it this way so many times without noticing. It's astonishing that, in spite of everyone and their mom saying, oh wow, this comes off as really gay, no more and the team have never tried to correct that reading, or even give Riku some arbitrary girl to blush at even once, or just let people know, oh, hey, yeah, Riku is actually totally straight. In fact, when Nomura saw that people were assuming that Riku and Namine might be a thing because of the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, he not only did an interview to set the record straight that that was not the case, but also had his team go back and quote-unquote fix the cutscene for Remind so that Riku doesn't smile back at Namine anymore. <laughs> and again, this is from the same creator who is normally very open and welcoming to the idea of players creating their own interpretations. In the final world, Sora tells Namine, someone else special I know won't let you down. Did he mean Riku? He meant that the person Namine wants to see most in the world would come get her, as a way of cheering her up. It is actually Riku in the form of the one who has been entrusted with Riku Replica's feelings, who does go and get her. Namine does feel a special connection to the Riku replica. So, just to be clear, Riku was doing that as a favor for Namine based on the feelings of Riku replica, or Repliku. Someone who actually had feelings and a background with Namine. You know what has consistently been a writing mistake for this series, though? 
The translation team constantly trying to downplay Riku's, or even Sora's, possibly romantic language towards each other and replacing it with more neutral language, or even actually just straight washing the translation entirely. Okay, writing mistake might be a bit harsh, but there is clearly a bias in translating Kingdom Hearts to English, and I don't even fault them too hard on it, because, you know, het norm has affected us all. So I mean no ill will towards the English translators, but I do need to bring this up. All right. Once more, we've got to look back at Chain of Memories. <laughs> this is just the game that keeps on giving. When Sora is on Castle Oblivion's floor representing Destiny Islands, he runs into Titus, Waka, and Selfie, who tease Sora about who they think his crush is. In English, they say, Sora's probably thinking about her again. He always gets this way when thinking about her. But in Japanese, this feminine pronoun is actually not present. Instead, it's aitsu, which is a gender neutral term, but the connotation is definitely more male leaning, even considered a bit rude to refer to a girl as. And then when Sora confronts Nominee about who his special someone really is, the conversation again uses all gender neutral language. Taisetsu na hito, and Anohito roughly translate to important person and that person. But in English, Naminé instead says girl and uses she, her. You can understand why the translation team assumed, well, this is obviously talking about Kairi, so we'll just put pronoun she, her in here and make it clearer. But the original intent was to keep this vague and even lead you into thinking that this is about Riku, which when you double that with Sora's subconscious in all of these worlds pointing towards Riku being the person that Sora misses most, it makes sense that Destiny Islands would cheekily do the same thing. You're supposed to be thinking, wait, Riku? Are they, are they talking about Riku? And then Sora is suddenly like, yeah, I'm here to find a nominee. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, nominee. Right, that makes sense. In other words, the game is putting you through the same kind of brain fog that Sora is going through under nominee's control. And finally, to tie this up into a nice little bow, when Sora and Repliku part ways at the end of Sora's story, Sora calls out to him one last time. In English, Sora just repeats Riku's name twice. Riku! Riku. But in Japanese, Sora calls out Riku's name and then says, Aitsu. Nika! Yep, that same exact gender-neutral but male-leaning pronoun that Tita, Selfa, and Waka were all using to describe Sora's important person. All of this context is lost for an English-speaking audience and completely changes the intended meaning of the original text. And it's easy to see how even well-intentioned translators have accidentally unscrambled something that was supposed to be a mystery and instead made it something very straightforward, but ultimately not what was intended. Instead of nitpicking the writing of the games themselves, I find discussions talking about the clever writing and potential ways that you can translate some of these scenes to be way more interesting and engaging, and I think that these are the kinds of things we should be talking about instead. Oh, and don't think that we're done with Dream Drop Distance just yet. We've only just covered the game itself. What about the production? In an interview, Nomura was asked what the title of the game meant, and he responded. The story for this installment takes place in a world submerged in sleep, and from that sleep we derived Dream drop from the phrase drop off to sleep. And since Sora and Riku are progressing through the story on different storylines, we chose distance to express the gulf between them. 
and I think the cover art for this game showcases this idea really well. It can be flipped either way, but I love the imagery of Riku finally getting to ascend, while in the meantime, Sora is the one falling and sleeping. It's not just symbolic for this game, it's the mark of a turning point in the series itself. Riku has ascended to being a better person. He's truly the hero he was always meant to be. Meanwhile, Sora is going to be the one struggling and trying to come to terms with his own darkness. I just, I really love it a lot. It's one of my favorite cover arts for the games as a whole, with only the original game's cover art beating it out for me. Additionally, we have more interviews from different creators of Kingdom Hearts saying this about the series. What was the theme you most wanted to depict in the story of this title? Dream Drop Distance Scenario Cutscene Director Masaru Oka The Bond Between Sora and Riku's Hearts Sora and Riku have to be separated at the beginning of the story, but the bond between two hearts that trust each other closes the distance between the two of them and causes them to impact on each other. Kingdom Hearts series co-director Tai Yasue on longtime Kingdom Hearts lead event planner M.M. M.M. is a nerd for dramas and idols and anime from the 80s, and his pictures have an 80s anime style. He's captivated by the pure situations and pure love dramas, and is head over heels for the bond between Sora and Riku's hearts in Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts series producer Shinji Hashimoto on Kingdom Hearts 3. The fact is that the main focus of this series is Sora and Riku, how their friendship develops, but also how they grow up. Riku gets to be the hero and wake up his sleeping beauty. The whole game has a pink and black aesthetic to go with it, and once you tie in the waltz version of Dearly Beloved back into all of this, it's just so very clear to me that Dream Drop Distance was a game specifically made to explore Riku's previously hinted at but unexplored romantic feelings and be like, yeah, not only are Riku's feelings super valid, but this is truly his hero's story. This is Riku's motivation, his drive, the reason he fights for good, why he deserves to become a master while Sora still has things to learn and figure out, and why his heart has always been so full of light. It's because of love. It's because that's what these games are about and will continue to be about. It's about how Sora and Riku's relationship grows and deepens and the connections that they make with others. And we have that confirmed by the creators themselves. And that, my friends, leads us right into Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm going to do my analysis of Kingdom Hearts 3, but before that, I want to talk about my own little pet theory about the production for this game. This is important because my theory will make some other things I talk about make more sense. So, during the time before Kingdom Hearts 2's release, there's actually a handful of interviews with Nomura where the interviewer asks Nomura if playing Chain of Memories is going to be vital to understand and enjoy the story of Kingdom Hearts 2. To which Nomura responds, You know that Chain of Memories is a direct sequel to Kingdom Hearts and Kingdom Hearts 2 is a direct sequel to Chain of Memories, so there are very tight links between each one. But at the same time, we tried to separate the storylines so someone playing Kingdom Hearts 2 doesn't necessarily need to play Chain of Memories. Yes, of course, if you play Kingdom Hearts, Chain of Memories, and then Kingdom Hearts 2, you'll have a much better conception of the entire Kingdom Hearts universe, but you can play each game without playing the others. Looking at interviews like this, I think it's safe to say that the team really tries to stick to that kind of logic for each release, and that would also mean that Kingdom Hearts 3 was trying to do two seemingly impossible tasks at once. One, it had to be the grand finale of the Xehanort saga, thus wrapping up a lot of major story beats that spanned over the entire series so far. And two, it wanted to keep its own narrative fairly concise so that players who maybe haven't played every game can still follow along and enjoy what it has to offer. There was a lot of pressure for it to happen this way too, because 
because even with Square re-releasing the whole series in the 1.5, 2.5, and 2.8 collections, there was still a lot of misinformation regarding what players would be expected to know before jumping into Kingdom Hearts 3. Granted, I was always on the boat of, if you skip books in a series, don't complain when you decide to only read books 1, 3, and 10 and then call it confusing. Maybe you're the problem, not the author. Either way, Kingdom Hearts 3 was left with an impossible task, and it was never going to be able to meet everyone's expectations. Personally, I love it, and I think that it managed to do a great job given what it had to do and the time that it had to do it in. And I do think that for the most part, Kingdom Hearts 3 does a decent job of not leaving players behind. Maybe sometimes even too well, as longtime fans have complained that they wish that some elements had gotten a bit more screen time or even were given a bit more space to breathe, whereas those less familiar with the series were still, obviously, not going to understand everything going on. But regardless of where you fall on that scale, Kingdom Hearts 3 still manages to tell a complete story that pulls you through the emotional beats of the narrative, and I think that it does this through its well-structured theming and Sora's emotional journey throughout the game. I bring all of this up because some of the things I'm going to be talking about with Kingdom Hearts 3 make more sense if you assume that the story team left a lot of little clues for diehard fans to pick and poke at while also not really getting into the weeds of any of them just yet so that they could trim up the fat for players who are not going to understand it. A lot of what happened in Kingdom Hearts 3 is still kind of an enigma, even if the overall plot is fairly comprehensive. Like I said, that's my own pet theory, and I think it's important because, hey, guess what? There's a lot of weird things about Kingdom Hearts 3 to pick and poke at, and... Sometimes, I swear, it can be so frustrating that only a handful of people are talking about them. And I even sometimes see people make the assumption that, well, nothing's been said about that, so you're probably just reaching. No! No, you guys! That's called leaving clues! Foreshadowing! Kingdom Hearts does this all the time! In fact, Here's Nomura saying again just that about Kingdom Hearts 3. I believe Kingdom Hearts 3 is truly completed when two thoughts, whatever you feel from playing the game, and my thoughts that I've secretly placed in the game, match up together. Remember how everyone talks about how Coded is completely pointless? You know, the game that introduced the concept of the Book of Prophecies, a major story element now, and foreshadowed Sora and Riku's character development? reminded us of the Thank Nominee plotline and foreshadowed happier endings for the Sea Salt Trio in Wayfinder Trio? Remember when Dream Drop made the fact that Sora was wearing an X on his shirt a plot point? <sighs> or how Riku had the Dream Eater symbol on his back the whole time? And what about the theory that Terra's heart was connected to Ansem's guardian heartless? That theory had been around for years, only to basically be confirmed in Dream Drop and then finally proven correct in Kingdom Hearts 3. The fact that nobodies could regrow their hearts, something hinted at in Kingdom Hearts 2, heavily implied in 358 over two days, and then finally confirmed in Dream Drop. Nomura loves putting in weird little clues for future installments. And I think way too many people are taking Kingdom Hearts 3 at face value. Especially considering the planning around Kingdom Hearts 3 and the upcoming installments in the next arc has been intense. There are currently so many mysteries and possibilities even as we've wrapped up a lot of major storylines. So when it comes to Kingdom Hearts 3, this is not only going to be my analysis, but also my speculations, because it's kind of impossible to talk about one and not the other. Though I will be keeping my discussion to things only relevant for this video, otherwise we would be here all day. Phew. Okay. So let's start with the easy stuff. Now, Sora and Riku are separated for most of the game, you know, the huge. 
Ah, I swear one day we will get a Kingdom Hearts game where Sora and Riku are partying together for the majority of the game and I will finally be able to die happy. Anyway, they each have different missions this time around, but right away at the beginning, we get confirmation that Riku's growth from Dream Drop Distance is still his primary motivation. I think it's because you finally found inside you that special strength to protect what matters. What? Sometimes you care so much for somebody that other feelings disappear. And then there's no room for fear or doubt. <sighs> now, I do want to point out here that while the English version leaves things a little vague, the original Japanese dialogue makes things a bit clearer. In the English dub, you could easily interpret Mickey and Riku generalizing about Riku finding the strength to protect anyone and anything that might matter to him, which is certainly one way to translate it, but that's not as clear as it should be. Especially if you're familiar with Riku's growth in Dream Drop, its vagueness is almost a step backwards. Unsurprisingly, what we should be seeing is a direct callback to Riku's answers from the end of Dream Drop. And in the original Japanese script, that's exactly what we get. Mickey and Riku are a lot more specific about where Riku's strength comes from. It comes from a person important to you, or the person who matters, the feeling of wanting to protect someone, your most cherished or precious person. It is the exact same phrase that Hercules, just in the scene preceding this one, tells Sora is why he chooses not to live on Mount Olympus. I can see my family anytime I want. If I stayed, I'd have to be apart from the person I love most, and that life would be empty. The game is, again, purposely setting up a Disney couple parallel to Sora and Riku. Hercules doesn't live on Mount Olympus because it would mean living apart from his most precious person, Meg. And Mickey points out that Riku is no longer scared to face the dangers ahead because he is willing to do anything for his most precious person, Sora. And to be clear, in Japanese, Hercules and Mickey use the exact same wording. The very same Taisetsu na Hito I've talked about before. But in English, Herc's use of the phrase gets accurately translated to the person I love most while Mickey's use of the exact same phrase becomes the more wishy-washy that special strength to protect what matters. I think it's because you finally found inside you that special strength to protect what matters. I'd have to be apart from the person I love most. Sometimes you care so much for somebody that other feelings disappear. Sora, we never got back to your question. Can I help? Mm, it's okay. I think I'm meant to figure it out for myself. I'll find my strength the way you found yours. Something to fight for, with all my heart. And then there's no room for fear or doubt. <sighs> Is that it? Strength to protect what matters. As a refresher for the movie Hercules, the climax of that film first involves Megara putting her life in danger and dying for the sake of Hercules, telling him people do crazy things when they're in love. And then Hercules goes into the underworld to rescue Meg, and saying the same thing back to her. It's about sacrificing yourself for the one you love, and we're going to be seeing a certain duo do exactly that in this game. It's Sora and Riku. I know that's not a secret at this point, but just add it to the list of blatant Disney couple parallels. Mickey and Riku don't name the person they're talking about, obviously, but the original dialogue here makes a lot more sense. After all, it's Riku who says, Maybe I'm okay with being here this time because you're here with me, Mickey. And Mickey says back, No, my gay son. We both know it's not because of me. It's because you've come to peace with your queerness, and that's given you incredible peace of mind to do the things that need to be done. And Riku's like, Yeah, you're right. 
man, I'm, uh, I'm having one of those flashbacks right now where you remember something gay you did as a child, and I'm kind of reeling at how it's taken me this long to reach this point. Oh, really? What is it? Tee <laughs> I'm not telling. So, pretty clearly, this is talking about Sora. Like, it's so obviously talking about Sora that they don't even need to mention him by name. Now, I also want to point out some things about Kingdom Hearts 3 and translations while we're here. <laughs> First off, I'm not the one translating. I barely know any Japanese, I, I admit. However, I will say that I've seen similar takes from multiple different sources that I trust about the translations when it comes to Kingdom Hearts and how Square Enix of North America handles it. In short, in the past, Nomura usually got to be a lot more hands-on with the translators and make sure that his intentions with the writing were coming across as he wanted them to. But in Kingdom Hearts 3, it was the first time that because of scheduling and production hiccups that the same kind of care wasn't allotted time for. Now, this doesn't mean that every past Kingdom Hearts game is perfect in their translations either, because they're not. I've already pointed out a small handful of them. There's actually several other instances where Square Enix of North America have shown a tendency to kind of assume straightness, and therefore tone down gay-coded dialogue while also trying to beef up the potential romantic dialogue of a straight couple. Which, obviously, is going to leave a disconnect between what English-speaking players are being told versus what they are being shown. There's also been notable instances where translations lead to misconceptions or potential plot holes that weren't present in the original language. But because of the schedule Kingdom Hearts 3 was on, this means that there are even more instances than usual of things maybe not quite making sense. I don't have time to get into all of those, but I do recommend that you go look into them if you're interested. What's important to talk about for now is that because of all of this, Riku's very clear, queer-coded dialogue has been made a lot more vague, while other scenes involving Kairi are, you know, played a bit more straight, if you catch my drift. And as we've already discussed, this can really mess with the narrative framing and payoffs when things that are supposed to be set up as easily recognizable parallels are suddenly a lot more vague and unclear. So here's a quick rundown on some translations that I've seen people discuss most often. We've talked about this one already. Sora, you don't believe that. I know you don't. In this scene, Riku says, Sora, you don't believe that. I know you don't. While in Japanese, he's saying something more along the lines of, Sora, I believe in you. Don't give up. Or, you can't give up. Which, just from a connotation standpoint, the original Japanese dialogue here means so much more. Instead of Riku telling Sora what he believes, Riku is telling Sora that he believes in him. As a result, the English downplays Riku's faith in Sora, and it could almost be taken as Riku kind of scolding Sora instead which isn't what I think we're meant to be taking from this scene. I personally think that Sora, I believe in you. I know you won't give up. Would be a nice balance between these two translations and would illustrate Riku's feelings more clearly here. But this specific phrasing is actually important because it's going to come back in a critical way later on. Much like all of the times Riku or others have said, come on Sora, giving up already? I thought you were stronger than that. Which is a line that has been repeated dozens of times in Kingdom Hearts. It's a very specific callback, and it wouldn't make sense as a callback if it was suddenly changed to something like, let's go nondescriptive friends, throwing in the towel now? You don't have any weaknesses. That barely resembles the original intention behind the phrase, and it doesn't make sense as a callback any longer, even if the meaning is the same. Riku's I believe in you should be getting a similar callback status here, but because the translation is a little muddy, future references to it are also unclear. 
This isn't the only time that Kingdom Hearts 3 has a piece of dialogue it calls back to in this way either. In Olympus, Hercules tells Sora that he wanted to save Meg with all his heart. And Sora calls back on this phrase multiple times. Early on, when he wants to find a way to bring Roxas back. Again, when saving Ventus. And then one final time before diving in to save Riku and the Guardians of Light. So callbacks like these were absolutely put into this game with purpose. When Sora is dead in the final world, he tells Nameless Star that a friend believed in him, making this the first callback to what Riku said. Good. You have to believe. Believe? Oh, you mean know in my heart he will return without any proof? Exactly. Believe. I thought it was all over for me, but a friend of mine looked me in the eye and said, you don't believe that. <laughs> wow, <laughs> so interesting that Sora would think of Riku's last words to him while this girl is, you know, talking about her heart pining for another. Wow, <laughs> I wonder what it could mean. <laughs> And then later... You're the one who kept me from fading away! All I did was believe that you wouldn't. In this one, Kairi tells Sora, All I did was believe that you wouldn't. And she's talking about Sora fading away, which is again meant to be another callback to what Riku said, and connect both Riku and Kairi to Sora thematically. They are both responsible for believing in Sora and guiding his way back. I think if instead Kairi said something like, I believe in you, I knew you wouldn't give up, it would have tied this callback in so much better. There's even more going on with this scene, so be sure to remember this. We'll be coming back to it in a minute. I just want to get all these translations covered first. And then this one just really takes the cake. <laughs> In English, Sora says, I feel strong with you, Kyrie. I feel strong with you, Kyrie. <laughs> While in Japanese, this is more so along the lines of, Of course you're strong, Kyrie. Now, this one is just doing Kyrie dirty. The meaning and implication is completely different. By having Sora say, I feel strong with you, Kyrie, it makes everything here about Sora and Sora's strength. His feelings are taking precedence. It also implies a more romantic feeling from Sora's end. Whereas, of course you're strong, is Sora reaffirming Kairi's own strength. Kairi is strong. Sora knows this. Sora wants to make sure that she knows this about herself. Which is important because Kairi's main struggle and worry in this game has been about her self-confidence feeling like she's been left behind, and like she might not be strong enough. Please work! So I think that losing this line where Sora compliments her strength is a real shame, and it was obviously done in order to put a more romantic spin on a line that didn't really have that to begin with. But you can clearly see how several of these could alter the implication of the overall text, just like how it did in Chain of Memories. Nomura has even said multiple times in the past that he tries to make sure that Kingdom Hearts English translations are as accurate as possible, but for obvious reasons, the Japanese is always going to be the best at conveying what he actually means. And it's for that reason in particular that I don't mind being a little nitpicky about the translations in this game, especially when it comes to big character moments. Regarding the localization, what are the times and the difficulties of the adaptation and translation of a work such as Kingdom Hearts 3, which collaborates closely with a local franchise, Final Fantasy, and with a Western brand as important as Disney and the attached animation brands? The biggest challenge is not so much the differences between the Kingdom Hearts franchise and other brands. When I direct a game, I ask for translations to be as direct and faithful as possible, no matter how complex the subject is. This implies the question of which of the two localizations, Japanese or English, is the best. 
The truth is that, especially for Kingdom Hearts, an incorrect or defective translation risks compromising the comprehension of the whole story, and this is why I care about it so much. Alright, back to Riku's scene here with Mickey. I think it's neat how we can compare and contrast Riku and Sora's growth as characters in this game. Up until now, Riku has always relied on himself to get the job done. He fights to protect the things that matter, or, as he's matured and realized what's really important to him, the person who matters most to him. But Sora has taught Riku that he doesn't have to do these things alone. He can depend on his friends to help him. It's a great payoff to Riku's arc so far that's been set up since the very beginning. And while Sora never had as big of a fall from grace, Sora is behind Riku in terms of realizing what his true goals and aspirations are. Sora has been able to get through every adventure thrown at him with a smile on his face, some determination, some dumb luck, but most importantly, because of his friendships. I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power. Let's see it together. My friends are my power. My friends are my power. No. I know the Keyblade didn't choose me, and I don't care. I'm proud to be a small part of something bigger. The people it did choose. <gasps> my friends, they are my power! My friends are my power! So here's the catch. Sora's gotten so used to his friends being his power that he doesn't believe in his own inner strength anymore. And after his failure in Dream Drop Distance, Sora has taken quite a hit to his own self-esteem and Kingdom Hearts 3 really begins to just scratch the surface on this issue. This theme is set up and foreshadowed in many of Kingdom Hearts 3's worlds. Of course, it's first touched on briefly in Yedin Sid's Tower and then Olympus. However, the darkness nearly took control of you, and your grasp of your new abilities leaves much to be desired. Oh. Furthermore, <clears throat> Zaylor nearly made you his vessel, and in the oh. process stripped you of most of the power you had gained by then. I suspect you have already noticed this, correct? Say, Maleficent, I don't know about his sidekicks, but Kid Keyblader here looks way puttier than the last time we saw him. <laughs> I say we finish him off while we still can. Wait. Oh. It's fine. I can take it. Gorge, it sure don't sound like it. Did Pete saying mean things bother you? It's fine. I can take it. You're gonna get stronger. We know you. You can take it. Don't say that. Oh, I just said what he said. He can take it. But it is Riku who can comfort Sora about this issue when others kind of tease Sora about it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Sorry. Master Yen Sid knows you a little too well. He said you'd try to stage a half-baked rescue. <laughs> yeah! Laugh it up! Sora, huh? I know you're volunteering because you're worried. About me and Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> well... Thanks. But, the power of waking's important. You can come to the rescue once you've got that. Sound fair? Yeah. All right. But be safe. No reckless stunts. <sighs> yes, sir. Riku believes in Sora's strength, but Sora is shaken and unconfident. And every Disney world is either a reminder of Sora's perceived failures or a foreboding insight into the grief that Sora is going to have to endure in the Keyblade graveyard near the end of the game. Was I ready? I do know hurt. When I lost Riku and Kairi, 
and later when I lost the Keyblade, and you guys had to go on without me like that? Having no one to turn to was the worst kind of hurt, but that just shows how much you mean to me. Carrying around a little hurt can't be all that bad. Hurting is part of caring. Of course, any Sora is still Sora. Calling back to Data Sora's development, dealing with the hurt Sora is carrying around inside. Sora says that hurting is part of caring, and so carrying around a little hurt can't be all that bad. And while I don't disagree with Sora here, it's definitely another example of Sora maybe biting off more than he can chew. And, even more importantly, still carrying around the hurt from events that happened way back in Kingdom Hearts 1. On a practical level, we're meant to recognize Sora's hurt as the tragedies that befell the Sea Salt Trio and Wayfinder Trio. But as a character, Sora still has a lot of his own issues left unaddressed. But what about Andy? You care about him so much. Oh. And he's still right here with us. Oh. If we follow our hearts, we'll find him again. <laughs> yeah. Sora worries that the toys may never see Andy again, but as long as they've got each other, then they'll be okay. This foreshadows the ending of the game, where Sora tells Kairi that as long as they think about each other, they're never truly alone. And also Sora disappearing right before the end credits. Look, I'm sure I yeah, her heart's pulling her all kinds of ways. The outside world must seem so big and scary. I know how she feels. Lucky for me, you two came along at just the right time. And the rest has been unforgettable. Rapunzel must have really wanted to see the outside world, Goofy remarks, as he watches Rapunzel running around and smiling. If there are any other worlds out there, why did we end up on this one? Sora suddenly remembers the words he heard Riku say before they left the Destiny Islands. That's why we need to go out there and find out. Just sitting here won't change a thing. It was exactly like Rapunzel was right now. Sora wasn't sure whether Riku had chosen the right way to get out, but at the very least, he hadn't regretted ending up in the outside world. He'd met his friends that way, too. Rapunzel's eagerness to see the outside world reminds Sora of Riku. On top of this just being a very cute comparison and making me wonder if Sora is ever not thinking about Riku, I think it paints a very clear picture of how Sora buries his past traumas. For all that Riku has done to make things up to Sora and his clear guilt over past actions, Sora still hasn't heard from Riku why he did all those things to begin with. And Sora still shoves away the possibility that Riku did them purposefully. Instead, Sora forces himself to look on the positive side of things rather than think about how Riku's actions hurt him. <laughs> oh. Here's the first example of Sora witnessing a true love sacrifice in this game. Just keep this scene in mind for now. It'll be a special tool we bring back later. Sully, I know you've missed her, but it's time to postpone our play date. You're right, Mikey. Let's get our girl home. Mm. And like in Toy Story, Sora has to witness a closely bonded trio part ways for the greater good. Frozen's World Arendelle makes an extremely pointed parallel between Anna and Elsa and Sora and Riku. When we were little, my sister and I used to be really close. But then, one day, for some reason, Elsa just shut me out. Well, that's when she used her magic to push me away. It was all my fault. I shouldn't have upset her the way I did. Elsa ran away because she was frightened. I have to bring her home. I'm sure she knows how much you love her. 
and I think maybe that's why she looks so sad. It's just like when Riku disappeared. He thought he had to push me away to protect me. Maybe Elsa's the same. If anyone can help her, it's you. Huh? <sighs> Thanks. I'm sure she knows how much you love her. Sora did some reminiscing on his own. Also looks like she was carrying some awful burden when I saw her before. And now I remember where I saw it. It was the expression Riku had when he disappeared and we closed the door to Kingdom Hearts. Sometimes you push people away because they matter so much to you. I know Elsa loves Anna a whole lot. If anyone can help her, it's you. That was what Sora wanted her to know. That she and her sister could be close as they once were, just as he and Riku were fighting alongside each other now. Again, Sora is thinking about Riku while characters are having deep introspective hours about the people who mean the most to them. Now, some will point to this as evidence of Sora and Riku having a sibling dynamic, and I feel the need to remind everyone that there is a key difference between the relationship between Anna and Elsa and Sora and Riku. Sora and Riku aren't actually related. But also, also, <laughs> this does not negate all the other Disney couple parallels that we've already seen be compared to Sora and Riku. And obviously, obviously, Sora is going to relate to Anna here. This is not a comparison of sibling dynamics. This is a comparison being made between two people who have gone through a very similar experience with someone that they are extremely close to. And because of that, Sora is able to encourage Anna and tell her not to give up on repairing her relationship with Elsa. But also to put any other doubts to bed, in the character files, Sora actually just straight up doubts that he and Riku have a sibling dynamic like Anna and Elsa. I wonder if the bond between sisters is similar to the one between me and Riku. Even if we fight, even if we get separated, somehow our hearts are still connected and we believe in each other. I wonder if that's how sisters are. And Riku says that pretending to be like Sora's older brother was a role that he tried but failed to be in Kingdom Hearts 1, and that their dynamic has changed. There's nothing strange about me thinking I'm higher on the totem pole than Sora. After all, an age difference of a year was huge when we were kids, and I used to act like Sora's big brother and take him places. When did that change? There's really no need to be calling attention to this in a book released as late as 2021 if they didn't feel the need to cover their bases and clarify to players that the dynamic between Sora and Riku is special, but both have their doubts about it being brotherly. Anna. Oh, Elsa. You've sacrificed yourself for me. I love you. <gasps> An act of true love will thaw frozen heart. Love will thaw. Love. And here's our second example of true love sacrifice. Put it right in the toolbox along with Eugene's sacrifice for Rapunzel. Just where do now she and Captain Turner must live in different worlds? One day ashore, ten years at sea. It's a steep price. One day isn't enough time. Well, there's always enough time for hearts to say what's true. Sora, you know better than anyone. It only takes a moment to connect with your mates. With your hearties. Hmm. There's always enough time. Again, Sora has witnessed groups of friends, or in the case of Will and Elizabeth, a couple, be separated by fate, and he laments that a day isn't enough time to spend with each other. But Jack tells Sora that there is always enough time to connect to your friends, foreshadowing the journey Sora must take through the Guardians of Light in order to save Kairi, and the final day that he'll get to spend with her. Yeah, Tadashi. There was a fire, and now he's gone. 
But he always wanted to make a difference. He cared about people. That's why he worked so hard to create Baymax. I'm sorry. He's still here. In Baymax. In all of us. Tadashi, he lives on in your hearts. Huh? Yeah, right. He will always be a part of us, in some way. And when you're not strong enough, he'll make up the difference. Sora, you okay? Uh, yeah, fine. <sighs> I'm with you. And lastly, in San Francisco, Sora gets a very one-to-one -one comparison between Hiro and Tadashi and himself and Roxas. Directly calling back to the hurt Sora is carrying around within him once more. All of these are hints calling back to the hurt that Sora is holding inside himself, foreshadowing the tragedy he will have to endure, and how even though he might have to be separated from his friends, their bonds cannot be broken. This foreshadowing will come to fruition by the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, but there is still much more to unpack, particularly the unexamined hurt that Sora still holds in his heart, but pushes away. And since Sora still needs to examine and process a lot of those feelings, it only makes sense that Riku is going to be the one who can help Sora grow, the same way that Sora helped Riku grow. Especially since many of these hurts stem from what Riku did back on Destiny Islands. And then, in the Caribbean, Sora even says this. I may still have a lot to learn about love. Which seems like a very strange thing for Sora to suddenly admit. His whole journey has been about love, and Sora is one of the most loving characters in this franchise. But Sora is really unsure about himself in this game, and he finally lets himself admit that. And also, I just want to point out that if Sora was definitely 100% straight this whole time, and he and Kairi are already supposed to kind of be a thing, even if we're just assuming that Sora had a crush on Kairi, this is a very strange thing to admit from a character standpoint after all this time. Again, it's kind of really telling. But if we assume that Sora isn't straight and hasn't figured this out yet, then this line makes perfect sense. But I think that moving forward, we're going to be exploring what love means to Sora. It's time for Sora to do some of the self-reflecting that Riku's gotten to do, and maybe break down some of the toxic positivity, among other things, that Donald and Goofy have unknowingly kind of pushed onto Sora. Small tangent, but this is exactly why I would love for Sora to go to an inside-out world and learn that feelings other than joy are important. I think it would be a great Pixar world for Sora's growth. Oh, the possibilities. But now that we've reached this point, I think it's a good time to talk about it. I've talked about Sora briefly here and there, but it's time to get to the root of this. Personally, when I look at all these scenes with Sora and just Sora's character growth in general, I think Sora has been going through a lot of comp het throughout this series. For anyone unfamiliar with the term, it's the kind of experience a lot of queer people go through where everyone around them just kind of expects you to be straight and cis. You don't even really think about it so much, it's just kind of an assumption that they must be right. It's an extremely common experience and similar to how I find the idea of Riku's queer coding to be... <laughs> a mistake somehow laughable, I can't help but see that same kind of remarkable consistency with how Sora represents the stages of going through Comp Het. Looking back on nearly every time Kairi is brought up in any kind of romantic way, it is almost always started by someone other than Sora. Sora is usually never the one to initiate it. 
be it Riku in Kingdom Hearts 1 teasing Sora about sharing a Paupu with Kairi, or what happens 99% of the time, Donald and Goofy bringing it up as a way to gently tease Sora. And if you're someone going through Comp Het, you tend to believe that you do have a crush. Or you might even have an honest-to-god crush, but also not realize that you could be bisexual or just gay, actually, or yada yada yada. It's going to be different for every person, and there's no one easy way to process what Comp Het means to you specifically. And I know, the trope of your friends tease you about your crush is a very, very common romance writing tool to get your character to be all blushy and embarrassed and to titillate the audience a little bit. So I'm not saying that every instance of stories doing this is actually about Comp Het. What is so notable about Sora's case, though, is that Sora instigates very little of the potential romance with Kairi himself. And even in cases where it would make the most sense to have your romantic lead take the role of, like, say, becoming your guardian angel while you sleep for a year and recover your memories, go through a beastly transformation in order to save the person you love, <laughs> being the guide through your journal, or being able to dive into your heart to wake you from a never-ending sleep, Kyrie is nowhere to be found. Not just nowhere to be found, purposefully ignored and not mentioned. You can make in-universe explanations for these, but at the end of the day, the writers chose to write it this way with no Kyrie. But wouldn't you know it, another character seems to be filling that role very, very consistently. Now you might just assume that Sora is clueless about romance in general, but we know that that's not the case, as Sora is extremely aware of the love between Disney couples he sees. In fact, when Sora sees Belle and the Beast together, he has some interesting thoughts surrounding his understanding of love. I remember watching Belle and the Beast dance, and seeing them so happy made us happy too. Even in that world, which was always kind of gloomy, was covered in a gentle light back then. Cogsworth said, if the master can learn to love and earn love in return, then the spell will be broken. But what the heck is true love anyway? What is love to begin with? I don't really know why I'm thinking about this so much, but... Huh? Not sure if I heard this from someone somewhere. But I get that Beast and Belle love each other. In the end, though, I still don't get what love is. I'm almost positive someone explained it to me once as a special power that only people have. But who was that? When I first met Beast, he said this. I simply believed. Nothing more to it. I believed in what he said, and because of that, I was able to fight. If the power to believe is also love, then maybe the power to love is similar to the power of connections between hearts. I still don't really get it, though. These are the same character files that were released after Kingdom Hearts 3 and Remind, for the record. This whole spiel Sora is going through is basically a writing prompt saying, write about a character who's going through Comp Het and how they see straight couples. This is also just extremely telling as a franchise that is tied to Disney princesses and fairy tale love stories. Kingdom Hearts uses familiar tropes from these movies all the time. So what I find interesting is that we are exploring Sora and Riku's relationship through the lens of these familiar comp het Disney love tropes. But you can't say the same for Sora and Kairi. At least, not with the same kind of overall consistency. One of the most direct parallels drawn between Sora and Kairi to a Disney couple is that of Peter Pan and Wendy in Kingdom Hearts 1. And Peter Pan and Wendy's relationship is defined by the fact that they are ultimately two people who care deeply about each other, but are incompatible and not meant to be. But let's also not forget that Disney is only half of the equation here. Final Fantasy is also just as well known for their love stories. There's no reason for Sora and Kairi's relationship to be so lackluster in comparison to Sora and Riku's if Kairi is supposed to be the main love interest. What is also notable is that by the time we get to Kingdom Hearts 3, Donald and Goofy have stopped teasing Sora about Kairi. 
Instead, they seem to find time to subtly tease Sora about Riku. Look, look, I found it! Uh, See, Sora? Well, I never looked this good. The clothes kind of match. Donald, I thought your magic decided how I look. Explain. <laughs> Say, Riku would make a great action figure. No, it's me. I've got the black clothes and, uh... So what? It should also be noted here that in Japanese, Donald's teasing is a lot more on the nose. After Goofy says that Yazora looks like Riku, Donald calls back to Sora's previous remark and he says, Very good looking, huh? No, not exactly. He just doesn't think. If only he listened to Master Yen Sid the way he listens to Riku. That would be a good start. And, you know, I have to stop here because someone is going to be like, well, that's just because Namora doesn't know how to write romance. Oh, and now we have to go through this whole spiel again. <laughs> is it that the writers don't know how to do their jobs? Or is it that maybe, just maybe, you are failing to pick up what they are putting down. Look, I am not saying that these writers are perfect or that the writing of Kingdom Hearts is a masterpiece that can't be criticized or anything. Kyrie, in particular, has had some of the most disappointing writing in the series. She's not a very fleshed out character and I don't know that she ever will be because I just don't think that Nomura finds her very interesting. But, I do think that the Kingdom Hearts writers do generally know what they're doing when it comes to character dynamics, particularly Sora and Riku's, because as stated before, this series is about them and their relationship and how it grows and develops. And I think that the writing is often smarter and deeper than most people give it credit for. So, if Riku has gay feelings for Sora, and Sora is going through Compet and doesn't understand what his feelings are yet, where does that leave Kairi? Hmm. Let's talk some more about Kairi and what I think Kingdom Hearts 3 was going for in depicting her relationship with Sora. The first thing that we have to remember is that Kingdom Hearts 3 takes place maybe months after Kingdom Hearts 2. And in that time, Sora and Kairi really haven't spent that much time together they're still kind of in that awkward place from the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, wanting to rekindle their friendship, but haven't gotten around to it. Sora and Riku left to take their Mark of Mastery exam, and then we pick up right into Kingdom Hearts 3, where Kairi is now learning to use her Keyblade in the Secret Forest along with Lee. There's an interesting bit from the novelization that hints at some of Kairi's insecurities. She looked into the mirror once more, taking note of the features of her new outfit, and then grabbed just a small length of her hair. Come to think of it, I wonder why Riku cut his hair. Even while they'd been training with Axel, Kairi's hair had grown a little bit. I wonder if Sora prefers long or short hair. Kairi took scissors out of the desk in the corner of the room, then worked the blades as she stared at them for a little bit. Then she went in front of the mirror and pinched the end of her hair. I think about shoulder length would be nice, though I hope I can cut it well. Oh, Kyrie, honey, this passage kills me. One, because I just feel so bad for Kyrie in this moment, but also two, like she realizes that, hmm, Riku cut his hair. Is that because Sora prefers it that way? Should I cut my hair too? There aren't many other ways you can interpret that chain of thought, and it just further establishes her fear of being left behind by Sora and Riku, enough so to influence her to change her appearance. Another thing I want to talk about with Kairi, though, is a very telling parallel to Kingdom Hearts 2. In Kingdom Hearts 2, when Kairi starts to regain her memories of Sora, she immediately writes him a letter in a bottle and sends it off, hoping it will reach him. Which, of course, does at the end of the game, and is how Sora and Riku are able to escape the Realm of Darkness and make it back to Destiny Islands. In Kingdom Hearts 3, 
We learn pretty early on that Kyrie is writing letters to Sora while she trains. A letter? Yep. To Sora? Mm, technically, yes. But I won't send it. It's more for me. Ask Merlin. He'll deliver it for you. Yeah, but it's okay. I just like talking to Sora, even if it's on paper. Huh, okay. Kyrie is choosing not to send her letters this time, which stands in stark contrast to Kingdom Hearts 2. And in fact, these letters that she was writing don't come back into the story at all. Now, if I was writing a subplot in a story where one character writes a letter to another character, I would probably have it play out like the way it does in Kingdom Hearts 2, where the letter comes back in the final act and a revelation follows the reading of the letter. If I was writing about a character who had unspoken feelings, insecurities, maybe an unrequited crush, or a weakened connection or bond with a once close friend, I would write it the way that it plays out in Kingdom Hearts 3, where instead the emphasis would be on the things the character writing the letter feels like they can't say to the person they are writing to. Actually, the sad thing is, only the first few sentences that she writes are even about Kyrie's feelings. I'm sorry I left without saying goodbye. Did Master Yen Sid tell you? I'm training to become a Keyblade wielder like you. That's right. No more waiting for you to come back from your adventures. I want to get out there and do my part to help. Merlin has used his magic to bring us to a place where time doesn't matter. We can take as long as we need to complete our training. He's an amazing wizard. Oh, and by us, I mean me and Lee. He's really sorry for all the trouble he caused. I told him it's fine, but he won't stop apologizing. I'll admit I was a little scared of him at first, but I've gotten to know him better. All he ever wanted was to help his friend. Honestly, it's hard not to like him. Every now and then, I catch him staring at me. When I ask what's wrong, he says, I'm not sure. I think I'm forgetting something. Don't know what. Sora, I think it may have something to do with you. At least it does a decent job of showing her insecurities and how she wants to get out there and do things. But unfortunately, after this, it mainly becomes a way to tell the audience about what's happening with Axel. In general, though, this isn't a dropped plot beat, a failed follow-up to the letter-writing subplot. It's a purposeful writing choice to show how distant Sora and Kairi are now, that Kairi doesn't feel confident in sending Sora the letter she writes. And this is going to be followed through on in a couple of ways. The first, believe it or not, is going to be coming to us from Winnie the Pooh. Think, think, think. Pooh Bear! Mm -hmm. You okay? Oh, hello there, Sora. <laughs> You're home. Uh huh. Good to see you, Pooh. Um, Sora. Hmm? You used to be right here. Why is it that you went away? Away? Oh. That's what you meant by your home. Yes. You see, when I get a rumbly in my tumbly, it's very hard to think of anything but honey. So I was worried that I might have forgotten you away. Silly bear, I'd never. Oh, good. Because I want us to be together forever. Pooh. We are together. There isn't a second that we're not. Except... I can feel it. Our connection's weaker. Why is that? Oh, it's wrong, Sora. Hmm? Oh, it's nothing. What matters is I'll be here from now on. 
No going away. Thank you, Sora. <laughs> Similar to Kairi, Sora feels that his connection to Pooh is weaker, and his promises to Pooh are much the same kind of promises that Sora has been making to Kairi, and their connection is weaker as a result. For as small as the Winnie the Pooh content is in this game, there is a startling number of parallels to Kairi here. Pooh welcomes Sora home. Pooh wants them to be together forever. Which is a similar sentiment to Kairi's Sora don't ever change. Sora promises that they're always in each other's hearts, and that's enough. But even then, Sora realizes that something's changed. Something's different now. If this is a breakdown of Comp Het, this could be symbolizing Sora growing up and starting to realize that maybe things can't always be as easily explained as it was when he was a kid. But Merlin offers Sora some wise advice. Sora! Something's happened to me that made me vanish from Pooh's heart. Merlin, I don't ever want to lose my friends. Hmm. Well now. Huh? There's no need to fret, lad. Whatever's lost can be found again. There are always new paths between hearts for us to discover and traverse. But you already know that. <sighs> yeah. And it's this interaction that foreshadows how Sora will be able to save Kairi later on in Remind, where he has to reforge his connection with Kairi. And if you think I'm reading a bit too much into this, here's what Nomura had to say about Kingdom Hearts 3. One thing fans may hope Kingdom Hearts 3 can deliver on is offering a satisfying wrap-up to the friendships that began the franchise, the trio of Sora, Riku, and Kairi. All will obviously feature in the game. Nomura hopes its depiction of their bonds can offer a realistic sense of how friendships evolve and change over time. Kingdom Hearts is not too realistic, but I do want my players to grasp a sense of reality from it as well, Nomura said. For example, I'm sure you had friends when you were young, a good group of friends, but as you grow older, things change, and it doesn't always stay the same. Nomura is specifically calling attention to the fact that the relationship between Sora, Riku, and Kairi has changed. And even though they were all really close at some point, that dynamic has changed. And we know that it's not Sora and Riku who have drifted apart. Sora and Riku have drifted apart from Kairi. And similar to Pooh Bear, even though Sora spends time with Pooh to reforge their bond and promises that they will always be in each other's hearts, in the end, Sora still has to leave Pooh behind. The Kingstagram posts make this separation even more clear. While Sora is content with Kairi being in his heart even when they aren't together, Kairi clearly is not. We should also talk about the Pau Pau scene. So, given what we have already established about how Sora and Kairi's bonds are weaker, and Sora just proclaiming in the Caribbean hours ago that he still has a lot to learn about love, this scene doesn't come off as romantic as you might have assumed a scene where two characters share a pow poo fruit with each other might be. I mean, for starters, it starts with Sora worrying about Riku being alone. Hmm. Hey, why is Riku all alone? He said he needed time to himself. Let's let him be. Hmm. Here. What? Huh? But when Kairi offers Sora the Paupu fruit, he is extremely taken aback. This look isn't just, I'm taken aback and surprised. I wasn't expecting that. But now that it's happening, I'm happy about it. This more so reads as, I am gobsmacked and shooketh by this. Um, I'm not sure? Oh, well, okay, I guess this is a nice thing to do with my friend, yeah. Here. What? Huh? <laughs> oh. 
tomorrow's fight will be our toughest yet. I want to be a part of your life no matter what. That's all. Oh. Mm. Kyrie, I'll keep you safe. Mm -mm. Let me keep you safe. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, this is another time that we can kind of side-eye the translations, which definitely make the language here quite a bit more leading. It was originally supposed to be Kairi reassuring Sora that the Pau Pu are just a good luck charm for the upcoming battle, in the hopes that they won't be separated. But in English, Kairi instead says, I just want to be part of your life, no matter what. Which, um isn't even close. This one translation was so bad that a Kingstagram post corrected the dialogue in the beginning of Remind. It's literally the first thing you see when you boot up the Remind DLC. You can't miss it. Kyrie has been painfully aware of their weakened bond, and Sora is catching on to it finally as well. This is a symbolic gesture to the time when they were really close as friends, and a payoff to finally share a poo fruit with each other like they had drawn on the cave walls. It ties Sora and Kairi's dynamic up with a nice little bow and says, no matter what happens, we'll always have this good luck charm. And okay, <laughs> not to be picky here, but isn't the poo thing only supposed to be one fruit shared between two people? At least... That's the impression I think most of us were given. Not to like, you know, cinema sins ding them on a technicality, but I do think that it makes it clear to me that this is them just paying homage to the cave drawing more than it is a romantic gesture. In fact, even the Japanese voice actor for Sora, Miyu Irino, has stated in an interview that he doesn't necessarily think that Sora sharing a Paupu fruit with Kairi implicitly means romantic feelings between them, even revealing that Namora had him record a sharing and a not sharing version of this scene. Now, of course, as a voice actor, Irino is not a writer, nor is he probably privy to all of the secrets as to where his character's story is headed. But it isn't nothing that he would say this. Because if you're a voice actor, you depend on your director giving you notes about the scene so that you can act accordingly. And if Irino was never specifically given instruction that he should play this scene with romance in mind, that probably means that this scene was not meant to be taken romantically. I would know, as I've directed voice actors and had to give them leading notes about how a scene should be played out, and that includes telling your voice actors what the characters would be feeling in that moment. Speaking of Kairi, the scene where Sora and Kairi share a Paupu fruit left an impression on me. Me too, it's a precious scene, as well as a moving one. We recorded both possibilities of eating and not eating the Paupu fruit. It wasn't decided which to use at that time, but I guess the one where they eat was chosen. I think Nomura-san was struggling to figure out how much he should depict those two's feelings. It's a delicate scene of Sora and Kairi's honest feelings. Watching them made my heart beat fast. They probably don't realize it themselves, but if they didn't have romantic feelings for each other, it wouldn't be such a heartwarming scene. <laughs> But I don't think sharing the Paupu fruit necessarily means they have romantic feelings. The fact that there was even ever a scene recorded of Kairi and Sora not sharing the fruit makes it pretty clear to me that this was not supposed to be a romantic scene, and Amora was concerned that players would read too much into it. Again, as a writer myself, I see all of these purposeful choices being made to show that Sora and Kairi have a weakened bond that needs to be reforged. But no declaration of love, no built-up romantic feelings, at least from Sora's side of things, 
and I can't even confidently say for sure from Kyrie. You have these letters that Kyrie has written but not sent. You have Sora saying that he still has a lot to learn about love. You have Sora saying that rescuing the Guardians of Light will take all his heart. But he doesn't say the same thing before saving Kyrie. It would have been so easy for Kyrie's letters or for this all my heart line to make a comeback and for Sora to say, wow, I truly understand what love is now. And that's how I'm going to save Kyrie. You know, like there's no reason not to have a declaration of love or a kiss if this was the romantic pair. They've wrapped up Kyrie's arc with Sora in a nice little bow, and there's still no further feeling shown or development happening. And then outside of the games themselves, you have Nomura saying that Kingdom Hearts 3 was about how Sora and Riku have grown apart from Kyrie. We have Sora's voice actor saying that he doesn't think Sora and Kyrie sharing a Paupu fruit means romantic feelings are present. I know that surface level, it's easy to look at Kingdom Hearts 3 and see a boy and a girl hold hands and assume that means that they are a couple now. But with everything going on here and the mountain of things I've discussed about Sora and Riku's relationship, I just remain thoroughly unconvinced that I'm supposed to be thinking that Sora and Kairi are anything more than friends. Either way, I do think that Kingdom Hearts 4 is going to be the time to finally explore Sora's feelings and have him come to some conclusion about them. At the very least, explore some of the baggage that he's carried around for so long. He might not reach a conclusion about it just yet, but it will be a start. There's even more to discuss about Kingdom Hearts 3 first. Like the Keyblade Graveyard, where things go belly up, everything goes topsy-turvy and not in a fun way, and long-awaited prophecies of doom come to fruition. The Guardians of Light face off against Xehanort, and it's not enough. When all hope seems lost, and every single one of Sora's other friends are whisked away by darkness, it's just Sora and Riku left to face the tide of Heartless, and Sora just can't handle it. Sora! They're gone. Kyrie, Donald, Goofy, the King, gone forever. What do we do? Without them, I... All my strength came from them. They gave me all of it. Alone? I'm worthless. We've lost. It's over. <laughs> Sora, you don't believe that. I know you don't. Because of everything Riku has learned up to this point, Riku is able to stand up and defend Sora, tell Sora that he believes in him, and Riku is able to do what his heart has been leading him to do since he made that promise to Terra all those years ago on the beach. 
he acts out the exact thing Herc told Sora at the beginning of the game. Herc, I came here so I could ask you, you something. Don't believe that. Ask me? I know yeah. You don't. Do you remember the last time we were together? You were feeling down and out. How'd you get your strength back? When you jumped in and saved Meg? Huh. That's tough. All I know is that she was in trouble. Suddenly, I wanted to save her with all my heart, but... But now my doubts and fears are gone. If anything, I feel exhilarated. I think it's because you finally found inside you that special strength to protect what matters. Strength to protect what matters. <gasps> Riku's sacrifice here is something that we still don't know all the ramifications of. Same goes for Sora abusing the power of waking to save everyone, and then again to save Kairi. It's really hard not to go into full Kingdom Hearts theory mode right here, but I will remain strong. <laughs> Basically, this is the point of the video where I highly recommend you check out the Sleeping Realm theory and let it blow your mind the way that it did mine when I first read it. This video is already long enough. I do not have time to break that down. But please go check it out if you haven't already. Link below. We do need to just quickly cover some of the talking points about that theory, though. At least, we need to cover one very important topic. Riku is the light. Specifically, Riku is Sora's light. Um, could I get a hint how to save the others? Seriously? Are you a Keyblade wielder or aren't you? Haven't you already learned how to restore someone's heart after it's been mm. lost? Restore their hearts? Is that the same thing as the power of waking? Uh, I'm not sure, but give it a shot. No. This'll take all my heart. Okay. Look for the light in the darkness. <sighs> May your heart be your guiding key. Sora, you don't believe that. I know you don't. Riku, answer me! 
Right after Sora is able to piece himself together again, Chirithi tells Sora to look for the light within the darkness. We are then immediately re-shown Riku's sacrifice, with Sora reaching out for Riku while he is using all of his strength to push back the tide of darkness with light. Riku and then Sora are swept away again, and Sora immediately recognizes the light as Riku. <gasps> Riku! Riku! Answer me! Like a lot of other revelations in Kingdom Hearts, this has been an ongoing topic that's been hinted at for a long time now. Despite Riku's initial fall to darkness in the first game, Riku being the light, or Sora's light, has been hinted at multiple times throughout the series. About Riku being the rightful owner of the Keyblade, why is it that Sora had the Keyblade first? That part is also vague. In the Destiny Islands, when Riku is swallowed by the darkness, there's a sparkle of light. And next comes a scene where Sora gets the Keyblade, right? In my setting, the darkness wrapping itself around the two is the darkness of Riku's heart. At the moment when Sora enters that darkness, the light you can see is the light of the heart. Sora, trying to help Riku, struggling in the darkness, touches that light and temporarily the Keyblade goes to Sora. Terra and Aqua see light when they go to Destiny Islands. This light, it's so warm, light. Was I guided here in order to meet that boy? What's that light? This boy looks so sincere, just like Tara. They recognize this light is coming solely from Riku. Also, there's the time that Riku was trying to wake up Sora in Dream Drop Distance. Sora, Sora, you've got to wake up. Sora! Whoopsie daisy. Wasn't easy putting you into a second sleep, and he almost woke you up. It's his light guiding Sora back. And the real kicker? Take a look at this. Kingdom Hearts 3's opening moments begin with an immediately recognizable callback to Kingdom Hearts 1's opening. The attention to detail to replicate this is outstanding, but here we see how Kingdom Hearts 3 replaces where Riku is with a ball of light. Some extremely on-the-nose symbolism telling you that Riku is the light in the darkness, foreshadowing what's to come as Sora rushes to reach Riku's light. And if that's not enough, the cherry on top of this cake is Riku's heart being in Olympus when Sora goes to save him. And where is he positioned? On a brazier, a pedestal adorned with sun imagery for the god Apollo. 
Do I even need to bother pointing out how ridiculously pointed this is? Apollo is barely a character in the movie Hercules. They could have put literally anything here instead and had Riku's little ghost floating above it. He could have been floating above nothing. But no, Namura's special boy gets a whole pedestal emblazoned with suns in the realm of the gods, literally a place flooded with light. And we specifically connect Riku to the god of the sun and prophecies. This is not an accident. Namura loves pulling on mythology, and he dropped this right in our laps as a treat just in case all the other clues weren't enough. Speaking of clever hints and nifty little treats, if we look at Riku's sacrifice again, it also bears a striking resemblance to the opening world logo of the final world. Oh, and would you look at that, Riku representing light again. From Sora's perspective, we can see Riku step away, and the little ripples show him walking away, and then there's a buildup of anticipation as Riku readies his stance, and then a bright glowing light stands strong as clouds whoosh on by. This is a subtle clue that Riku's act of true love was what brought Sora here and gave him a chance to piece himself back together in order to save everyone. It's a beautifully simple and clever touch that most players probably won't recognize the significance of right away, but Kingdom Hearts excels at leaving intricate little details like this. And of course, we need to again acknowledge that Sora literally recognized it was Riku's light right away, right here, as the light guiding him through the darkness. Riku! <laughs> Riku, answer me! <sighs> Sora knows it's Riku. And after all the clues we've seen building up to the fact that Riku is the light, it should come as no shock that we should believe Sora is correct. What I want to specifically call attention to, though, is Sora's face. Is Sora hearing or seeing something that Riku is trying to tell him? Sora's facial expression certainly leads me to believe that he's come to some sort of revelation about something. Hey, hey, Sora! You want to share with the class, buddy? But, and here's the weird part. For some reason, when Sora is about to get back to the Keyblade graveyard, he suddenly doesn't know whose light it is and thinks it was Kyrie. You see, I had no doubts that you'd pull through. The light in the darkness, it was you. You're the one who kept me from fading away. All I did was believe that you wouldn't. And this comes right after young Xanort tells Sora that there's a high price to pay for using the power of waking so foolishly. All that gallivanting through the sleeping worlds, and yet you learned nothing. There's a high price to pay for wielding such power foolishly. So what? You're worried about me now? No. There's no saving you. Huh. You've paid the price, and it lies at the bottom of the abyss. 
So even before Sora will use the power of waking again, young Xehanort is already telling Sora that he's paid the price for his actions. And now he suddenly doesn't know whose light is leading him back? If that weren't suspicious enough, when Kairi says, I believed in you, the very same thing that Riku had said to Sora right before his sacrifice, remember this callback? I'm calling back the callback. Sora gets flashbacks to other Disney characters he's met during his travels, sacrificing themselves for each other. Don't go. Stay with me, Eugene. Sacrificed yourself for me. I love you. <gasps> An act of true love will thaw a frozen heart. Love will thaw. Love. Elsa? Of course. Love. Eugene sacrificed himself for Rapunzel. An act of true love that saves Rapunzel from Mother Gothel. Rapunzel is then able to save Eugene's life in turn. Anna sacrifices herself for Elsa, an act of true love that thaws a frozen heart. It's through these acts of love that save the sacrificed person in turn. And no matter how I examine this or which way I turn it, Kairi wasn't the one who sacrificed herself for Sora. It was Riku. And Sora seems to have a brief moment of realization that it's not Kairi he should be sharing this moment with. But the thought also seems to escape him, like a fleeting memory he can't quite grasp onto. And then, Sora is pulled up out of the tunnel by someone who is definitely not Kairi. Whoa! Oh. I wonder what's going on here. It almost seems as if Sora's forgotten something rather suddenly. Something that's really important. And the look Sora has on his face here reminds me immediately of the look he had after calling out to Riku's light. And here's where I think we need to stop for a little bit. Because some people might be wondering... Okay, but if that's what's going on here, why does the game make it so cryptic and lie to us and tell us that it was Kairi? Why can't the game just be straightforward about it? Why doesn't it get brought back up later? <laughs> and look, I know it's a lot to take in, but that's Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts loves drenching itself in five layers of symbolism and it likes to check to see if you're paying attention. While Kingdom Hearts is not a mystery genre game, the story is oftentimes written like it is a mystery to be solved. This is just how Nomura likes to write and engage with the fans. It's an aspect of Kingdom Hearts I see often misaligned as bad storytelling or confusing, but it's honestly a feature of the series. A purposeful writing choice that is carefully crafted for every game. And for the record, it's one of the things that I find most endearing about Kingdom Hearts. 
There is so much to sink your teeth into and speculate over. Characters can be wrong or not realize that their perception of reality is flawed. But if you, as the player, are paying close attention, you'll often realize something is fishy before the ball drops. I've been a Kingdom Hearts fan for years, most of my life even, and Kingdom Hearts has never disappointed me when I've tried to look deeper into the text than just the surface level. I've been incorrect about some assumptions, and correct plenty of times as well. The main thing I think is important here is that Kingdom Hearts has never failed to address the mystery that I saw needed solving. And sometimes in unexpectedly surprising ways. But when I look back on it, I can track all the clues that led up to that point. And this is why I can't just set aside all these oddities and shrug them away when the games have all but trained me to sit up and take notice. Sora is suspiciously absent-minded when it comes to referencing Riku after this point, as if something's happened to his memories. Actually, to be more specific, it's not that I believe that Sora has forgotten Riku or anything like that, but I think Riku's sacrifice and the revelations that Sora had surrounding it about Riku being the light are... missing? Unchained? Locked up tight because Sora isn't ready to face what that means? A part of the price paid by abusing the power of waking? Losing sight of his light in the darkness is indeed a heavy price to pay. It reminds me of, say it with me now, Chain of Memories. When Oogie Boogie unlocks his true memories, he freaks out. Some memories are too precious and we have to lock them away. Could be any or all of these explanations, but what hammers this home is Remind, the DLC for Kingdom Hearts 3. We start with a scene from the Master of Masters, the closest we'll probably ever get to Nomura putting in a self-insert character, and he says this. The truth is what you see with your eyes, not what you hear. And that is followed up by us re-watching all the Guardians of Light falling to darkness. Except that Riku's sacrifice is the only scene at the Keyblade Graveyard that doesn't get shown again. Everything leading up to the sacrifice takes place the exact same way, and the game painstakingly shows you the exact same scene, but stops just short 
of Riku's sacrifice for no apparent reason. just blacks out and then wakes up in a daze, unsure of what just happened. And now he's in the timeline where the Guardians succeed, but Kairi dies. This cutscene in theater mode is even labeled as the tear. Mighty suspicious that Riku's sacrifice is missing. Also during Remind, Riku is the only character not to get a limit attack with Sora during the boss fights in the maze. Something that, I'll remind you, has always been a point of celebration in every single Kingdom Hearts game where it is possible to have one. So its exclusion just feels pointedly wrong. Could this be because unchaining these memories of Riku has weakened their bond? And if that weren't enough, Sora also seems to have forgotten someone on his trip back through saving everyone. Hey, I've already restored six hearts. What's one more? <laughs> no, no, Sora. It was seven hearts. Riku, Mickey, Donald, Goofy, Aqua, Axel, and Ven. That's seven hearts already. And then Kyrie's. Why are you suddenly saying six? <laughs> the truth is what you see with your eyes, not what you hear. Put all of these together and it's clear something fishy is going on, specifically concerning Sora's memories and or connection to Riku. I feel like Nomura is personally trying to make me go crazy. And that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to strange things to dissect about Kingdom Hearts 3, but I will spare you. Please just read the Sleeping Realm Theory and the Necklace Theory. Whew, okay. We've been talking about some of the really big stuff from this game, but now I just want to take time to appreciate the little things. Like how often Sora is thinking about Riku in this game. Look, I found it. Uh, see Sora? Well, I never looked this good. The clothes kind of match. Donald, I thought your magic decided how I look. Explain. Say, Riku would make a great action figure. No, it's just like when Riku disappeared. He thought he had to push me away to protect me. Maybe Elsa's the same. If anyone can help her, it's you. Let's <laughs> go! Oh, but I want to take a look at the big city. Yeah, it does seem pretty exciting. I feel so metropolitan. Uh, cosmopolitan? <laughs> oh. What? I gotta tell Riku what a blast this place is. Warms your heart, doesn't it? But you know, as much as I absolutely love all the Sariku parallels to basically every Disney couple under the sun, can be a little bit tiring, you know? All these straight couples being directly compared to Sora and Riku. It's nice, it's nice. But you know what we need? Sora and Riku need some Kingdom Hearts couple to parallel with. Maybe another gay romance for once. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, <laughs> would you look at that? Axel and Isa are here to provide. Isn't that just sweet of them? At first, I sacrificed everything to try and track her down. You're the one who went off and made other friends. Left her and me both in the dust. It infuriated me how you just exited our lives. <laughs> I lost all sense of purpose. 
I didn't forget you. Yes, I know. You wouldn't do that. But... I was jealous. You admit it. In all seriousness, I'm glad that most people are on board the Axel and Isa ship bandwagon, but it is a little funny to see how many miss that this dynamic is just a condensed retelling of Sora and Riku's dynamic. And it is just as gay and wonderful. Oh, and let's not forget our gay grandpas either. Ericus and Xehanort are very much so a cautionary, this is what the bad future of Sora and Riku's relationship could have looked like. I mean, Riku's whole darkness struggle was him trying not to turn into Xehanort. <laughs> and, oh, wait, did I say I was tired of Disney couple parallels? I lied! Let's add one more to the plate because Suriku literally can't stop winning. Next, we've got to talk about Miss Bippity Boppity Boo herself, the fairy godmother. So after Sora disappears from abusing the power of waking one last time to save Kairi, we get a year time skip. Kairi has gone under at Radiant Garden to see if the scientists can find anything in her heart that lets them find Sora. Unfortunately, it's a lost cause. Meanwhile, Riku has been leading the effort of rallying the rest of the crew around looking for Sora, also without much luck. Oh, look how sad he is. However, that's when Fairy Godmother drops in and she's like, Hey, Riku, honey, precious, I hear you've been having dreams about finding your boyfriend. I specialize in dreams and specifically in making dreams come true. So, spill the beans. Oh, I hope I didn't startle you. Not at all. What brings you here? Well, dear, I was asked to come by Merlin and Master Yen Sid. Now, where is... Oh, Riku. Yes, Riku is his name. Here, I'm Riku. Why, it's nice to meet you. Now, I'd like you to tell me about the dreams that you've been having, dear. Huh? My dreams? There's one. It was dark, and I was surrounded by tall buildings. I was looking around for Sora when I felt someone watching me from way up high. And? And that's all I remember. Ugh. But what happens next? Yeah. Oh, I know. Huh? Why Riku's dream? Oh, because Master Yen Sid was worried. You weren't having any luck finding Sora. And because Riku had been in Sora's dreams before, he thought perhaps Riku just may be the key. That's why he and Merlin asked me to come here and look into his dreams. Since, of course, dreams are my specialty. So, Riku's dreams might hold the key? Yes, dear. I'm sure there's something there that leads to Sora. In my dreams? <laughs> and the other two. Riku is barely able to believe it. He looks so despondent. But the fairy godmother, as she is wont to do, tells Riku to believe in his dreams. For the record, I want to point out how Sora and Riku's special connection has been purposely and narratively compared to Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, Hercules and Meg, and now the literal fairy godmother is here to treat Riku like Cinderella. And that's not even getting into every comparison, just the big ones. The Fairy Godmother is telling Riku not to give up on his dreams and saying that Riku and his dreams are the key to finding Sora. Everybody has been worried about how Riku has been doing this last year because obviously this has been really hard on him. And while everybody has been trying their best to find Sora, it's obviously going to be Riku who has really led most of the efforts on the search. 
Making Riku the Cinderella of this story was something Nomura went out of his way to do. As a writing choice, this just perfectly aligns with what I've been talking about this whole time. We already have Kairi sleeping for over a year. We have established that you can traverse worlds by connecting hearts. We have crews at Twilight Town, Radiant Garden, and Sid looking for clues within data. Aqua is searching the realm for clues. But instead of using these already established and easy writing solutions, of course, of course, Nomura says that those aren't going to cut it. Because Riku has to do this. Nomura is again emphasizing Riku's importance to the narrative, telling us that the rest of the cast can try their best, but it's not going to be good enough. Because Riku's bond with Sora is the only thing that can save him. And we're not going to just leave it at that. Riku's dreams, specifically, are going to get him to Sora. And the fairy godmother is here to make that happen. So, there is one more thing I need to talk about that didn't really fit into my other Kingdom Hearts 3 talking points. So, yes, we did talk about Sora calling Yazora good-looking, and we made the connection of Yazora looking like Riku, but I barely scratched the surface on Yuzora as a whole. For the millionth time this video, this topic could be its own whole video. But there is still so much we don't know about Yuzora and what's going on with him. But what we do know is that Yuzora isn't supposed to look the way he does. And yet, for whatever reason, he seems to have taken on a form that highly resembles Riku, but uses more of a warm color palette akin to Sora, thus making Yazora some kind of Sora and Riku visual hybrid that is also presumably on a mission to save his own special someone, and also save Sora in the process? There is a lot we do not know. I'm so excited for whatever it is to blow my goddamn mind, this visual mashup of Sora and Riku is certainly a choice, though, and it has me rubbing my hands together like a greedy little trash panda. What does it mean, Nomura? I just want to know! <sighs> and so, we move along to the events of Melody of Memory. And this game pretty definitively says, Sorry, Kairi, you're not up to the task. This is something that Riku has to do. Because Riku is the one with the special bond to Sora. You've literally been asleep for a year, and they weren't really able to find anything. This world was created from the memories contained within your heart. You seek clues to Sora's whereabouts by using your memories of him to search through your own heart. But there's nothing for you to find here. I'm afraid the answer you seek lies in memories that are long gone. I'm afraid this is as much as I can do. It's up to you, Riku, to take care of the rest. Hmm. I want to go. Kairi, that's not... <sighs> yeah, I know. I want to go with you. But I know that I can't. I need to finish training. I need to become stronger. And when I do, I'll be right there next to you and Sora. Good. And Kairi, will you continue your training as you were before? Actually, I'd like to study under Master Aqua. That is an excellent idea. I approve. Thank you. Look at how she's the only one not involved in the plan moving forward. And again, I just need to remind people that this was not something that they had to do. The writers chose to leave Kairi behind, the way that they always choose to leave Kairi behind. And then when you look into the production of Melody of Memory, you find out that this wasn't even going to include Kairi at all in the original plan of the game. 
Fairly late in production, Nomura did decide to include Kairi and make her the narrator for the game. When fans started to get excited that this was a Kairi game, however, Nomura was quick to try and temper fans' expectations. Is this going to bring closure to where we left off with Kairi at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 and the Remind DLC? With Melody of Memory, the timeline fits immediately after the story of Remind. But with that being said, the story volume is not going to be as large as a mainline Kingdom Hearts title, so you may not see too big of a movement in Kairi's time and in her narrative. Still, I think you might get a glimpse of where this might be going through this title. It's quite difficult not to spoil it, but still try to explain it at the same time. But with Kairi, her childhood is still shrouded in mystery. We haven't really delved deep into that part of her narrative, so you might be able to get a glimpse of that through Melody of Memory. But that being said, again, it's not meant to advance things significantly through this game. Unfortunately, Kairi still doesn't get a whole lot to do here, because her inclusion was so last minute. But really, the story was added mostly to reconfirm that Kairi is staying home and it's Riku who is going to Quadratum. And I know people are still hoping Kairi will play a bigger role moving forward, but given what we've seen, I just don't see that being the case. At least not immediately. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy have been set up as much more likely to swoop in at some point rather than Kairi. And this isn't me hating on Kairi, by the way, or wanting to erase her from the narrative. I'll have a little bit more to say about her in my closing thoughts, but I am just trying to tell you what I think the narrative is saying about where she's going from here. And in short, it's telling us that she won't have that big of a role to play. Your feelings on that might be disappointment, anger, or even indifference, but until I see otherwise, I feel fairly confident in guessing that she's not going to play a major role in Kingdom Hearts 4. Now that we are caught up to current events, let's also just... <sighs> take a step back here and... finally acknowledge the obvious. If Riku was a girl, and you don't even have to make Kairi a boy to see how obvious this is, but if you kept all of Kingdom Hearts the exact same, but changed Riku's gender, there wouldn't be a need for me to make a video like this. It would be the most obvious love story ever written, with two characters so smitten with each other, it about makes you sick with how stupidly in love they are. Like, would you two just go get a room and confess already? You're embarrassing, both of you. But at the same time, it would lose so much if this was just your typical straight romance. A simple gender swap just devalues all the consistent and purposeful writing here showcasing aspects of the queer experience. Riku's love for Sora, his closeted feelings driving his character development, overcoming his darkness and learning to accept himself, sacrificing himself for his most cherished person, and following your literal dreams to bring them back from death would lose so much and be so much more shallow if this was a heterosexual pairing. And Sora, I don't really understand what love is, Kingdom Hearts, a boy who's had every opportunity to show an interest in girls, who's surrounded by example after example of straight couples living out literal fairy tale love stories, and yet he still feels like love is a mystery that he can't quite piece together. He loves his friends and would do anything for them, even if it means potentially never seeing them again and dying for their sake. But that special bond between two people in love still escapes his understanding. But man, he sure does feel a special connection to Riku and can't seem to stop thinking about him whenever the opportunity arises and wanting to talk to him and hug him and just wondering about what he thinks about all this and looks to Riku for encouragement when he's feeling down. Oh, but man, what the heck is love anyway? And next, I need to talk about Dark Road. It was actually thanks to Dark Road's finale that I came back to this script and basically added another 40 pages to it. 
And that might seem silly considering that I've gotten this far and I'm only just now bringing it up, but it was Dark Road that solidified a lot of what I was feeling and left me with a very strong conviction about where to take this video. And Sora and Riku aren't even in Dark Road. But Dark Road has now introduced us to the concept of the Child of Destiny. And based on interviews with Nomura, the new mobile game, Missing Link, is going to be exploring a Bloodlines arc and start hinting towards various things that might happen in the Lost Masters arc and Kingdom Hearts 4. Now, Dark Road is all about learning Xehanort's backstory, and we find out that Xehanort is part of a special bloodline. He is, in fact, a descendant of Ephemer, our goodest boy with the scarf from Union Cross. Because Xehanort is a descendant of Ephemer, and that is considered to be a special bloodline of Keyblade wielders, it is believed that Xehanort might just be the Child of Destiny. We're given several clues as to what the Child of Destiny is. The ironic thing while watching this, of course, is that we know Xehanort is not going to grow up to be the Child of Destiny, but in fact, be the force of evil that the Child of Destiny will have to overcome. Now, as the blue-robed figure describes this so-called Destiny Child, he says, in my first life, there was a manuscript that detailed the future, the Book of Prophecies. It was given to a dear friend. But most of what was written was to be kept secret. In my second life, I learned that light was to expire and darkness prevail. But that the child of destiny would change this outcome. They would have the ability to feel, share, and embrace what others felt in their hearts, and even connect their heart with another to become one. He would hail from the Isles of Destiny. Perhaps it's still too soon. Now, on first viewing, I believe that any fan watching this cutscene is immediately supposed to put the pieces together pretty quickly and realize that this describes Sora. Sora is the one who changed everyone's fate and saved the world of light. Sora has also had many situations where he has felt, shared, and embraced what others have felt. And of course, he is also from Destiny Islands. However, I am like... 99% sure that this is a red herring. A classic Nomura red herring, where the game is heavily implying something and leading the player to assume something, while also subtly hinting at the real answer. Remember how we all thought Union Cross's player character was reincarnated into Xanor when it was actually the blue-robed figure? Yeah, so I think the actual child of destiny is Riku, and I'll explain why. When writing Birth by Sleep, Nomura stated that the idea for the game initially came about because he had scenes in mind of Little Sora and Riku on Destiny Islands. Scenes that he felt were important enough that the rest of the game came about in order to make them happen. And what could be so important about these scenes that they called for this? Like I've covered before in both Aqua and Terra's trips to Destiny Islands, they sense a strong light in Riku. And this prompts Terra to give Riku a bequeathing ritual, and Aqua has Sora promised to stick by Riku's side. This light is such a powerful force that it's pulled Terra and Aqua in from space, but neither of them seem to notice anything particular about Sora. In fact, most every character in Kingdom Hearts who has a sixth sense about this kind of stuff will usually comment on what a dull, ordinary boy Sora is. And this has been a point not only made in the series itself, but again reiterated by Nomura, that while it's important that the series focus stays on Sora, it's also important that Sora stays a relatable, ordinary boy. Do you feel it's important to keep Sora as the main protagonist, or do you ever see the series moving beyond him? As far as spin-offs go, we've had main characters that are not Sora. 
But in terms of the mainline series, I think Sora is actually the only real candidate for main character. I think if Sora is no longer the main character, then I would also feel like that would indicate the end of number titles. He's that important to the series. I thought a lot about whether Sora was to become a Keyblade Master or not, but because I always wanted Sora to relate to the players, if he became Master, it would have meant that he would have really reached a very high level and is not yet ready for it, and we do not want that to happen. The decision to not make Sora a Keyblade Master was not really difficult, but I thought it was better that he remains an ordinary boy to be closer to the players. While Riku, on the other hand, has been pointed out on numerous occasions to be something completely different. On top of what Terra and Aqua sense, we also have this scene from Chain of Memories. No one's ever won the darkness the way that he does. It's impossible. And it's why Xehanort can't use him for his plans. The boy chosen by the Keyblade, Riku. What? It was yours first, wasn't it? But you succumbed to the darkness you could not control. And your prize, the Keyblade, passed on to Sora instead. Your mistakes always end up being other people's problems. Maybe so. But I'm here to change all of that. Once again, you performed predictably. Although on a grander scale than I imagined. If you're feeling so chatty, let's skip to where you reveal what this is all about. I don't know how you did it, but you really have found a way to trap darkness inside your heart. And a boy who's immune to darkness is of no use to us. And even though it doesn't really get talked about much, Riku also still has that ability to smell or sense darkness and light within people. An interesting power that a few people in Kingdom Hearts have been shown to have, but not something that Sora's ever been able to do. On top of that, just to remind you all, we have Nomura saying some pretty suspect things about Riku. In the ending of Riku's story, Riku chooses neither the path to light nor darkness, but the road in between. How will that choice affect him as one who wields Keyblade? What Riku is thinking at that point will become clear later. He decides to follow the road in between and achieve a certain goal. Riku's story was about, what is my relation with the darkness? But some things, such as what he is, have yet to be explained. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, very interesting, wouldn't you say? And if we're going to factor special bloodlines into this whole thing, not only does Riku's whole personality and demeanor just kind of click into place perfectly for, oh, I actually descend from a special bloodline. Oh my god, shut up, Riku. That shit is so embarrassing. But let's take a look at Ephemer, Child Xehanort, and baby Riku here real quick. Obviously, between Ephemer and Xehanort, there aren't a ton of similarities, but the one thing they do have strikingly in common is their white silvery hair. And what I find even more interesting is that Child Xehanort is actually dressed in extremely similar clothing to Child Riku, with his outfit just being a sportier version of Xehanort's. His haircut is even very similar. And the series has taken the time to compare Riku and Xehanort in very direct, in-your-face ways. Take a look at this tiny place. To the heart-seeking freedom, this island is a prison, surrounded by water. And so this boy sought out to escape from his prison. He sought a way to cross over into other worlds, and he opened his heart to darkness. Riku! Riku, you say? Has he emerged from the realm of darkness? His existence, it was once doubled in the darkness. Fascinating. That's why you mistook him for the superior. The dark power given to Riku facilitated his escape from its realm. What I want to know is why he appeared here in Castle Oblivion. 
That's really quite simple. His existence resonates with that of another hero. Sora? Is in the castle? I heard once. There was a kid who left for good. So how did you get here anyway? Is there some reason you're interested in the outside world? Yeah. I want to be strong one day. Like that kid who left. He went to the outside world. I bet he's really strong now. I know it's out there somewhere. The strength that I need. Strength for what? To protect the things that matter. You know, like my friends. Obviously, these comparisons began because of Riku's fall to darkness and subsequent possession by Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, but have continued to be made even beyond this point. Riku and Xehanort are foils in many ways. Xehanort is what Riku could have become, but Riku has found his light, Sora and truly learned to balance both light and darkness inside of himself, something that Xehanort wanted but could never achieve. And if Xehanort was the failed child of destiny, thematically, it just makes sense that Riku would again succeed here where Xehanort did not. But I think this goes deeper than Riku just being the child of destiny, because despite everything I've just said, I actually think that Sora and Riku are both the child of destiny. When Riku fell to darkness, that's when Sora touched the light in Riku's heart and obtained the Keyblade. The Keyblade that was supposed to be Riku's. It passed on to Sora, and obviously Sora has wielded Riku's Keyblade ever since. And I think it's also this moment where Sora also inherited the mantle of the child of destiny. After all, we're told that the Child of Destiny will connect their heart with another to become one. And we've been given numerous examples of Sora and Riku working exactly that way. Their limit attack in Kingdom Hearts 2, Riku becoming Sora's Dream Eater and then diving into Sora's heart, the Gay Blade, Sora following his heart to Riku to save Aqua, and this suspicious little scene from Remind where Sora needs to find a way to traverse more hearts in order to save Kairi, and would you look at that? Riku's heart station just happens to be hanging out right by Sora's? I managed to come back, but now what? At this rate, I'll run out of time to get Kairi back. Just two more. Two more fragments. Wait, what if, what if I can trace the hearts of two more guardians, but how? Everyone always told me to just follow my heart, but follow my heart. Hearts are all connected. Trace the connection. <gasps> That's it. certainly seems special and completely unique from how we've seen heart stations work before. Hmm. You know, connecting their heart with another to become one. Ah, but I digress. It was also Riku's sacrifice and light leading Sora that allowed Sora to use the power of waking to save everyone at the Keyblade graveyard. Riku being the light, or Sora's light, is something that's been foreshadowed over and over again. 
So Riku is just as responsible for saving everyone as Sora is. And Riku has shown just as much of a unique power to sense, feel, and embrace others' hearts as Sora has. When they were kids, Riku sensed Sora crying before it even happened. And it was Riku who encouraged Sora to open his heart to Ventus. Huh? Sora? What's wrong? Huh? Your... Uh, that's weird. It's like something squeezing me inside. Somebody up there must be sad. Up where? They say every world is connected by one great big sky. So maybe there's somebody up there in all those worlds who's really hurting. And they're waiting for you to help them. Well, gee, do you think there's something I could do? Hmm. Maybe they just need you to open your heart and listen. Hmm. I don't know, Riku. You say some weird stuff sometimes. But I'll try it. Okay. Mm. <sighs> well, you know, I think it worked. <laughs> Riku was also one of the few characters to treat nobodies in Organization 13 with any real sense of humanity. He waited for Shion to make her own choice and fulfilled her last wishes, and treated Naminé and Axel with respect and let them go after Diz wanted them gone. You could chalk this one up to Riku just being a good guy with empathy, but when you compare how Sora treated the nobodies next to Riku, the difference is quite shocking. So, you think you might let us go? I know you're here to get rid of us, but... Diz wants to get rid of me? Go. You sure about this? I owe you both. For what? Castle Oblivion. You helped us. <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. Who is this kook? Remember, the organization's made up of nobodies. Right. No hearts. Oh, we do too have hearts. Don't be mad. Anyone from the organization who'd like to be next? Then allow me another question. You accept darkness, yet choose to live in the light. So why is it that you loathe us who teeter on the edge of nothing? We who were turned away by both light and dark, never given a choice. That's simple. It's because you mess up our world. That may be. However, what other choice might we have had? Just give it a rest. You're nobodies. You don't even exist. You're not sad about anything. And you have to remember that Riku has been fed the same kind of misinformation about nobodies that Sora has. And yet it's almost like Riku can sense their feelings, their humanity. Of course, Riku sensed the evil befalling Sora at the beginning of Dream Drop Distance, which is what turned him into a dream eater without even realizing it. And Riku again displayed this kind of sixth sense for Sora's feelings in the Keyblade Graveyard. Oh. Huh. Eh. Oh. Pull it together, Sora. Huh. We haven't lost them. They still have their hearts. But we have to protect them. Without even looking, Riku notices Sora's distress. And look, I know that these are very minor hints, but they are consistent. And that's what makes me so sure about them. Because they're subtle hints placed in plain sight. The audience is supposed to hear what the blue-robed figure says, and then immediately assume Sora. And not think much deeper on it. 
And that's what makes it a good red herring. Because assuming it's Sora isn't even wrong. There's just another layer to it yet to be revealed. But when you actually re-examine it, it only makes sense to assume that Sora only became the child of destiny because of Riku. And thus they are the two that have connected their hearts to become one. And need I even remind you of the interviews that have stated over and over again that the series is about Sora and Riku and how their relationship evolves. The Child of Destiny is undoubtedly one of them, but if the whole point of the series is about Sora and Riku and the Child of Destiny can connect their heart to another, then the only logical conclusion to that line of thought is that it's both of them. Going way, way back, I talked about the necklace theory. The theory that on the night of the meteor shower, Riku gave Sora the crown necklace and promised to protect him. The crown has been an important piece of symbolism for Sora since the beginning of the series. A crown also typically indicates some kind of royal status with it. The only time Sora isn't seen with the crown necklace in the series is in Birth by Sleep, before the meteor shower would have happened. If Riku had this necklace because of his special bloodline or whatever, that would make sense a crown necklace to indicate some kind of royal bloodline. But then, if Riku gave it to Sora as a good luck charm, thus passing the symbol of royalty onto Sora, it's like a mini prelude to what would happen years later with Keyblade. While Sora has touched the light of Riku's heart multiple times in the past, and thus gained main character status from it, it's Riku's actions that began their journey, in more ways than one. Without Sora and Riku, you don't have Kingdom Hearts. There's also been a special point made in Recoded, Kingdom Hearts 3, and yet again, interviews with Nomura, that the Thank Nomine plotline has yet to be resolved. It's impossible to really predict where that could go, as I can only work with what we currently have, and like I said before, there is just so many mysteries to Kingdom Hearts that we've barely scratched the surface on. But I think it would be very fitting thematically if the Thank Nomine plotline also tied back into the reveal of the Necklace Theory, Child of Destiny, and Sora's Jumbled Up Memories plotlines. Of course, this is assuming a lot, and maybe trying to look too far ahead. Or, who knows, maybe not looking far enough. But I do think that it's worth reminding people that yes, we do still have plot threads from Chain of Memories, the second game in the whole franchise to be resolved, and that they are still actively building up to it and leading to its eventual conclusion. Which is why I also still believe that the necklace theory holds more weight now than it did ever before. Nomura has stated his love of building up a good slow burn reveal, and that has been true to Kingdom Hearts many, many times. So it's not a stretch to believe that this could have been planted all those years ago. Xehanor is such a memorable villain, and now we're going into the Lost Masters arc. How do you follow that up and create fresh conflict with new adversaries? As you mentioned, Xehanor is a really memorable character. We did take a lot of time to flesh out this enemy presence throughout the series. It all started in the original Kingdom Hearts, where there's Ansem, and Kingdom Hearts 2 with Xemnas, basically these two figures that stem from one person. In the first game, we explored just the heart portion, in the second game, we explored the physical body. It all led up to the physical embodiment of the character. I really like that we took this slow burn approach to build up the character. I feel the presence of the enemy character is so important for them to be a really good character. It gives the story a lot of depth and density. I feel like we pulled that off. And speaking in terms of slow burns, I feel like there's one last overarching piece of foreshadowing that I've got to cover and that is Riku's outstretched hand, waiting patiently for Sora to take it. It's the thing that started this whole wild series off, and has been called back to more times than I can count. Since Kingdom Hearts 1, Riku has been reaching for Sora, and since Kingdom Hearts 1, Sora has been running and reaching for Riku's hand, but never quite able to get there. One day, Sora is going to be able to take Riku's hand. Whew. Okay. I think that's just about it. 
And oh man, you guys, I am really not exaggerating when I say that this video could have been much longer. Dear Lord, there is just so much to say, and I had to skim over a lot of points that could have a full breakdown analysis on their own, but I swear to you that I tried my best to only talk about the things I felt were really important. This rabbit hole has no bottom. Like, for a quick example, something I didn't get into covering is the ridiculous amount of Disney parallels going on in each game, including Union Cross, which Again, in Japanese translations, has some pretty interesting stuff, but they're just everywhere. I spared you from all of the Ariel from the Little Mermaid is an obvious Riku parallel stuff as well. I'll leave links to where I'm getting a lot of this stuff below. And look, I know it's easy to call shippers delusional, particularly when you take into account all the queer baiting that's happened over the last decade or more of popular media. And some like to insist that all these things I've pointed out are just that, queerbaiting. But queerbaiting doesn't look like this. These aren't one-off cases teasing a potential romance but otherwise saying nothing about it. This is deeply entrenched in the series itself and I'd argue core to what the series is all about. I wouldn't have this much to say if this was just about how I think Riku is gay. It's important that Riku is gay. A lot of people like to think of themselves as above shipping, or think that shipping and therefore romance arcs as a whole are less important narratively than everything else. But it's like I said, you don't get Kingdom Hearts if you don't have Riku's canonical complex feelings for Sora or his slow revelation that Sora is his most precious person. That's just canon. I know it's so easy to assume straightness and need huge amounts of evidence to suggest otherwise, and I know that for some it's hard to put your feelings on the line into hoping for this when so many other shows or media have hurt us before, but I'd like to at least hope that the chances aren't completely off the table for Suriku, and in fact, look pretty good, there's still a good chance that all this subtext and foreshadowing is just text, and we'll get a satisfactory conclusion. My biggest reason for doubting my own reading of all of this is just the fact that it's queer. Isn't that sad? that I feel so confident in this reading and that this is what the games have been telling me all along, but the main thing holding me back is that fear of it being too controversial to go through with it. Again, I want to reiterate my point that I made at the beginning of this video. If you have a different reading of Kingdom Hearts and you hold it close and dear to your heart, maybe you even ship Sokai and it's a really important ship to you. I do not want to take that away from you. Everyone can have their ship. I have shipped Zutara since way back when Avatar was still airing, and no amount of canon or non-canon is going to take that away from me. I just want people to understand where I, and many other Sarikus, are coming from, why we feel so passionate about our reading of the text, and maybe, just maybe, we'll get a few less people calling us delusional for something that has such a mountain of text and foreshadowing built upon it, just looking at all this evidence, this is the direction I see the series going. This is what the canon is trying to say. And another thing I think about is that there's this all too common chain of thought within the Kingdom Hearts community at large, and I'm guilty of it as well, so you know. But we tend to put a lot of stock into the idea of Kingdom Hearts characters belonging in trios. The Wayfinder trio, the Sea Salt trio, the Destiny trio. And we see these groups of friends as inseparable, or we're really attached to the fact that they are and will always be a trio of friends as something set in stone. And it's comforting to think that. There's of course even parallels between the trios that the games like to make callbacks to, to enforce the ideas of connections and even use a little nostalgic shorthand in order to communicate their bond. But it's important to remember 
that the concept of these trios is more so fanon than canon. It's fandom speak for groups of characters, more than it is text in the series. Terra, Aqua, and Ven might be the only current trio that really sticks to how we idolize these trios, but just looking forward, we know that Ven's past is likely going to be making a comeback, and Aqua and Kairi are now training together. Both of these things are likely to shake up the trio's dynamic. And the Sea Salt trio has expanded way beyond its original form. I remember the days when Shion was still a controversial addition to Axel and Roxas's duo. And now we have Hainer, Pence, Alette, and Isa joining their crew, as well as the eventual mysterious Subject X. My money's on Scald. Nomura has stated that he's glad that these characters have become so popular, and he wants to explore more with them in the future, even if they are not going to be the focus of Kingdom Hearts 4. Sora and Riku have functioned way more often as a duo than as a trio in the series, and I honestly wonder if Nomura even really considers the Destiny trio a trio in the same way that we do as a fandom. Because being a part of a trio means a lot more to us fans than it does to the plot of Kingdom Hearts as a whole. Kingdom Hearts treats these character dynamics with a lot more nuance and room to grow and change. Obviously, this video is really important to me, on multiple levels. Riku is one of my absolute favorite characters of all time. I love most of the Kingdom Hearts cast, but Riku holds a really special place in my heart, and I can feel a lot of the love and care that's gone into his characterization on a personal level. And at the end of the day, he and Sora are just fictional characters, you know? If my ship doesn't happen, yeah, it'll break my heart a little bit, but what's more important to me is this very real connection I feel to these characters and how genuinely Kingdom Hearts handles something like this. This kind of male intimacy was never modeled for me growing up, and hell, even in media nowadays, I haven't been able to find anything quite else like Kingdom Hearts. And I know I'm not the only one. Kingdom Hearts means so many different things to so many different people, and we all see ourselves a little bit in it. I hope that I have been an adequate voice for the people who share a lot of my same feelings for this series, and maybe even open some people's hearts to what I see. Everyone is going to go into this game series with their own biases, and come to their own conclusions about this or that, but there's no denying that Kingdom Hearts has left its mark on all of us. It's sappy, it's quite silly and ridiculous a lot of the time, but it's also heartwarming and honest about so many things. And I love it for that. I do know that I see way more romantic tension between Sora and Riku and evidence to back it up than I do for Sora and Kairi. And Kairi is just absent in so many titles where she shouldn't be that it feels like a statement on the developer's part. Kairi has consistently been shown as a character who, while wanting to learn how to protect herself and her friends, is also content being able to go back to Destiny Islands and return to her normal life, while that does not seem likely for Sora and Riku. While Sora and Kairi have made the move to reforge their connection, much like Winnie the Pooh, Sora ends up leaving Kairi behind again, and things have kind of been tied up with them for the time being. And there's not much to suggest that Kairi is going to be able to suddenly swoop in and save the day. And Maybe that'll change for her at some point. She is training with Aqua now, so maybe. I don't know. Aqua isn't likely to play a big part, at least from what we know, so pairing Kairi off with Aqua feels like another way to set her off to the side. I think the way to make her more involved would start with actually, you know, including her in something actually important. In the Kingdom Hearts 4 trailer, we see Donald and Goofy are probably in the underworld looking for Sora, so it's much more likely that they are going to come back into play. Mickey has specifically been given the mission to go after Riku, so I highly doubt Kairi will have a role, because Nomura honestly just doesn't seem that interested in writing about her. And I don't blame him, she bores me too if I'm being honest. And I know that for a lot of people, that sucks, and they want to see Kairi do more. I feel for you. I really do. 
I personally hope that Kairi gets to become her own character outside of her relationship to Sora and Riku in the future, because her character is honestly hurting from it. Some of her most interesting interactions in the series so far have been scenes with Axel, so I'm sure if we could explore her more with other characters, she would have potential. It sucks that Kairi has so far filled the role of red herring slash potential love interest as her most defining character trait for the majority of the time people have known her. I hope that she gets to be something more than a bland love interest. At least for the sake of fans who really want to see more of her. I do see her fear of change and growing apart from Sora and Riku as her most defining character trait throughout the series so far. However, for her sake, I hope that she gets to realize that change is okay and she gets to make a lot of friends moving forward. In order for me to get really invested in a ship, I have to see the dynamic work in canon and feel like there is an actual possibility for the characters to get together based on the actual text of the media. I can't say the ships really interested me at all in Kingdom Hearts for a really long time. I started playing these games in middle school, and while I absolutely adored it, none of the shipping fandom I saw online really interested me because I didn't really see it reflected in the games themselves. But that's the thing about Sora and Riku's relationship. It's not just a handful of scenes that don't mean much out of their own context. Take one away and you lessen the overall narrative cohesion. Even now, Soriku is the only relationship I'm legitimately invested in. If you really pressed me, I'd say I'm a fan of Zahaquis as well. Um, Axel Isa is neat, but I mean, I don't even know the ship name for them. And Terra Aqua is also pretty cute, I guess. Although every once in a while I see Cinderella Aqua art on my feed and I'm like, oh yeah, that's pretty heckin' cute too. You know, I'm pretty casual about the rest of these. And please, don't let anything I've said take away your joy of shipping what makes you happy. I don't think media analysis and shipping for the sake of fun need to be enemies. And, you know, I didn't even really consider Sariku a possibility until Dream Drop Distance, and it's not like I hadn't been aware of the pairing before, it was just more of a, huh, oh, Kingdom Hearts being silly and putting all this romantic subtext onto these male characters, they just must not realize how this looks. Which, oh my god, even just saying it now is like, what? You didn't think that these literal industry professionals, many of whom have worked on other games with romance as an integral part of the story, didn't realize that the way they were framing this scene or used this music, or said these lines, didn't know what they were doing? <laughs> okay, baby Tennille. Uh, thankfully, you've come a long way. But Dream Drop just really kind of shook me awake. Again, the game is not subtle. So, I am, and will forever be, Suriku Endgame, actually, but I don't want to take away the joy of analyzing this series in your own way away from anyone, no matter what course the series takes from here. I just think Kingdom Hearts deserves a queer reading of the text, and that you gain a lot more thoughtful insight into some of its lead characters through it. It's also why I don't believe that Riku is going to be shelved as a character, or losing relevance anytime soon. These games have been, and will always be, about Sora and Riku. Their struggles, their battle against the darkness, one day finding out exactly what Kingdom Hearts is. Once, they were rivals, through misunderstanding and jealousy. But we got to see what happens when they've overcome that and become the most important people to each other, and the light that leads the way for each other. And that's just beautiful, and I can't wait to see how that develops. And none of that would have happened. None of this amazing story that has brought so many of us together into this crazy series if Riku weren't gay. Hi. <laughs> so, that's it. Uh, 
that's all the reasons why I think Riku is gay and, and why it matters. Why it matters so much. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video and getting to this point. I'm happy to be at this point. I literally have the almost finished video sitting right over there. So this is done at the very, very end. <sighs> it's such a relief to have this done. Uh, I've been wanting to make this video for forever. Um, so while I wrap up, just a couple more things here. Um, check out all the art that I did for this video. I had an awesome, fun time doing all the art for this video. I've been wanting an excuse to do a whole bunch of Kingdom Hearts art. And if you liked any of the art from this video, you should be sure to go check out my Redbubble and see if, you know, there's anything you would like to buy a print of or there's some cool things on like water bottles and stuff like that, stickers. I'd like to specifically thank a lot of Kingdom Hearts fans who really made this video possible. Uh, without their resources and everything, I would not have been able to put this video together, at least not in the timely fashion that I did, which this video still took me several months. So thank you to Nikutsune who hung out in my streams and then we ended up just kind of chatting. They really helped me like bolster some of my points that I was trying to make and just like flesh out some parts of my script. Uh, I also want to thank just Kingdom Hearts fans in general who have written so many metas about the story and the characters and everything who have really kind of gotten my, my wheels turning and thinking about all this to begin with. And a huge thank you to the people who do translations of the original source material. I also want to thank Regular Pat for his wonderful Wayfinder project to which if that wasn't around Oh my god, I don't think I would have been able to get through this video just because I don't know that my computer could have handled having all this footage along with like me trying to record game footage as well. So thank you Regular Pat for your wonderful Wayfinder project. That helped immensely with the editing of this video. If you liked this video, please consider checking out my Drawing a Blank series in general. I talk a lot about things that I'm passionate about, including other Kingdom Hearts topics and other Kingdom Hearts art, so please help yourself. If you like my stuff, you should consider being a patron over on my Patreon. I really can't do these videos without my Patreon supporters. It's thanks to them that I could take all this time to work on such a big video like this, which I'm so thankful for because obviously this was a big passion project. So thank you guys so much. And becoming a patron gets you benefits. Uh, just becoming a $1 patron gets you access to the Discord server. If you subscribe at higher tiers, then you get to be part of our game days once a month. And then even higher tiers gets you a commission from me. So if you liked the art in this video, you could get some of your own from me by doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I worked a lot on this video over on my Twitch channel, Tenille Flowers. And so if you just want to come hang out, I'll usually do editing over there or drawing or sometimes gaming. It's extremely casual. I don't really have a strict schedule. However, if you do like scheduled content over on Twitch, that is where our other channel comes in, where we stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And that is over at twitch.tv slash Sixerite. Link in the description below also links to all of my sources for this video. But with all that said, I think I'm finally done. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic week and stay inspired.